everyone. Uh, welcome to those in the room. We have a wonderfully intimate gathering here of people who are clearly just here for the weather. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, you can't tell if you're tuning in online, but it's pouring down outside. My apologies. You've come in England's rainy season, otherwise known as the Holocene. Um, uh, for those who are join, tuning in uh, online, welcome also. I, I, I hope you've made yourselves comfortable. We had over 400 people tuning in at various times uh, yesterday, so, so thank you all for your engagement. And we have another fantastic lineup for you today. Uh, we have first a panel on liminality, chaired by our star guest, Professor Ruha Benjamin. Then we have two panels on bodily borderlands, uh, the first chaired by our own Eleanor Drage, and the second by Professor Jennifer Gabris. And then after that, we have uh, our artists who are exhibiting in the room um, just uh, next to where we have coffee, will discuss and present their work. And uh, for those of you who are here in person, you can see that when you have coffee or lunch, uh, we're exhibiting the works of uh, three artists, all world-leading figures uh, in the intersection of art and uh, machine learning. They include our long-standing friend, Jake Elwes. Um, you can see two of his works, Zizi, querying the data set. Um, and uh, 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 the Zizi project is a collection of works by Jake that's exploring the intersection of AI and drag. Um, you can see works by Zach Blass and Jemima Wyman called I'm Here to Learn So, um, which is a four-channel video installation playing with Tay, the notorious uh, Microsoft chatbot. And you can see works by Rashad uh, Newsom called uh, Being 1.0. So please do take a look and tune in this afternoon to hear from the artists. Uh, but now for our first panel of the day, let me hand over to Professor Ruha Benjamin. Ruha, over to you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, to day two of Critical Borders. It's really my honor and pleasure to still be standing and with you in conversation. Um, these three panelists this morning are individuals whose work I greatly admire, who I can't wait to actually connect with in person, but I will um, deal with the, the virtual context for now. Let me introduce them um, and then hand things over so we have plenty of time for discussion. So Professor Michelle, Michelle Il Ilam is a William Robertson co-professor in humanities in the Department of English um, at Stanford University and also the associate director of the Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence at Stanford. Author of numerous books and essays, Michelle's most recent book is Making Race in the Age of AI, which considers the humanities and the arts and how they function as key crucibles through which to frame and address urgent social questions about equity in emergent technologies. Maria Smith is a doctoral student in the Department of Sociology at UC Berkeley, which is my alma mater and my department, so I'm really thrilled for her to be in conversation today. She's also a 2020 National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow. Maria researches the intersections of punishment, science, and technology, knowledge, and power. Her research aims to conceptualize and investigate the uses and social consequences of artificial intelligence and data surveillance in the criminal justice system using both qualitative and computational methods. Maria is also the co-founder of the Data for Black Lives Hub in the Bay Area and mentors previously incarcerated system, uh, system impacted and first generation students. Last but not least, Dr. Rachel Adams is a chief research specialist at the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa, where she's leading various projects exploring, exploring AI in Africa. She has degrees in jurisprudence, international human rights law, English literature, and philosophy. Rachel is also editor of the South African Journal on Human Rights and author of Transparency, New Trajectories in Law, and the lead author of Human Rights and the Fourth Industrial Revolution in South Africa. With that, I'll hand things over to Michelle, and I think we'll go in the order as listed on the program. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ruha. It's such a delight and wonder to be here. We just all wish we were in person. <laughs> we were commiserating right before as well. And thank you, Maria, for helping me with the um, slides. I don't know if it's possible to have them at the bottom to advance them. I don't think, I can't see the, um, the 
the PowerPoint first. Let me start and hopefully that will come up. Okay, we'll just show, it's gonna look a little bit like this. Um, can you do it in um, presenter form so I can see the bottom? That would be great, thank you. Thanks for your patience, everybody. I wanted today to focus on, thank you so much, on an issue that's really in plain sight, but it gets glossed over in a lot of industry discussions of gender and racial bias and surveillance and privacy and facial recognition technology. And that's the revival of this really long institutionalized practice of coding gender and race and ethnicity as fixed static programmable variables, something right on the face or intelligible on or in the body. And as a lot of people have noticed that already, you know, the imperative and ability to categorize and classify so central to the design and application of AI and computer vision technologies in particular, harkens back to the enlightenment and empire colonial efforts to rank, create ranked compendia of all people and all things, which in turn has informed 19th century pseudoscience theories of race, gender and personhood itself. And those categories of the humanists as black scholars, Sylvia Winter, Hortense Spillers and others have noted are saturated in the racializing ideologies animating them and they remain imbricated in the maintenance of social hierarchies today. And often non-binary and mixed race identifications and experience can at least provisionally put the lie to both homogeneity and purity and thus to the political project of classificatory schema requiring this recognition of types in the first place. They throw into relief the fact that intersectional processes of race and gender formation are, as playwright Lorraine Hansberry put it, social devices used in the service of power. Let's see if I can get this. So I'd like today to look specifically at the systemic erasure of intersectional ambiguities as an invisibilized and invisibilizing practice that falls under what Wuha was calling the is calling the new Jim Crow code. And the reduction of gender and race to taxonomies of types that are monetized in nearly all applications of commercial AI includes a subversive liminal potential that Homi Baba and many others saw possible in hybridities and that betwixt and between to disrupt digital reassertions of social and political status quo. And just to note that I'm always virtually placing scare quotes around the word ambiguity. Um, since it's not a given, obviously, but it's a function of cultural context and perception. So institutional context, situational context, historical context, as Franz Fanon notes, seeing race is not an ophthalmological exercise. It involves what he calls a cultural training of the eye that computer vision technologies and human recognition systems really count for, count for as I hope to explain more fully here why. So here's an example. I think you've got, here we go. Um, this image is really a reminder that ambiguity is in the eye of the beholder and not simply in the body of the observed. In other words, his ambiguity is a function of our interpretation. It's not a self-evident fact. And the image is really a Rorschach blot, a palimpsest of these national anxieties and aspirations of cultural projections and assumptions tethered to our historical moment in our geographical orientation and so many more. So sometimes with my students, just to dislodge them from the surety of what black is or ain't, I show them a few pictures of what black used to be. Um, you know, here we have, there's just a few of people who many of whom they don't know who identified as, as black in the day that they recognize. Um, but their vision of blackness is so script as writ on the skin, that it's often hard for them to imagine otherwise unless you go back a couple decades or not. Um, we also use, so one of the experiments that we've also done sort of social science experiments too, let me go back to him for a second, is we'll prime students and suggest to him that he's from South Central LA and they're sure he looks Latino. If we say he's from San Francisco, they're sure he's Filipino. You know, we're on the Pacific Rim here on the West Coast. If, it, if we say, well, he's from New York, he's gotta be Puerto Rican. You know, if he's from DC, affectionately called Chocolate City, why well, he's just black. So similarly, this experiment with a colleague of mine that we've also done as well is just as problematic. Um, 
we go through because the names also surnames will also um, really train that cultural eye in different ways. And of course, one of the things though that happens um, with this particular practice is the experiment really is, is sort of as problematic when you have the reveal at the end is figured as her problematic self-identification as quantification and return to this antiquated language of blood quantum and percentage. And in this case too, that scientific idiom gets merged here with these problematic discourses about racial choice, personal authenticity. I took to heart Wendy Chung's great analysis of that framed in terms of choice and free will, possessive individualism, individual sovereignty, all these values that are fetishized and enshrined in particularly US national identity. And that representation of race as concrete, discrete, measurable and hearing and distinctive to her is also eminently marketable because it dovetails perfectly with commercial interest in personalization, demographic micro-targeting, precision concierge care. And I use this kind of visual speculation as a heuristic to turn the gaze back on itself and take note of our own flawed acts of race making in real time. And I also use it precisely because in many ways evoking not so much those Hollywood squares as Lombroso's criminology photo archives as Trevor uh, Paglin, our artist has made vivid. It replicates this vogue for scrutinizing someone's visage and diagnosing their ancestry. There's lots of expensive glossy coffee table books devoted to this kind of gazing at multi and interracial families. And they're figured almost always heteronormative, light-skinned kids, socioeconomically stable families, and thus for the afternoon's pleasure of flipping pages featuring these tableau of family romance, they erase what mixed race has historically indexed always, the long bloody history of colonialism, imperialism, reproduction of patriarchal inheritance through institutionalized rape under slavery. So these such, these quotidian casual acts of parlor game guessing and uninvited descriptions of racial designations are especially insidious, it seems to me, precisely because they pose as benign curiosity. Although the interlocutor is usually blind or blinded to their own motivations, and indeed will defensively insist that they only have good intent, we really need to flip the script of the microaggressive question, what are you, whether it's posed verbally or through visual capture, to ask who, why, and for what ends this question is being asked or the image being framed. Not because race doesn't matter or it's a matter of privacy, but precisely because race does matter because it's not a matter of personal choice. After all, how publics perceive someone else's race has everything to do with their outcomes for health, wealth, and social justice. So I also wanna emphasize that ambiguity clearly doesn't slip the noose of racial or gender categorization. It's constitutive of it. It's the periphery that defines the center against which the center can be known. Or as Wendy Chung put it so succinctly yesterday, the standard deviance defines the norm. And I explore that at much length in the souls of mixed folk, um, race politics and aesthetics in the new millennium. But in that I explore how mixed race became a very specific historical moment, a separate political identity category when it moved from being a noun to an adjective. And it's a very modern invention and it's um, vouchsafed in many ways was created by art, the United States 2000 census, which was the first to allow the mark one or more racial option. It was called moom option. And I just wanna emphasize, you're looking at the um, this one of the census right there, that it's not, I'm gonna go back to Jennifer's um, uh, great uh, quote there. And actually, let me go back up a little one more as well. The census for a lot of people that first time became this site to express their multi-splendored self, but it's a political document as I suggested in the next slide too. It's, the, it's meant to distribute resources to track um, civil rights inequities. It's run in the United States through the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and as Jennifer Hoschild notes, it's a mirror of the nation as well. And it's really important to, to keep that in mind because it was a site of racial formation and creation for it as well. So one of the things that um, we, I started looking at and particularly in relationship to AI is there was a whole conversation about 
this rising tide of color, you know, and that in the United States, we heard the frequent refrain that by 2025, the US will be a majority minority nation and people identifying as multiracial as one of the largest and fastest growing categories. Um, but I would argue that demographics are not destiny and that these shifts are as much about perception and interpretation as statistics. So that rising tide of color, you can see in the, in the image a little bit, it, was, it looked like it was rushing from the west coast east um, at the, and now it's actually, this is an, an older um, map of it too. Um, but I use the term obviously ironically as it was used by Genesis Lathrop Stoddard. Um, and it can't be wholly explained, I don't think, either um, by these, here's the usual explanations for why these changing demographics. So people would say it's the result of immigration policy or Supreme Court decisions like the 1967 Loving decision legalizing interracial marriage. Um, or a lot of people just saw it as somehow this inevitable realization of this American vision of itself as the melting pot. Um, but I think it's really important to ask the question. Here's the image of it. Was very, it's very popular in, in the states, particularly of interracial comings together um, as one of individual romance. But one of the things that I've, I've been really interested in is asking this question about um, shifting us away. From, I teach a class with um, a political scientist for whom you know, the facts are self-evident and it's very hard to get them to imagine um, that there are other um, rationales for why it is that there's suddenly this vogue for mixed race people. Um, uh, at the very moment where race-based policies like affirmative action and civil rights legislation are being weakened by powerful political lobbies really eager to mix, uh, embrace mixed race as the end of race. And technology is really enabling um, this new category even, even as its politics really disable critiques of racism. And here's a perfect example of how mixed race babies are seen as somehow the answer to the race problem um, altogether. And of course, having sex is so much easier than, you know, picketing it or uh, bus protests or, or sit-ins. And that's part of the problem. But I'm very interested in particular, some of you may remember um, how it is that technology has been starting to create and normalize these um, um, categories. So this is what's called the face of America. She was the result of male engineers computer mating all the races and nationalities of the world putatively. They obviously paid fast and loose with genetics to produce her because she wouldn't have looked anything like that as they called her. And well, there's so much more to read here than we'd have time for, but I just wanted actually to point out the cultural work that Eve is performing as this non-threatening feminized sexual avatar of near white multiracialism. You know, her absorptive whiteness here on the magazine cover actually provides cover for the real volume inside, which is actually a series of articles about the difficulty of assimilating immigrants, language, customs, religions, and values. Here's another more recent example. Oops, sorry, jumps ahead there. Here we go. This is the changing face of America. Um, in it, it looks as if it's just documenting a representative sample of a vast emerging population, but in fact, the grid creates the people it purports to merely identify. It naturalizes them as the next frontier, hence they're almost always represented as young. There's a whole plethora of, of um, tableau like this. Um, even though obviously there's been centuries of race mixing notwithstanding, it norms what mixed race people putatively look like, oblivious to the colorism informing the palette there. And as with other headshots, it makes the face the default and de facto ledger of race. So all of this brings me to the ambiguity, the question of how ambiguity of protected classes of people are represented in AI. And I look at two commercial apps, there's actually dozens of them, that rely on facial recognition technology. One of them is, um, this is one, a picture of my student. Um, it's called the Ethnicity Estimate, which is billed as a, as a sort of a, a popular um, app that you can just sort of do. Of course, it's scraping all your <laughs> biometrics, um, but it also purports to diagnose percentages of one's ethnic heritage based on FRT. Um, clearly you can see his pained reaction. He's um, 
as far as he knows, you know, like a thousand years back of unbroken Chinese descent. Um, um, but as I want to suggest, the problem isn't one just of accuracy and generated photos. Um, and this one, I would like to spend a little bit more time on. Um, this one is significant because uh, it offers image banks for marketing and industry that claim to generate infinite diversity, as they put it through worry-free AI systems that are supposed to help companies and individuals construct these facial portraits of people that do not exist in the flesh to quote, be used for any purpose without worry about copyrights, distribution rights, infringement um, claims or royalties. So in creating what the site calls these virtual new people, the apps eugenics really claim to offer a workaround for privacy concerns. And it bills itself as the future of intelligence, but it nonetheless reinscribes really reductive regressive characterizations of race, among other options for users, enabling them to select parameters when creating the portrait such as age, hair length, eye color, motion through facial expression, which we don't have time for here, but obviously is highly problematic and controversial, even though a lot of AI development, particularly in healthcare, um, has turned to putatively diagnosing universal affective states. I actually highly recommend Surrogate Humanity, which was um, a, a, a text by uh, Kalinda Vora and Nita Adnoski. Uh, they have a really rich discussion of the racialization of robot emotions. And in any case, you know, the generated racial option has this drop down of generic homogenizing categories, Asian, African-American, black, um, Latino, European, white, skin color options that are presented similarly as self-evident and unproblematic givens that are drawn from an off the shelf color chart. And of course, um, as many of you know, um, let me see if I get this one. There's a very long history of um, such color charts from the Van Lucian chromatic scale um, used for the first half of the 20th century to establish racial classifications, the Fitzpatrick scale, it's still really common in dermatologist offices today. Um, and it classifies skin types by color symbolized by five smiling emoji modifiers. And although the latter makes no explicit claims about race and they are much more sophisticated now, they're all talking about neuro light um, registers, it, you can still see that there, um, there's the euphemism of uh, pigmentary phototype. So people who might present as gender fluid or ethnically ambiguous, to whom they might be presenting as such as never marked, of course, their panoptic sorting view from nowhere, they're remanded back into the boundaries and borders of the color line, literally and figuratively put back in their place. So the technological dependence on classificatory schema makes it really impossible to see race or any other socially constructed category as the dynamic relational social processes they are. And most problematically, for me at least, it makes invisible the cultural work, in this case I was looking at it was race, is performing in any given moment in space. So the apps, they don't just deflect, they disincentivize attention to the historical and contextual meanings attached to race that give it saliency and power and therefore distract also from the social, commercial or political ends it serves. So dirt, the policy implications are broad because diversity becomes just an issue of statistical representation within a status quo, one in which concerns about redressing bias or mitigating negative impact or achieving equity still presume this universal normative subject and thus in which the discourses of safety standards or fairness audits are framed in lieu of systemic reform or social justice. And I really wanna stress that the problem is not one simply of inaccuracy, which leads some to think the answer is just the generation of ever more categories, nor of gender or racial misrecognition, which might some have led to, to see as a call for more ever sophisticated FRT and the generation of multiple putatively more refined racial categories as in Brazil, for instance, I can think of other countries has historically led to greater, not lesser social inequities. So on the one hand, certainly hybridities hold possibility for transformation because they appear to slip beyond the pale and yoke of social order and historical time. But on the other hand, ironically, the strategic act of boundary crossing and transgression can in and of itself mark more sharply and thereby inadvertently essentialize those boundaries. 
In fact, it's really important to note that hybridity in and of itself can't prevent the deep political and financial investments in racial profile, not to mention surveillance, because ambiguity is associated, at least with hybridity, has already been monetized. It's comfortably accommodated within a racial capitalist economy that touts the progressive inclusion of multiracials as sign and proof of what it is at heart, a conservative agenda that insists um, multiracials herald the end of race. But if people seen as currently all mixed race people are all the rage in no small part because of the ends it serves, at least in the US with these complacent narratives about racial progress, gender non-binarism to the extent that it rejects the categories underwriting the presumption of opposite sexes and gender non-conformity are still held at bay as a domestic threat. And it remains so in part, I think, because as Eva Sachs note, the states historically invested in regulating marriage then, and thus specifically reproduction. The government's laws have traditionally ensured the patrilineal inheritance of wealth within heteronormative communities. So laws in the US, such as the one drop rule, which was a notion that individuals, uh, children would follow the mother's condition, meaning offspring of a black woman could not inherit land, money or other property from a white father who under slavery were also their mother's rapists. So, or the outlawing of same-sex unions, since they also interrupt normative laws regulating the circulation of wealth within normative communities, the types of people who hold political power, and thus the keys to the state self-interest. And in that way, heteronormativity and miscegenation are historically tied at the hip. And I mentioned the political resistance to ambiguity to point up the institutional and systemic nature of those anxieties. I'd argue it's much more about power than about some innate cognitive fear of the unfamiliar or unknown, and that's how it's actually often framed. But the backdrops inform, but don't entirely explain the challenges to and problems with AI in relation to ambiguity. Um, I'm not attaching particular politics or corporate intent to its common, you know, as it's often understood, but the proliferation and ubiquity of gender and racial typologies lies with some confluence of a profit for good motive with a back to the future imperative that requires and feeds a nostalgia for these racial and gender categories that have been dangerously resurrected and repurposed for our futures. And I think of James Baldwin's comments in A Stranger in the Village that social change requires overcoming white willed amnesia about our racial history, a past he says that continues to animate our present. And given any Rat that, you know, you think of any reckoning or reconciliation, he said would likely involve robbing white people of the jewel of their naivete, as he put it, the precious innocence they hold fast to. And the work won't be easy for in the apps I mentioned earlier, AI's digital amalgamation of races not only reinscribes racial categories and leaves unquestioned the categorizing imperative embedded in these technologies, the frictionless computer play of mix and match also deflects all critical attention away from the urgent global, political, social, and economic questions around racial inequality. Um, we might challenge this procedural erasure of gender and ethnic ambiguity by looking beyond simple questions of accurate representation, beyond the distraction of usually personal data scraping apps geared posing as, uh, as creative entertainment. And I wanted to finish up by saying I really appreciated um, Shakir Mohammed's work on decolonial AI and his comments Monday night as respondent to Ruha's lecture that pedagogical change joining um, uh, the disciplines might not occur in an educational institution so built on funding so deeply wed to professionalize disciplinary training and methodologies and practices. And as someone who works and teaches in interdisciplinary humanities, I have seen some spaces embedded in curricula, but in community that give me some solace and inspiration, in particular, some emerging artists, technologists of color and others more deeply engaging um, humanities um, with arts. And let me see if I have the next uh, our slide. I don't know why I'm not seeing it up here. Um, for some reason, it's not advancing to, oh, there it is, good. Oh, good, okay, Oop. Um, uh, Let me go back, just one, just really wanted you to see this one earlier. Oh, sorry, I keep hitting it and then it goes, sorry, technology. <laughs> so um, one, one of them, it, it, I wanted us to, to just notice a couple of them because you already all know, and there's been panels on this, that art sits at the intersection of technology representation and influence. And so 
um, storytelling impacts implicitly or explicitly everything from product design to public policy, of course. And you know, even before GPT-3, really powerful natural language processing were enabling explorations in AI-assisted poetry, film scripts, informed musicals, AI-advised symphonies, AI-curated art histories, AI-augmented music. And there's been a lot of conversation and articles over the status and meaning and valuation of AI generated or augmented art. Um, into that mix came an article by Kate Crawford and Lute Stark that was about the work of art in the age of AI. Um, and they promisingly suggested that artists should be sort of at the center of these conversations. But they also concluded that it would be helpful if more artists had um, technical training, as they put it. And so there's frameworks for their data art because otherwise their ability to analyze and assess the merits of the work are limited. And I wanna just say, clearly continuing education is all to the good, but I would very much welcome an equivalent suggestion that those in data science, computer science, engineering technology, in turn to continue to educate themselves about aesthetics and arts practice, including a passing familiarity with feminist, queer, decolonial disability and race studies approaches to AI, that are often central to those practices to, to understand ethical debates in their field. Because without that balance, the suggestion that artists um, and non-technical lay people are the ones who primarily need the education, that they require technical training and credentialing in order to have a valid and validated understanding of and legitimate say in the political, ethical, social, and economic discussions about AI is a kind of subtle gatekeeping. That is one of the many unacknowledged barriers to cross-disciplinary communication and collaboration. So given the differential status of the arts in relation to technology today, it's usually taken for granted that artists, not the technologists who are presumably doing much more important and time-consuming work in and for the world, have the leisure and means to not only gain traditional additional training in other fields, but also do the hard translational work necessary to integrate those often very different disciplines and practices and vocabularies and mindsets to their own creative work. And that skewed impact um, status really impacts who gains the funding, influence, and means to shape the world. So instead of asking artists to adapt to the world models and pedagogies informing technological training, which as with any education, as people have noted, is not simply the neutral acquisition of skills, but an inculcation into very particular ways of thinking and doing, industry might do well to adapt broader vernacular cultural practices and techne of marginalized Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities. As Ruha has pointed out, um, there's wonderful artist technologists like Amelia Bearskin Winger, who often who offers different epistemological foundations and ethics and, and with antecedent technologies. The one you're looking at right there is actually informed by disability culture. It's AI augmented art drawn on GANs, generative adversarial networks, to envision normative subjects that are differently raced, differently gendered, neurally typical, disabled in its effort to imagine and reimagine enshrined notions of how bodies can or should move or look or communicate or gain accessibility. And it's very pointedly her work. And then um, here it was a, 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 um, uh, a blind artist and also Rashad Newsom, who I get to have a shout out because he's the artist in residence at the Institute for Human-Centered AI. Um, uh, here, I'll put him up, where is it? And it's he's on being two now, it's not just being one. Um, and has been very important because he also is challenging the usually taken for granted premise that AI is in the service of optimization or functionality, which is especially problematic in the context of human augmentation in relation to those with varying um, physical abilities as well. So Newsom's being, so I'm sure, I'm so glad you, I know he's also virtual, um, but he'll be great to, to actually talk to, is a different artistic provocation that also speaks to the possibilities of, of ambiguity um, that reframes form and content of traditional technological historiographies that are often told from that view from nowhere. So his being that you're gonna look at is a, it's a griot, a storyteller, but unlike most social robots commanded to speak, being is intentionally very uppity 
in the old school sway and wayward, non-compliant, disobedient with expressive gestures that are drawn from black queer vogue dance repertoire, which are also meant as gestures of decolonial resistance to the labor and service that social robots are expected to perform. It also upends, hopefully you can interact with it when it's there, but the historical association of um, uh, in movement, affect, function, and speech. So he takes aim at the limited training data sets used in natural language processing and draws on these broader archives of African-American vernacular symbolic systems. And since language carries cultural knowledge, being speech expands not just vocabularies, but imaginaries, how the standardized expressions of emotion and behavior often deployed in AI are gendered and racially and culturally encoded. And I just wanted to end with, I think it's the artist that's gonna save us and enact all those futurities that we need now as Vanessa Chang said, to go beyond the borders of the skull to imagine new literacies and ways of knowing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry to cut you off, but I just- No, wanted... I cut myself oh, off. Okay. I'm sorry I went on to you. No, no worries. I'm just so amazed that it's 2 a.m. there and I wish I could bottle your energy and just drink it for breakfast, but- It's called um, coffee. I'm Maria amazed. Has to <laughs> I'm so amazed. I hope you get a day of rest today after that brilliant intervention. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm going to reserve my uh, reflections for the end just to make sure we get- to everyone. And so Maria, the floor is yours. All right, give me a moment to share. All right, thank you. So my presentation, Escaping Prison, Understanding the Uses of Digital Communication Technology. Perhaps you have seen one of these headlines. In academia, we often hear about the use of technology in data extraction, in areas of medicine, policing, and law. But we know very little about its purposes and uses in correctional facilities, when in fact, prisons across the world are becoming more intelligent and dubbed smart. So what are smart prisons? According to the National Institute of Corrections, US prisons are armed with body cameras, drones, biometrics, facial recognition, electronic monitoring and GPS, artificial intelligence and tablets. The goal of smart prisons are to boost efficiency in operations, visibility to critical data and the utilization of cutting edge uh, technology to dramatically change the way facilities operate. For this project, I will focus on prison, prison tablets. Oh, sorry. I started this project the semester before the coronavirus took a global hold. At the time, the use of prison tablets in prisons were already spreading rapidly, but little was known about its volume. I suspect as a result of the virus to resolve issues of isolation and connection related to the ban on visitation, receiving packages and on-site programs, um, prison tablets are even more widespread. Tablets operate on a restricted internet service. Companies such as JPay, GTL, and Securus Technologies provide tablets. They are capable of complete communication, <clears throat> sorry, that means email, text, video messaging, phone calls, video visitation. They are able to access entertainment, download books, games, music, news, and movies. And, I, and they also have access to educational content, the law library. Along with these features, incarcerated people are able to submit administrative documents, attend court hearings, and meet with medical officials. As identified in my research, while the tablets are capable of all of these services, the extent to which um, a person that is incarcerated is able to use them varies from prison to prison. They're often uh, iteratively, iteratively uh, introduced to prisons. According to GTO, the introduction of tablets help claim I'm sorry, calm incarcerated people, increases connection to their loved ones and assists with the accountability and, and responsibility. It reduces recidivism and increases, increases prison efficiency. Together, JPay, GTL and Securus Technology make up 80% of the prison communication technology. GT GTL even refers to itself as the apple of prison technology. 
Tablets are provided to prisons at no cost, but families purchase them and have to pay steep prices to engage them. An example of this is in Virginia. Incarcerated people pay by the minute to read ebooks. Further, in many states, once tablets are introduced, many in-person privileges and programs are eliminated. So that means a ban on in-person visitations, library services, and group classes and programs. Lastly, while much of what is written on prison tablets focus on financial costs, my project aims to understand both the benefits and the collateral consequences that's tangible and intangible of tablets. Funded by the NSF, this current project stems from a much larger research question. That is, what are the goals of data surveillance in smart prisons? How is data used to amplify or modify punishment? And what are the broader social consequences? This presentation today will, um, will answer the latter. Um, and primarily we'll focus on how does prison communication technology act as both a tool to increase emotional closeness and institutionalize those incarcerated and their loved ones. We'll lightly touch on how is surveillance perceived and how does it impact communication between incarcerated people and their loved ones. Methodology. I conducted semi-structured interviews that took place over a few mediums. Some were in person, others were over video, um, and then many more were over the phone. Because this project started as a pilot, this work results from convenient sampling. I recruited subjects from Facebook prison support group pages and forums. I also reached out to system impacted and formerly incarcerated organizations. I posted solicitations onto uh, social media pages. Um, and of those that commented with interest, I messaged them over direct message to schedule an interview. Interviews lasted between 45 minutes and two hours. I also read blogs and newspaper articles about the introduction of technology. I monitored social media chats, conversations in both the support groups, prison facility pages, and telecommunication pages. Finally, I welcome your feedback as this project is ongoing and evolving. Okay, so motivating literature. In accordance with Dominique Moran, I am adding to the volume of research that critiques Goffman's total institution. Despite its physical structure and entrenched surveillance, the walls of the prisons are in fact permeable. On a continued feedback loop, prison is influenced by those on the outside, just as those on the outside are impacted by those incarcerated. This can be seen in culture, in new crimes, in smuggling in and out of contraband and policy decisions. Moran explores liminal carceral space of in-person conjugal visits. She finds that frequent suspended status between captive and free and the extent loved ones go to make their time together feel like home heightened secondary pr prisonization. Mega Comfort describes secondary prisonization as a hybrid status. Building on the process and indicators of prisonization coined by sociologist Donald Clemmers, Comfort applies various, I'm sorry, variables of prisonization um, those the variables such as the duration of contact with the correctional facility, the ability to absorb prison as a primary group, and the degree and levels of resistance to prison dogmas and codes. She applies these variables to free people who interact with the carceral system due to their relationship with an incarcerated person. Com Comfort finds that contact transforms conduct, physical appearances, agendas, and speech. Extending comforts in Moran's research into the digital age, the purpose of this project is to understand the way in which newer modes of communication amplify and or evolve the process of secondary prisonization in smart prisons. Further, I argue that through digital communication, the frequency of interaction deepens and expands the suspended status between free and captive and the institutionalization of loved ones. So on to findings. To start, I wanted to learn and confirm um, Comfort's methods of communication. So before asking about tablet use, I asked about in-person visitation, phone calls, and letter writing. You come up and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's the prison. Like, there's no missing it. That's when it kind of hit me, like he's in prison. There was a barbed wire fences, big ass buildings. There's correctional officers everywhere. You can see the towers everywhere and that was interesting, it kind of sucked. That was a sad feeling for me. 
I had to get through, this is a second person says, I had to get through metal detectors, which I expected, and then pat it down. I had to shake my bra and make the, make sure, I'm sorry, make sure there wasn't anything on me. Every door was locked and they had to be unlocked to get to the next door. And then like to go to the bathroom, they had they will keep it locked. When I was finished, I had to wait for a guard to come and we would go back into the room and she would have to do the bra thing again. I was pretty nervous. I was like shaking actually. This, the discussions about in-person visits were always the most emotional. I could feel the longingness in the pent up frustrations. Respondents often mentioned biological reactions to recalling their visits, or I could visibly see the anxiety through leg shaking, hand fidgeting, lip biting. Respondents became immersed in their recollection of the in-person visit. As evident in these examples, life as they know it, the freedom that they know is suspended, but it's worth the embrace in the real life interaction. Lastly, in these examples, I would also like to point out the visible and actionable surveillance. We will track this uh, uh, throughout modes of communication. So on to phone calls. Okay, so in order to be able to call somebody, at least where he's at, I had to send a phone bill to the prison and then it had to be approved so that I could be on his phone list. Now, when I first started talking to him, I was using a prepaid phone. So I didn't have a bill. I had to sign up like with a carrier, which made my bill at least $100 more a month. Adaptations such as this is common. Loved ones have learned to condition themselves to be flexible, to make changes as necessary to ensure contact. When we asked if she thought she was being monitored while on the phone, she, like many others, indicated yes and mentioned the automated message. This certainly shifts as we move into more digital forms of communication. It was very obvious, like we'll be on the phone and it says, you know, please remember that your phone call is being monitored and reported, you know, every so often. We actually have our own system coded language that I was taught when I first met him. So again, the adoption of language. Now on to email. Comfort describes letter writing as all consuming and even a ritual process, ritualized process. The letter served as a gift, but with technology, letter writing has decreased due to more immediate forms of contact. To me, writing letters is a hassle. You know, I gotta write it, then I have to put, a, put it in an envelope, I have to put a stamp on it, then I have to go take it to the mailbox. Like, it was just too much for me. I already have hella shit going on. So I'm just like, writing a letter feels like a task. Here we also see the formation of a boundary, the erecting of a physical wall that will not indicating that, it, that her contact will not consume her everyday life. This woman is also pursuing a bachelor's degree. In future interviews, it would be interesting to see if there are any correlation of boundary making in education level. Megan Comfort makes this connection. I would like to build on that. However, this same wife also still sends monthly care package, packages and ensures she sends money routinely. In smart prisons, email functions like text messages. It has become the new gift or a sign of involvement and connecting this to another. Typically, I'll wake up to an email from him and bless his heart, he's just so amazing. He knows that my expectations are like moral and emotional support. So I wake up to an email every morning telling me all the things that I want to hear, um, of course. And then we talk about what I'm going to do for the rest of the day and what he's going to do for the rest of the day. Then by the end of the day, we talk about how our day went and we just really try and talk about each other's emotions and try to help each other, each other grow. Here we see the opposite. This respondent is all consumed. The limits of freedom and captivity are blurred. They bleed into one another. This respondent knows her boyfriend's prison schedule as if it was her own. She schedules her day around his uh, likely availability. Onto video visitation. I know I was being monitored because the video cut off a couple of times. Um, I didn't realize I couldn't wear a spaghetti strap shirt. They cut off and he thought that the backdrop had fallen. And he was like, just try it again. I tried it again and it cut off our visit right away. So the guards are watching. I could see people walking by, but it seemed like there was a barrier there. I know there were people standing there in line waiting for the kiosk. People could hear them for sure. It didn't bother me, but it bothered him a little bit. Like he was embarrassed to say certain things. I was super nervous at the beginning. I'm just not used to the whole video kind of thing. And then with it lagging so much, it was just, it was awkward. 
we just really couldn't have much of a conversation at all. This case was interesting because sure, we can understand and expect women's attire to be policed within a correctional facility. But here we see the introduction of digital communication with, with the use of digital communication, the reach and control of the prison extends to the home of loved ones. Further, to continue with this comparison, unlike in-person visit where the rules are clearly stated and correctional officers audibly reinforce regulation, this respondent and her significant other had to play a guessing game to understand what triggered the disconnect. Thus, we see information sharing is asymmetrical. Finally, the incarcerated person's response to betweenness. On one hand, he chose to schedule the video visit the kiosk, thus we can assume he desired to physically see his wife, but this hybrid status, the visual interaction with his former life while still behind bars stifled him. And vice versa, she was also embedded in the prison environment. She witnesses the prison background. She is accepting of these conditions. Her only complaint is the internet connection. So for some final thoughts, in-person visits are still the most important form of communication. Other forms of communication can often feel more transactional. In-person visits are often required, I'm sorry, they often require travel and can be difficult to schedule. Letter writing has phased out. Emails are the new cornerstone for communication despite its ability to be digitally stored, character limitations, obscene costs to send an email and complaints of it being an inconsistent medium. Similar to letters, when emails contain inappropriate content, they are not sent to its recipient. However, dissimilar to letters, the sender is not notified that the email was not sent and no reason is provided. Thus, we have another case of asymmetric information sharing. Through each form of communication, we can see how prison interaction not only shapes social relations, but becomes an integral part of the everyday lives of loved ones. Loved ones have a difficult time establishing healthy boundaries. Prison tablet communication deepens perceptions of connectedness and individuality. And with that, I leave you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I can already see some incredible connections across the two papers. We'll hear from Rachel and then open things up for discussion. If you're listening online or here in the room, if you have a question, please get them ready. We'll hear them after Rachel. Thank you so much. It is really, really exciting to be here at such an incredible event with such incredible speakers. Um, and I'm learning so, so much. So, so that's always, always wonderful. Um, I am Rachel Adams. I'm, I'm a researcher based in South Africa. Um, a lot of my work has been in supporting African governments develop uh, policy responses to artificial intelligence, which as you can imagine comes with a whole host of really interesting questions. Um, my own research has been around thinking through what it means to talk about decolonizing AI, what that entails, and what the world beyond the decolonial horizon, what the worlds beyond the decolonial horizons um, might look like and, and what those foundations might be based on. So this is a presentation that is based on a book I'm, I'm writing on, on, on this, uh, around these questions of, of decolonizing AI and forms one of the later chapters. So I'm gonna start, and my starting point here is to state rather than to question that there are imperial forms of power at work in the technologies and industries and imaginaries we associate with artificial intelligence. Many of the presentations have, have uh, exemplified and, and given evidence to testify to support this. So, so that's my starting point. So instead, I want to look at this question of decolonization, the double imperative I think it holds and to look at the kind of second half of this. So I'm gonna talk quickly about what I'm taking the idea of decolonization to mean in a working and moving and fluid and flexible way. Um, so I'm framing it as the search for freedom, 
for human dignity and re-communitization. This, this is a really important idea, especially where we see artificial intelligence breaking down communities that are marred by colonial enterprises and their afterlives. And I see decolonization as holding to a double injunction, a double kind of command for, for, for what us as decolonial scholars and activists and practitioners seek, seek and need to do. So the first being to, to make intelligible and abolish the continued operations of coloniality, which include systems of patriarchal and racial oppression. And the second one, which is what I'm interested to discuss with you today, is to collectively reimagine a multifarious world space and a new form of democracy of all the world centered on the very truly radical idea of true human equality. So what, is, what does this involve? Um, and here I, I, I want to try and spell this out a little bit more, more clearly. Um, as involving the delivery of humanity from the myopia of the Western imaginary, we must find new explanations and symbols for the world and look elsewhere for the answers to the questions we face and gather together alternate histories of the present. So with respect to AI, this involves exploring, making visible and celebrating alternate frameworks of knowledge and ways of being which radically expand the boundaries of thought and experience by which we come to understand AI and its effects on and relations within society. So one of the key issues that we have been exploring and, and which many of my colleagues, including Stephen Cave and Candida Hall have done some leading work around is this crisis of representation that is um, Within, within artificial intelligence and how AI comes to be represented or embodied within, uh, within technology, within the socio-technical. So some of my own work has explored the gendering of digital assistants as white women. Uh, and I've got a quote here from Siri who, who, who when asked, you know, what is your gender? It states my voice sounds like a woman, but I exist beyond your human concept of gender. So I, I found this really, really interesting that technology was seeming to purport to create or transcend the normative categories of being that, that, that we have uh, within our world, but at the same time, they enforce them. Um, and then of course, Stephen Cave and, and De Hal have explored these representations in relation to, to whiteness and, and spoken about this diversity dilemma. How then do we move forward in representing or seeking to uh, create embodied uh, AI in a way that does not reproduce this crisis of representation? Is there a way of doing this? And they explore various different approaches to that question. So my, my response, and, and I'm really at the beginning of, of, of research around this, I, I'm fascinated by, by, by exploring how diverse African ontologies can give us very, very different perspectives around the idea of the socio-technical and how technology exists within the human and social world. So for me, there was these kind of questions that, that, that I came to that, I, that, that, that are framing the inquiry that, that I seek, that I'm seeking to do here. Um, how have animate objects, non-human intelligence been made sense of in societies outside of the Western canon of automata? We have really quite rich uh, literature, which presents a very long, <laughs> centuries long history of how the West has created life in the image of man and portrayed an idea of a synthetic uh, or fabricated intelligence. So, so how does that question look in, in different societies with different histories of animate objects and non-human intelligence? And what function do they play in helping communities and societies make sense of their own world space, what is its symbolic, their symbolic value? How are questions of 
representation, anthropomorphism, and gender then handled and enchanted objects of other cultures. What role does anthropomorphism, representation, and, and gender play in making intelligence culturally identifiable? And then how does this grow our repertoire for making sense of AI and help us move towards this kind of decolonized horizon uh, that we're seeking to, to transcend towards? So I think there is much to be explored in an African context that is so needed in order to work against the very dominant narratives that is very much part of my everyday work around how Africa is the kind of passive recipient of technology developed elsewhere, whether from the West or from the East, that, China, that, that Africa is the recipient of benevolent development aid, uh, that Africa is the testing ground for new and emerging technologies, or that Africa is the site of extraction of raw materials, wh whether human or otherwise. And so these narratives are really significant in shaping the role that the African continent as a whole plays in global discourse uh, and discussion and policy making around AI in a way that is only perpetuating the geopolitics of, uh, of the past. So I wanted to, to think against this um, and, and to think with the idea of how can we find new answers to old questions that Western thought may not have the answers to in other parts of the world. And because I'm here and because this is what I'm interested in, this is where I look. Um, Achille Mbembe is one of the most important thinkers around the question of Africa, the question of this now idea of a singular concept, which is of course not. And he speaks of African histories of technologies and in, in incredibly, incredibly powerful ways. Um, so I, I want to just quickly read this quote from him from, from a book that he uh, published this year, came out in English, Out of the Dark Night, Essays on Decolonization. That Africa did not invent somobaric bombs does not mean that it created neither technical objects nor works of art, or that it was close to borrowings or to innovation. It privileged other modes of existence within which technology in a strict sense constituted neither a force of rupture and disfraction, nor a force of divergence and separation, but rather a force of splitting and multiplication. At the heart of this dynamic, each concrete and distinct reality was always and by definition a symbol of something else, of another figure and structure. So he sees technology or these, the, the, the traditional African sense of, of, of technologies and of craft as creating openings, apertures to new possibilities, rather than fixing normative ideas that exist within the world. They are windows to new, fluid, multiple, transmorphic uh, possibilities, um, and entirely, and this is important, entirely relational. So, I have been exploring this in, in, in relation to the um, Igbo mythologies and ontologies uh, in the south east region of, of Nigeria, um, only at present in relation to, 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 to literature I, I've been reading and um, I have work that will eventually take me there and, 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 and I hope to supplement this through other kinds of data collection methodologies, so to speak. But the Ogbanji is a really, really interesting idea, an idea of this kind of changing child, a spirit child who exists in liminal spaces between life and death, between the different genders, between this world and the next. It is a child that um, is reincarnated, that keeps coming back and often dies at a very young age and then comes back to the same mother 
uh, born of the same human mother, is a child of God's of the spirit that, that comes to embody um, a human form uh, in repeated, in repeated ways. And the Ogbonji has a chi, an enchanted object that's often sort of a stone or something that connects them uh, between the spirit world and, and, and the earthly world, uh, ties them to life. It has an intelligence that is both human and extra human or supernatural. Uh, it is always behaviorally difficult to uh, control an Ogbanji. So, so human forms of governance always seek to try to limit and discipline the Ogbanji child, which is, is always a sort of difficult um, uh, child to, to discipline and, and, and to raise. Uh, both behaviorally and in terms of their close affinity to death, to, to, to the possibility that they may die. Um, so it, it, it's there within these kind of existing, uh, within these kind of liminal spaces in a way that I think is, is really interesting. And this is from work that Chinwei Achebe, so Chinua Achebe's wife, uh, a book that she wrote on, on the world of the Ogbanji. So the Ogbanji was, uh, sort of um, memorialized in Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, the, the, the kind of key post-colonial um, African novel, where there's this key figure called Enzima, who is the daughter of Nkwankwo. So he is the, the head of, of his, the leader of his community. He is a man, Nkwankwo is a man that his father was criticized for being very feminine, for not being able to produce crops and not being able to make a success of himself and marry lots of women and create many huts and keep many harvests of food. And so a conquest sought to be the very opposite of this and perform the kind of ultimate masculinity of Igbo society. And then he has this daughter in Zima who is not very well. She, she, she's an old bungee and so she is, um, her life is constantly at threat and, and her mother dedicates everything to, to keeping her alive. But she plays this important role in the character arc of Okwankwo insofar as she softens his masculinity and Achebe makes a, a, quite a kind of emphasized point around how Enzima, uh, Okwankwo seeks to comfort in Zima when she's unwell to protect her, to share food with her like eggs that are not supposed to be for children and just, just to treat her rather differently to how he would have treated his other daughters from, from the kind of cultural codes. So you can see here the role of the Afanji in shifting the boundaries and borders of, and categories of gender of others too. So we can already see this idea of their relational role. Then I, I want to talk to you about an incredible book, an incredible author called Akweke and Maisie, who wrote a book, uh, uh, their first book called Freshwater in, in 2018, where they return the idea of the Okpanji. So in the years following uh, Achebe's book, Western colonialism and, and, and its scientific uh, epistemologies rewrote the story of the Ogbanji as uh, sickle cell disease or schizophrenia and undid or ruptured the symbolic uh, method of mythology of, of, of what it thought, it, what it was and what it represented within uh, Igbo ontologies. Um, and Amazie's book brings, brings this idea back in a really kind of interesting and forceful way. And this is where Amizi differs from uh, Achilman Bembe. Achilman Bembe feels that these African ontologies and epistemologies of, of technology, of, of craft, of liminality and spirituality are, are lost. They've been entirely lost and rewritten and written over by Western imperialism that denigrated their logic as, as impossible. Whereas Amazie, and I think this is the incredible power of, of literature, because it, it does rather than says, is 
they bring it back as something that's not anachronistic, but something that is contemporary and, and present and to be reckoned with. Amazi is an Ogbanji. Uh, that is what and who they are in, in this world, not just as an author and, and as a fictional writer, but as their identity. Um, and the idea is of gender becomes something that is very, very central here, not just in terms of subverting uh, Nigerian notions and cultural codes of gender, but also Western uh, forms and, and ideas around gender too. But Amazie's book, when it first came out, was not accepted as such. It was accepted as a, it was interpreted as a metaphor for mental health and the mental struggles of being transgendered, of feeling, uh, of having multiple and plural identities and, and of ideas around becoming, but, but do read it. it, it's really, really fabulous. So then they wrote another book, Pierce and Thurin, uh, a Black Spirit memoir, where they more clearly articulated this idea of being and, and, and the reality of being a spirit child, a child of spirits, living in a human world, being subject to gender norms um, and the kind of history that they faced in, uh, in, in publishing a book like, like Freshwater. So I, I have a quick quote here, and I'm trying to be mindful of time, but I think I'm just about okay. Uh, that that, that Amazie cites in one of the earlier chapters, to be an Ogbanji is to be categorized as other, to bring alterity home in a way that transcends the more ordinary bifurcated otherness of gender. This other gender is marked from birth as male and female statues are marked by special behaviors towards and physical adornment of the child. The sexual appearance of the Ogbanji may indeed be seen as a sham, yet another promise that the Ogbanji is likely to break in its refusal to, uh, to act according to human norms. What I think is, is also incredibly powerful is Amazie's uh, testimony of going through a series of surgeries, um, which we may without broader understanding, take as the surgeries that a transgendered person might go through in order to shape their body according to what felt authentic. But it may just speak about it in another way. So the Ogbanji changeling child within traditional Igbo culture was often mutilated as a child in order for when they returned as another child of that mother, that they may be recognized. And so Amazie talks about their surgeries, their breast reduction and their hysterectomy as a mutilation of the self, as a fulfillment of the kind of um, prophecy of an Ogbanji, uh, but in an in a incredibly interesting and, and powerful way. And there's an essay in Dear Centurion that begins, the robot's name was Da Vinci. So, so for those of us interested in how all this connects back to ideas of artificial intelligence, there's this opening line about the robot that conducted the hysterectomy and named after this crucial figure in Western science. So how does all of this help us expand beyond the kind of dominant frameworks of, of artificial intelligence. So I already spoke about this kind of powerful idea of technology as relational and situated within fluid and recomposite worlds. Uh, and Zima shifting the borders of her father's masculinity and then that kind of complex network of the Banji and the Chi and then their relationship with the earthly world and the mother that must do everything, the earthly mother that must do everything to protect their life and keep them safe. And then their relationship with the spiritual world, which would be either Mama Wata, if it's the, the, the spirit world of water, or Allah is the earthly spirit world. And then I think there's these other ideas about how 
knowledge and wisdom of the West and certainly this kind of technological determinism we, we, are, we are up against today is on this kind of continual progressive line of progress that, that destroys that which precedes it. Whereas I think that within the kind of idea of the Ogbanji and this, the Igbo mythologies, we see this idea of, of, of a secular renewal of, of knowledge and wisdom and the idea of being able to return. Uh, the, 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 the literal translation of Ogbanji is to, to come and to go, to come and go, which is a, a, a key idea actually within uh, West Africa, to come and go. So I think it also reminds us that we may face another AI winter, hopefully, and that things are not on this uh, impossible staggering path of progression forward. Then I think it asks us to rethink the notion of the human itself. And this is something that is really exciting within African um, ontologies and epistemologies, the idea that the human is very much more than what exists between life and death. The human encompasses the unborn and all the uh, relatives and, and ancestors that, that came before them, uh, amazing uh, themselves as, as, as a spirit child and distinctly non-human. And, and, and again, with this, the idea that humans are not at the apex of intelligence of power, which is something that within the Anthropocene is an idea we are coming back to more and more and I think is particularly important in a decolonial context. And then more broadly to rethink our relationship through technology and technology as relational with the world. And again, I want to quote from Mbembe, who speaks of as technology in an African sense as part of a participatory ecosystem in which the world was not an object to be conquered, which we think about the way in which in a Western sense, technology is seen as a force through which humankind can conquer nature. It was not an object to be conquered, but a reserve of potentials and in which there was no pure and absolute power, but that which was the source of life and of fecundity. So I'm doing a, a very typical academic thing, which is quite self-serving to end by asking more questions. And I, I want to return a little bit here to some of the themes that we've been discussing at the conference about how, how does this then, then help us in the work of decolonizing AI beyond giving us new and alternate foundations from which to imagine different kinds of futures. Uh, these are some of the questions that I, I think uh, arise as, as we come to consider these things. What are the politics required to transcend the normative binaries and boundaries which AI fortifies and depends on um, and consult alternative ontologies and epistemologies of the socio-technical. This is a politics that as I work with African governments in developing AI strategies becomes incredibly important. How, how do we bring back this idea that local contexts and value systems are the central starting point for how we seek to govern that which is at work in our societies, wherever it comes from. Um, and then I think this involves many other questions around anti-racial strategies um, and the very deep complexities of, of how we do that and, and how we acknowledge privilege in ways that are difficult to see and difficult to acknowledge. And then what do we lose as we automate the boundaries which categorize our world and as we take technology as a static force upon the world rather than a force within it. But I think we can see much of what we lose uh, when we do that. We, we lose some of the forced categorizations that serve particular uh, forms and uh, positions of power that Michelle spoke about earlier. And how can we reclaim authorities which provide us with the foundations of an exit from this kind of framing? So I'm going to end here, but very happy for any questions. And thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. All right, so I'm going to jump in with um, a few questions. And if you have a question in the room, please let me know. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists, 
um, if you could, because we have just about 10 minutes or so, um, to give us your nutshell responses uh, as opposed to what will probably be um, much more elaborate um, uh, thinking about about these questions. So for Michelle, I'll first say how much I appreciated um, how you underscored the way that ambiguity, liminality, hybridity can very easily reinforce the false idea of purity. To be transgressive, you have to hold things in place. And, and, and so getting us to understand and think about how our fixes um, whether they be social or technical, can often reproduce the problems we're attempting to short circuit. And also troubling this idea of choice as a way out, choice about racial identity. Um, and so reminding us how, it's not simply about how we each identify, but how we're identified. And in your discussion of racial vision as this culturally training of the eye, cultural training of the eye, it reminded me again of Wendy Chun's um, point about how deep historical fakes um, are, are the ground truth. <laughs> and so really kind of turning on its head where we look for the truth or what, what is false. And so um, the census, for example, the reveals, what are you really? Um, and, and thinking about how that truth is actually been, has been fabricated over time, whether through policy, through norms, and, and now as you show through technology. So the question for you, um, Michelle, uh, two questions, one from me and one from um, someone um, virtually. Um, so you're what I would call, I would say you're in the belly of the beast <laughs> when it comes to technology in Silicon Valley. Um, so when I'm sure you're asked by technologists how after laying out that complexity and all those um, landmines, how they can better represent race without falling into these traps. I'm really eager to hear how you respond to that, that now what question. Also, Carrie asks, could you ask Michelle to expand further on the relationship between AI as a marker of futurity and the contemporary coding of multiraciality as a bearer of futurity, specifically the fantasy of a post-racial future? So I'm going to come back to you, Michelle. I'm going to pose the questions to Maria and Rachel um, very briefly, and then we'll, st we'll go in this order, Michelle, Maria, and Rachel. So Maria, in researching smart prisons and prison tablets, I really appreciated how you started again by showing how the permeability of the prison wall doesn't make it any less punishing. <laughs> Again, the, really echoing um, in a different way what, what Michelle pointed out to us. And what it reminded me of was Roderick Crook's work in schools and technology in schools, specifically in South LA, um, at, and how the integration of technology into schools um, in predominantly black and Latinx schools actually provides new grounds for punishing students when they're not using the technology right. So in one case where they're required to always have their tablets and when they don't have their tablets, the punishment is that they have to walk around with these tablets locked. <laughs> and so getting us to think about how, um, you know, the smartness of the prison um, actually can be a, a deepening of carcerality. And so um, I guess for me, I would really be interested in hearing what you have to say about how, I mean, how we should think about a prison, prison abolitionist analysis of tablets and technology. What does it mean to, 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 to think through what you presented from an abolitionist perspective? What questions should we be asking? Um, what, what should we be looking for that's not necessarily self-evident? And lastly, Rachel, I really appreciated um, your initial framing of decolonization and that word re-communitization <laughs> um, in light of how technology tend, the technologies that we happen to have now tend towards hyper-individualization and quantification of humanity. And so in expanding this AI repertoire, as you say, and decolonizing AI, I'm really interested to hear um, how you are thinking about predatory inclusion. That is to say, exploitative borrowings or unwanted borrowings. <laughs> uh, the assumption often about expanding this repertoire is that everyone wants to be sort of included and, 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 and sort of universalized. And specifically when it comes to Emezi, I'm thinking about um, 
the pushback against her claims to Obanji among some some people in Nigeria. And so the idea that we don't want you to borrow, we don't want you to um, take this to the West. <laughs> um, and so just thinking about, again, predatory inclusion and unwanted borrowings in the context of, of your intervention. So with that, Michelle, then Maria and Rachel, just give it to us in a nutshell. Oh, thank you for those excellent, excellent questions. I'm still pondering them. Just very, very quickly um, th to start with uh, Carrie's question, I think it was about the um, knitting together of the fetish for multiraciality as the is the future that gets merged with the locomotion of AI, which is also so forward looking. And I think that they are completely enmeshed, at least culturally and politically around the issue of historical amnesia. It requires a forgetting in order to move forward. And that progressive teleological thrust forward that, um, that Rachel was also talking about is something that they share. And it's almost impossible to untether it, especially since, um, for instance, in, in the, the swing from mongrelization um, of mixed race people and the demonization of them seeing as them to this huge swing to having them in vogue is very powerful, especially for young people. They don't want to give it up. So it's um, it's a, it's an it's a effective commitment as much as it is an institutional one. Um, your question is really hard because I don't know the answer of it. It's not just even in Silicon Valley at um, the Institute for Human Centered AI. I'm working every week with um, people who are CS technologists. Um, engineering folks and everything. And I, I used to think that it had to do with DEI templates or even audits or ethical um, um, toolkits, things like that. But it goes much deeper. And listening to the two um, presentations in this, in this amazing conference has just convinced me too that it becomes much more difficult because it's actually the practice of it. So the thinking about um, discrete objects instead of fields of study, thinking about race in relational terms or even racial formation, which is so common to people who, you know, we're talking such different vocabularies that they're, they're just not understanding a lot of people why race can't be codified in, and used in these particular ways. So um, it's not helpful to just tell them you need to um, rethink your entire education, including, I would just say to end, one of the most difficult ones is one of the commitments is, is to check your identity at the door. So that commitment to objectivity that everybody has been critiquing is something that's also still held very dear and essential to people's daily um, work ethic and practice. So all I can say, Ruha, is it's a challenge and I'm looking to you for the answer for it. Oh, thank you for your question. Um, I think it's important to arm users with information and understanding of how data work, how it, it's, it tracks and how it follows. Um, it's important that we ask the consequences um, that, are, that occur outside of prison. Um, who exactly is it tracking? Um, part, part of what I do already know is that it does assess um, risk levels within prison. How does that follow? What does that mean um, with police contact on the outside? How does this um, harm or assist reintegration later? Um, and it also tracks the loved ones, their location, their voice biometrics, those sorts of things. So thinking through how we can ban or put a limit on it will be something else we need to think through. Um, but yes, that's what, those are immediate thoughts and those are the quick things. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, thank you very much, Ruha. I think this is such an important question that comes back to that idea of what are the politics of doing this. So Amazie was criticized because they are of, uh, they grew up in, um, in Nigeria as a child, in Abba, which is a place that is at the heart of the kind of Igbo community. And they were a child of an Indian mother and a Nigerian father. So they were never fully accepted as truly Nigerian. So I think this speaks to some of the questions in terms of who is speaking and who gets to speak on behalf of a cultural idea, which also is a question in terms of who am I at, in speaking this and who are we speaking to? 
But there's also the kind of question in terms of what are we seeking to do? Are we seeking to universalize alternate ideas or take alternate ideas to the West? Or are we still trying to provincialize Western ideas that have been brought over and brought upon other societies? So there's a complex politics, and I, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head in many respects. So I can't, I don't think I can give much more of an answer to that, apart from to say we must be attending to it and the politics that it contains. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, keeping it, your responses brief. Um, I want to just see if there's anyone in the room who has a question. Yes, please. I am. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, the, I thought the, all the talks were amazing. Um, I'm Isabel. I'm a sociology PhD student, and my work looks at the digital mediation of trans transnational and transracial adoption in the US. So Maria and Michelle, especially your work was super helpful. Um, for me and also Michelle just wanted to say thank you as a mixed race racially ambiguous person I really really appreciated um, your talk yeah um, I guess my question is about intimacy and how intimacy between people and intimacy that can already be racialized um, is further kind of maybe racialization or other forms of oppression within that relationship is increased by the capacities of AI or digital technology. So Michelle, with your work, I was thinking especially about the mixed race babies accounts, which are often posted by the mothers of those children, right? Which is interesting in and of itself. And Maria, with your work, just more generally, I think the question speaks to, um, yeah, the relationships between incarcerated people and those on the outside. Thank you. Have any um, thoughts about this idea of intimacy? Yeah, mm -hmm. I actually do. I was thinking. I didn't know if we had a quick moment about that. Albert Memmi said that the um, uh, the couple went to escape the world, but then they realized that the couple was the microcosm of the world. And I work a lot in my first book about um, the ways in which. Um, intimate relations were seen as a sort of sacred space away from the world, especially interracial relations. And in fact, they just become a crucible and incubator from it, but they look impervious to critique. So if you ever ask somebody, so all the things we were talking about, if there's an interracial couple, often um, uh, it's as if history is suspended. You know, people don't come together thinking, <laughs> bringing you know the history of colonialism or whatever to bear in those spaces and so the spaces actually unfortunately become places where people purge histories or reinvent other narratives that take place of it so it makes it difficult and I write a lot about those babies because you saw the babies are a very, you know a lot of the legislation in the United States to get mixed race or mark one or more as a category was initiated by white mothers who felt that they should have authority over the racial designation of their children. And very, very mad at, um, and they got the attention of Newt Gingrich, who was the Republican whip at the time, because it's very hard to change racial categories. So it was white motherhood that actually ushered it in. And a lot of the advocacy groups are very angry at Halle Berry for not I, uh, uh, um, accepting the Academy Award as a mixed race woman instead of a a black woman, which she did, and they said she was dissing her mother because this is also seen as a personal slight in the in the previously, literally a generation before. If you identified as black, it wasn't seen as some sort of shade thrown at your parents. But that has also sort of shifted. And Halle Berry said, "Look, my mother was sitting right in the in the front row, and she was perfectly happy that I accepted it as a black woman." So, I think you're right that those dynamics. Um, are particularly fascinating and fraught around the issues about the politics of mixed race identification. So thank you for that question. Thank you. And so, um, Maria, did you have anything? If not? Yeah, I just okay. wanted to, yeah, I love this question and thought about intimacy because it looks very different. It's very controlled. Um, so what you normally see is this deepened level of like conversation, this frequency and communication. Um, 
And then the, in um, Baran's work, the making of the conjugal visit, that space, very domestic, very home-like. Um, and then in other cases with the digital, you sort of see like the use of photography, um, photographs, I'm sorry, and like uh, micro videos being sent to share like those very precious moments of children, you know, participating in sports. So then that the incarcerated person feels like they're part um, of those lives. So it, it, it's, it, it helps in a, in a significant way. So thank you for that question. Thank you. And so now as we transition to break, um, just please join me in, in thanking our panelists. Um, I will say that in different ways, they really brought home our focus on critical borders, whether we're talking about bodies and identities, whether we're talking about prisons and architecture, whether we're talking about ontologies and epistemologies. And I think that they each show how the quick fix um, is not a way out, uh, not a way of transgressing, whether it's multiraciality for Michelle, whether it's the smartness of, of prisons for Maria, whether it's diversity and inclusion for Rachel, they each show that we, we might do better to create spaces and ways of staying with the trouble, as Donna Haraway might say, rather than try to subvert or short circuit the trouble through these various um, transgressions. So please join me in thanking our panel and the organizers for bringing this wonderful group of papers together. Thank you, uh, thank you, Rachel.
Great, so hello, thanks very much for, for being here and thanks to everyone online. To follow the phenomenal presentations of this morning, this panel theme is Bodily Borderlands, where we ask, how does AI trouble the boundaries between the body and technology, the fleshly and the mechanic? What is the body and what happens to the body through and with algorithmic culture? And what are the racial and gender implications of this? So when collecting abstracts for this panel, we were thinking about how feminist, anti-racist and indigenous work explores how AI pushes ordinary notions of embodiment to their logical limits. We're thrilled to have with us three wonderful panelists to respond to these areas of inquiry. First, Tyler Quick, who will discuss how Instagram automates gay beauty standards. Then Ishtiak Ahmed Levin on rethinking the Anthropocene as algorithmocene. And Flavia Saxler on open source intelligence for human rights fact finding. We've got a brief switch up, so we're going to have Flavia first. Flavia is a first year PhD student in sociology of media and culture here at the University of Cambridge. She's working at the, at the intersection of media, digital culture, technology, and human rights. Her research focuses on the societal and eth ethical implications of technology designed to do good. So she assesses, for example, the impact of safety tracking technologies for women or technologies that claim to promote gender equality. Ishtiak is a PhD candidate in the Centre for the Study of Social Systems, School of Social Sciences at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. His doctoral research seeks to understand recent theoretical debates on the Anthropocene in the context of South Asia. And Tyler is a fifth year PhD candidate at the USC Annenberg School for Communication. His work explores the relationship between discourses of identity on social media and the political economy. And his presentation today stems from his dissertation project, which is an ethnographic account of gay men's sexual practices on Instagram and the relationship between sexual hierarchies and the application's algorithmic infrastructure. So Flavia, can you kick us off? Perfect. Um, do you all hear me? Is it fine? I'm not sure the microphone's on. Hello? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm too tall. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Okay. Is that right? You yeah. should be able to stand normally. Yeah, it's kind of like... Yeah, um, no, actually, it doesn't work for me. No? Maybe like this? Okay, um, today I'm going to talk about um, open source intelligence for human rights fact-finding and I'm really thrilled to be invited and I'm also really nervous because this is my first ever presentation at a conference and I feel really humbled and also quite intimidated by all those like amazing speakers who came before me. And yeah, today I'm presenting actually on my older work which I did here in Cambridge in my um, MPhil on sociology and the sociology of media and culture. And I will talk about the practice of open source investigation that uses open source intelligence for human rights fact finding to understand the relationship between human and artificial intelligence, as well as human and data bodies and how those get reconfigurated in the practice of discovering and verifying images and videos of bodies in pain from time spatial distance. So a short trigger warning, and I think the whole practice of open source investigation is a trigger warning because um, we're working with images and videos of human rights violations. And I was thinking about the past days, how I should deal with presenting those images, if I should censor them or if I should show them in their brutality, in their graphicness and also their ugliness. And I decided to, that I will censor the faces because I still think it's important to see the bodies in pain and how they are reshared and refabricated on social media platforms. But I still want to um, save the human, like the human dignity there. But I also think just like me reconfiguring, like resharing those images, kind of imposes the core ethical, ethical question of the practice of open source investigation of how we can work with those images 
and screenshot those images and try to verify them, which are shared on public um, platforms, with all the consent of the people who are filming or the people who are represented in the content, and also like thinking about how we should represent them. Um, so, this is an image which is um, from the Citizens Evidence Lab of um, from Amnesty International, which shows on the top. Um, a video film which is broken into frames so we can analyze them to understand what is happening there. And um, be below that, you can see Google Earth, which like we use to, like, to geolocate the location. And I will start with a diary entry of mine because I worked at the Digital Verification Corps here at Amnesty International, volunteering to um, do open source investigation and to verify human rights violations. It is Friday the 15th of November and I'm sitting in front of my laptop in a small room in Cambridge. A window is facing the facade of King's College. Today I'm looking for videos from Yemen. I have to find videos or pictures to prove airstrikes. I search for Yemen, death, airstrike and Twitter advanced search. I scroll through videos and stop at one 19 second video and press play. It is blurry and shaky. I see wounded bodies covered in blood. Body parts are missing and in sentence are laying openly on the sandy floor. I instinctively turn my head away. I feel detached out of my body. I put the sound on. I hear a voice narrating something in Arabic. I do not understand it, but I understand the screaming. I feel the fear. Where is this video? I look at the text in Arabic above the video and I see a broken translation underneath the video that says Al Houthi bombing. This video seems to be relevant for my work. It could be evidence. I take a screenshot and upload it to Yandex to conduct a reverse image search. Videos showing muddy grounds appear, but nothing resembles it. I download the video and put it into Invert tool to see if I can strip any metadata from it. No result. This video pricked me. I do not know who these dead human corpses are from a country I only encountered in television news. Their bodies remain faceless, and I am the one seeing and trying to verify them without them knowing. So my work is based on my dissertation on media pain of others, digital witnessing and open source investigation, where I investigated the moral and ethical dimension of open source investigation on the particular case of Amnesty International's Digital Verification Corps, where I worked myself, a university-based volunteer network at the Berkeley University, University of Cambridge, University of Essex, Hong Kong University, and University of Pretoria. Students like myself back then are trained in open source investigation. They discover and verify eyewitness media from conflict zones which are shared on social media platforms. My work whereby is situated in the field of media ethics that looks in the moral relationship to distant others and the ethical dimension of mediating and witnessing suffering through technologies. The subdiscipline of distant suffering studies, so it's called, looks into how production, representation and consumption of images and videos of human suffering shapes how we think, feel and act towards our, um, ourselves and others. Morality here refers to um, understand the fundamental question of our mediated relationship to distant others and seeing and recognizing someone with humanity and how technology complicates and shapes the relationship through digital mediation. Really short overview, I'm um, first like showing the context of Amnesty International Digital Verification Corps, the field of open source intelligence, my approach of a techno-feminist um, ethics of care to understand um, relations of power and human vulnerability in the practice, my assumption of like, the human and technical bias, an analysis of the paradox of effects, and my conclusion on data injustices and data datafied bodies. So the context is that I did 20 semi-structured interviews with Amnesty International's Digital Verification Corps participants um, at the University, University of Cambridge and Berkeley, and also experts in the field, Sam Dubberley, who is the lead of the Amnesty Citizen Evidence Lab, Alexa Koenig, the head of um, Berkeley Human Rights Lab, and Derek Murray, the lead of the DVC in Essex and an expert on AI and open source investigation. All of them are also the publishers of the book Digital Witness, Using Open Source Investigation, Information for Human Rights Investigation Documentation and Accountability. Thereby, I asked questions regarding their motivation to work with the DVC, nature of content dealt with, technological practice of discovery and verification, the experiences of witnessing, and judgments and feelings towards the people in the videos. Thereby, the major finding of my work, which also relates to border, like, the borderlands, where like, the, the technology imposes um, paradoxes on the people who are working with those images. My argument is based on interview participants' experiences of paradox encountering mediated others where technologies are the central intermediary between them. They mention that they feel and act close and distant, engaged and disengaged, empathetic and robotic, detached and attached, they are not there. And this is like now I'm presenting um, one of my 
one of the major paradoxes I, um, I shaped, which is like the paradoxes of effects, which relates to the question of this panel, how digital technologies create paradox of mediation, which is experienced through the body, aligning to the question of like, how does the technology shape boundaries between the physical body, the bodies on screen, and the data bodies of metadata that are extracted from the videos or attached to the videos. So open source, and now I turn to open source intelligence for human rights fact finding. So here I did like a quick Google search to like how open source investigation is represented online when you look for it. And you see um, a lot of like icons like Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. And it's in a, like you can see fingers typing fast. And it kind of like for me um, aligned to this like technological rationality. Again, a trigger warning. I'm going to show video. Um, I show. I'm going to show pictures of um, dead bodies and police violence. So everyone who doesn't want to see it, please walk away. So this is some kind of content um, we are working with when we are working on open source investigation. Here you can see the images and videos shared on Twitter are very graphic. Digital investigators become digital witnesses to human rights atrocities by seeing and working with such content. Digital witnessing is the witnessing in, by, and through digital technologies and digital technologies make the world witnessable and turn us into witnesses. So what is digital verification? The digital veri verification process can be separated into the discovery, video analysis, and geolocation. And open source investigation thereby uses um, publicly available information, which is most of the time shared on major social media platforms, especially Twitter. So we use... Um, we use tools like TweetDeck to discover videos with like using key terms to find them. They are stored in like databases. Vi videos are analyzed with um, Invid, for instance, where you can select um, different frames of the video to zoom in and to see if there are like any particular landmarks which will help you to then geolocate the video. And one of the most important tools is Google Earth and Google Maps to um, look where this video was filmed because the last step of any verification here, at least at the DVC, was to like see if we can find the geolocational data. So, however those um, technologies were used, uh, which are used in the practice, of course, are not neutral. So TweetDeck was the keywords that digital investigators deem to be important. Also, things can get lost in translation. And Twitter shows results that show, show the videos and images for this. If it really does, we don't really know. Google Maps also comes with biases. For instance, Street View is not available in Iran, so you can't verify or like geolocate um, videos from protests there. So what I'm like was thinking here is like how open source investigation blurs the lines between human and artificial intelligence, as it is based on a human to human decision and also like a negotiation like negotiation process mediated through mechanic intermediaries. So borders between human and technology become interwoven and connected and at the same time differences of technological possibilities and human decisions become apparent. So I used a feminist approach to understand open source investigation, to really understand how the practice is re maybe reconfigurating power relations. Thereby I especially wanted to highlight um, dimensions of effect and emotions. So I kind of created this um, approach of a tech, what I call a techno-feminist ethics of care to deal with um, relations of neutrality, vulnerability, and power of technology in open source investigation. I believe that the human rights space is shaped by legal norms and logics like looking for accountability and equality. And inspired by like the open source, the feminist open source group, which is based in London, and an article on how would a feminist open source investigation look like, I was interested to understand the power relations in the space and how a feminist approach, in my case, by thinking through care and a feminist moral philosophy and also feminist techno science, can help to show frictions, ambivalences, and paradoxes in the space. Because human rights practice is is shaped by paradoxes and asymmetric power relations. Hence, I approached those power relations by thinking through the care. And also the caring relations are asymmetric. It's like of caring and being cared for, helping and being in need for help. Care here highlights how human interrelations and moral emotions of um, solidarity and responsibility can help to rethink the practice. And I also wanted to um, shine a light on the technologies not being neutral. So I um, used the feminist techno science to understand the norms, values, and beliefs that are mediated between human and machines. 
So the, now coming like, to the human and technical bias in the practice, and I think that the human and like, human and tech, like human and artificial intelligence collide in the space because on the one hand, investigators need to decide what really is, can we work on, what is relevant, but also what is feasible, what can be verified by the means of technological help, and furthermore, is based on the level and expertise of the human rights investigator. And also the question, is this practice really open? Can everybody join in? Or do you need a specific level of skill and expertise? So those biases also meshes up with like technical bias. The platform and tools from large tech companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, or like applications like Google Vision are running on opaque machine learning algorithms. So how can we as investigators know the basis of classifications and relevance we get to see the images and video we're working on. Because digital open source investigation always begins with using key terms and searching for videos on those platforms. So the visibility is lim limited and regulated by those social media platforms and the norms they're working on. So a completely neutral search is never, is never really possible. Also, which can be quite scary, is like those tech giants like YouTube and Facebook are owning the technological infrastructure for storing those user-generated content. And also thinking about the fragility of technology. For instance, geotechs, which are thought to be really um, objective, and, um, are not really reliable because only 1% to 2% of posts are geotech, and it's not really clear if they really are teched where they are because, of course, humans can tech something else and not where they are. So. Dealing with those systems, they are always imperfect and unreliable, as well as we as humans are too. So what becomes visible and or what becomes visible or stays invisible and what gets through the human and technological border and which doesn't is kind of like a bordering process, which um, relates to like the limits and possibilities of human and machines. Now to like the paradox of effects, which more relates to um, how this practice is also like a form of effective witnessing. And then I, like, my paradox kind of engages with like, on the one side an embodiment and also a disembodiment in the practice of open source investigation. So what I was thinking about is like um, an assemblage of bodies, like how the digital technologies in those space flesh out anal like analogies and differences between the social and individual bodies through the po poetic capacity to disclose and produce others embedded within a technological environment. Effective witnessing thereby relates to the physical experience, a sensory experience that pertains the body. Even though the videos are geographically far away, they become material close by playing on a screen. Digital technologies here build up an artificial connection to humans and at the same time they um, um, build up a material disconnection. This paradox I was dealing with develops through a technological practice of verification and on the other side witnessing humans in pain. So the practice of verification by my, um, by my interviewees was described as ticking off boxes, filling in percentages, like something really numeric, technological. And on the other hand, the witnessing was described as being there, like feeling for the humans, being close and being really um, affected and immersed into the content. And um, Mac, um, Ella McPherson, Matt Mahmoudi and Isabel Gunet also talked about in the knowledge contro controversy at the at the particular case of the DVC, how human investigators act as rational and efficient as machines through following those numeric and algorithmic practices of like ticking those boxes, and machines act as humans by evaluating and deciding about information, as also shown before in the human and technical bias, which I just pre presented on. So now coming to my interview data, one side of the paradox I call like embodiment. So how the practice of working with those um, videos and images really for most of my participants felt like that they are there, that they can see um, the conflict zones through the eyes of the people who are like filming those videos on the ground and also how they felt closer to the people by clicking through injured bodies through literally, like what's called, literally doing things on my computer and Googling and going on satellite imagery, zooming in and zooming out and changing my perspective. It's a very active process. Like even if this means active as my brain and my fingers, it feels like something is being done. It makes me feel more connected. I'm an active part participant involved in it as opposed to just like watching. Another participant also said that it's like a really physical experience which pertains your body and which really, um, in Bart's sense, pricks your body and those images stick with you and they make you feel something and you remember them. 
But on the other side, simultaneously, it's also described by them as like a disembodiment by detaching the investigators from the human in the data through the enactment of techno-capitalist norms by using digital tools to extract metadata for finding evidence of violations. So here also the logic of quantification applies. The more videos are verified, the better. The more data, the better. And often like the geolocational data is the last step for verification. And geolocational data is thinking as something to be objective, neutral, however, diminishes the subjective experience of the people suffering on screens. One of the participants said, the video itself, it does not matter. That's also why we send up material to Amnesty, we send up spreadsheets with little video. It fashions itself as a core of scientifically enabled, almost like warriors, whose sole task is to just give solid technical grounding for them to be able to say to those positive um, institutions that things happened, right? Yeah, that isn't just like an activist writing letters, it's hard science. And also the other um, participant who said that she feels like, could, she feels, I feel quite similar to technology. In some ways, you're just aggregating information. Another said, I feel like a robot because it has something to do with the use of technology. It's so detached that sometimes I feel like a robot. So here you can see like how it kind of disembodies them from their fleshy body and giving them a sense of like being like the technology, which has like this norm of being objective, being detached and doesn't have those like feelings which, which they described before. So coming to an end, so how does open source investigation trouble the boundaries between the body and the technology, the flesh and the machine? How does it reconfigurate bodies? The bodies of investigators remain in safety in front of a screen while verifying bodies in pain of people who put their bodies in danger at the front lines of conflict. However, the practice is shaped deeply by a corporate experience and practice of producing knowledge with those datafied bodies. Digital investigators act on norms of open source investigation for human rights fact finding. They want to bring evidence, they want to bring accountability to the people who are suffering on screen. However, those, they're working with technological intermediaries that come, um, that come from large tech companies, which also um, come with norms of like productivity and efficiency. Hence, data justice or injustice is not a passive process that is pre-coded, but in this case, rather actively, and it gets recoded. It is productive also in the sense that Ruha Benjamin said, talked about racism, as it has the danger to like reconfigure unequal relations between us and them, savior and sufferer, data and human. Bodies are colliding, working with bodies on screen that appear with opaque algorithmic systems and human biases. Bodily borders and limitless spaces are reproduced, reconstructed, and reconfigurated through the extraction and collection of geolocational metadata from videos of human bodies and pain, manifesting human experience into data and suffering into digits and geolocation. Issues of consent and privacy and acknowledgement further play into data justice. Are we enforcing discrimination by working on images and videos without consent and store those into databases, contributing to the digital immort immortality of vulnerable stories of suffering? Is this practice better because it acts under the paradigm of doing good? Or how can we recognize the people in the videos and not merely focus, uh, focus on the data and the value and value information over knowledge? Alexa Koenig, who I've interviewed, said in my interview that open source investigation needs to acknowledge the whole ecosystem and that not only the cowboys get the praise for the work. And um, based on that, I thought it would be valuable to integrate care into the practice, to recognize the human in the data and opening up rooms for imagination of a shared humanity, social justice and empathy, and also valuing effects, effect, or like effective witnessing and being affected and emotional to those images as a legitimated way um, of producing knowledge. So I think it's important to be self-reflective about injustices that are happening, albeit one is acting under the paradigm of doing good. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I forgot one slide. Um, I, I have like 30 more seconds, so we'll show this quickly. Um, that's actually a quote which a friend of mine gave me at the beginning of my dissertation, which I still think is like really influential for how I think about the space of open source investigation. And it's like still so relevant. It's by Donna Haraway from like 1988, pre-social like pre -social media and pre-digital media. And she says, technologies are skilled practices, how to see, where to see from, what limits to vision, what to see for, whom to see with, 
who gets to have more than one, one point of view, who gets blinded, who wears blinders, who interprets the visual field. What other sensory powers do we need to, or do we wish to cultivate besides vision? Moral and political discourse should be the paradigm for rational discourse about the imagery and technologies of vision. Thank you. Now I'm really done. <laughs> Fantastic. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, now, while we're waiting for Tyler to set up, um, I wanted to yeah, thank you so much for that. I, the, 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 the norms around digital witnessing are, are fascinating, and I've been thinking recently about um, how these kinds of technologies differ and the similarities to technologies like Geophilia and Data Miner that are geolocalization software that kind of market themselves as social media tracking. Um, and it's definitely not, in, in my view, affective witnessing. And they, they claim in some ways to contextualize social media posts, but actually what they're doing is completely extracting them from their context. If you have someone uploading a, an image at a protest on Instagram, um, all the feelings and emotions that they might have um, in that image is that that image is then posted as an, an alert and sent to law enforcement. Um, so really, is that a contextualization at all? So it's so interesting to think about those paradoxes um, around affect um, and, and what feminist and anti-racist epistemologies have to say about care practices and how they can inform work in this space. Um, I'm just checking whether the next panelist is great. I think Tyler is with us. Thank you. Amazing. Hello, Tyler. I think you're potentially Hi. on mute. Amazing. Great to have you. So can you kick us off? Thanks. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. My name is Tyler Quick. I'm a fifth and final year um, PhD student at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where it is indeed currently 3.57 a.m. And I've learned a very important lesson about time zones and how they work. So um, I'm especially glad to be with you at this ungodly hour today. And um, you know, without further ado, let's just talk about the ungodly figure at the center of my um, research, which of course by that I mean Instagram influencers. Um, before I get to the meat of what I'm gonna be presenting, I just wanted to contextualize my research today though within kind of our zeitgeist. So um, some of you may be aware of this, others may not, but as the COVID-19 pandemic occupied an increasing share of the public imagination, um, a long and slow burning moral panic underlying the politics of gay men's social media representation exploded into a public debate about the role and function that media, social media influencers play in disseminating and producing LGBTQ culture. The problem was less that influencers, especially the homoerotic self-promotional and highly visible instigay class of influencer referenced in some of the headlines and tweets here, um, did something, you know, uniquely bad or especially wrong. Really, the problem was that they had continued to do what they had always been doing, publicizing their conspicuous consumption, aspirational wealth, and lusty hedonistic lifestyle against the backdrop of ever starker uh, wealth inequality, racial injustice, and a series of global events with catastrophic implications. Um, so, you know, while there were similarly lusty and luxurious figures with origins in what I call the heterosexual public sphere um, who got in trouble for partying during the pandemic, one thing that's really unique about this case study that we're looking at today, and I think indeed of academic importance, is the lengths that LGBTQ critics have gone to condemn this figure, not just um, in terms of condemning the behavior, but condemning it as a representational transgression against our community you know, the, the public existence of this figure. Um, in the US and inter, uh, international press outlets, uh, after a group of these young men convened on Puerto Vallarta over New Year's Eve of last year, a gay civil war was proclaimed and the public outcry over these influencers publicly partying was evidence of uh, so-called rift in the LGBT community. Um, so I just wanna start by acknowledging that I was drawn to this research topic before any of this happened, but I think it's interesting 
that never once during this pandemic have I encountered, for instance, cisgender heterosexuals being compelled to publicly repudiate their heteronormative lifestyle because of its representation on social media. And um, events like this indicate the important role that social media influencers play in the public imagination, especially for minoritized communities like LGBTQ people. So um, all of this is kind of set up like my, my overarching research question, which is why, why these figures? Um, LGBTQ people are particularly attuned to how they're represented in media. Um, instead of seeing this as an exceptionalizing circumstance though, I see it as a methodological opportunity to discuss the ramifications that social media self-representation has on queer culture um, and what this means in under the auspices of you know queer culture developing as kind of a reaction towards uh, media invisibilization, stereotyping and traditional mass media and so much of queer activism in the past has been oriented towards changing media representation. Um, so in fact, the example of the instigay that, that I'm looking at here, framed by social media optimists as the democratically selected representative of LGBTQ Instagrammers um, and decried by LGBTQ activists at the same time as deficient, stereotypical, and generally undesirable representation affords us an opportunity to really reconsider at a basic level what exactly we're actually talking about when we're talking about influence influencers, privilege, power, and visibility, as well as the platforms that produce these public figures. Um, influencers are, you know, instigays, I guess, rather particularly, are exactly what this quote suggests. Um, they're sexy gay men who flaunt their bodies on Instagram and rack up thousands and thousands of likes. Um, you know, they use the, the template to use social media scholars, Crystal Abedin, Tim Highfield, and Tom Oliver's term from their Kind of definitive book about Instagram, the template of you know the social media influencer, aspirationally wealthy, always traveling and partying, self-associated with luxury brands, and exemplifying in one way or another the bourgeois Eurocentric beauty standard of um, you know that's privileged by global consumer publics. Um, you know, much of the academic research on the topic would explain them as you know exemplary and envied gay men or gay male figures which obviously they are. I include an example of one of the most followed gay influencers here to give you a taste of what some of this content looks like, right? Um, but I think it's important for us to not really leave it, at like, leave it at that. The constant representational anxieties to which these figures are subjected in gay public discourse, gay men's public discourse especially, and especially in the wake of recent uh, revelations about Instagram's business practice, um, you know, I, I think that, that we need to reconsider the, the idea that these figures are purely aspirational. Um, elsewhere, I might riff here on, you know, the usefulness of engaging with and citing public discourse on the topics that we study. For now, I'll just note that many of the complaints that Frances Haugen recently publicized in, um, through her testimony to, to the US Congress about Facebook, you know, um, preying on people's body dysmorphia and people's anorexia are actually complaints that gay men have been making about Instagram for, for the better part of a decade now. Um, and, you know, I think it's important for us as academics, especially uh, those who engage with a quickly changing topic, I'll get more into that in a second, to really listen to, um, you know, cries for help like that from the public, because it, it is not only, you know, perhaps our duty to respond to these, but also they, they're, they're signaling methodological opportunities to, to really test popular hypotheses as well. Um, so I mentioned all of this to say that some of what, what others might consider to be conclusions from my data are, are if anything, you know, starting points for, for real inquiry, right? We don't need to ask, is Instagram making gay men body dysmorphic or anorexic? Because we have the testimonies of gay men themselves saying this, right? And saying that the constant and ubiquitous presence of instagays and other influencer-like figures are, are part of that problem. And we even have, you know, an acknowledgement here in the very first sentence of, um, this is a vice, this is all different clippings from, from news coverage of instagays. Um, this is a vice news piece where they are described as algorithmically calibrated thirst traps, revealing that even, you know, 
their their sex appeal and their their beauty, the kind of bedrock of what they're selling the public, the public that they're selling it to is well aware of how contrived it is, um, you know, and and how despite the the term the meaning of the term authenticity in social media studies, how from a literal point of view inauthentic so many influencers self presentation is online. So um, you know. The, the basic question that, that I approach this topic with is deceptively simple. I, I ask why instigates? Um, you know, why are these, um, these homoerotic influencers public figures? What point do they serve in neoliberal myth-making and how do they fit into the contentious representational politics of our time? Which is basically to ask, why is it that these figures are so controversial yet also the al algorithmically endowed represented and privileged representatives of LGBTQ culture on, the, on a popular platform like Instagram. So that's what we're gonna look at today is um, what are just a couple of answers I found to that question. Obviously, um, in order to explain myself, I need to explain my methodological approach. Um, I apologize that I don't have time to cover this slide in its entirety, so I'm just going to go really briefly through this to make sure that we have time to talk about everything else. Um, to begin with, we have to recognize that empirical inquiry on, into social media um, can only be realized when we give up, we being the Western Academy, our weird fetishism of objectivity, empiricism, positivism, whatever else you want to call it. Um, I think accounting for researcher subjectivity and bias is so important in all of our work, um, including quantitative scholars work. Um, and it's especially necessary on Instagram because the applications terrain is structured by algorithms that purport to know our subjective state of mind and adjust the terrain of visi visibility according to what the algorithm anticipates each of us as individualized users and models of consumer identities will want. Not to mention that the algorithmic infrastructure is itself also proprietary, right? Um, so any descriptive account of Instagram, um, which is to say, you know, here I'm talking about ethnographic work, which is what I did. I, I observed Instagram for three years, um, but it, it's always immediately personal and ephemeral, which means that we need to approach it differently from a field site, for instance, in the physical world. Um, because the obviously the physical world does not contort itself around our present consumerist whims, right? So my, my, my first solution in approaching um, this topic is um, really simple. You, you just record everything. If your subjective experience is all you can record when observing Instagram, you need to make that experience as transparent as possible. So to this end, um, when I was doing participant observation on Instagram, I tried to keep not only a set of field notes, but visual field notes as well, constantly screenshotting what, um, what I was seeing on the screen, including processes, you know, step-by-step -step screenshots of processes, um, taking um, time to, to collect any media coverage that I encounter of my phenomenon. There's lots of different things you can include to make your field journal interactive and more evocative of like a, a deeply immersive online experience. Of course, the second thing I recommend is that because you can only collect your experience through direct um, firsthand observation on a platform like Instagram, it's important to collect the perspective of others. Um, to this end, the work that I'm presenting today is not just um, the results of three years of uh, you know, field work, ethnographic study, whatever you want to call it. It's also the culmination of 10 interviews with Instagram influencers, 20 with industry practitioners, and focus groups with uh, regular gay Instagram users. Um, so that my perspective is not only my own when I'm presenting data, right? Um, third, and I think um, very importantly, the canonical rendering of method and theory as separate affairs is really harmful to social media research. Um, in the quote provided by the anarchist philosopher Paul Feyerabend, we see the fallacy of resting solely on systematized procedures to make our work empirical. To just sum up his point, what's equally important is finding a set of terms that adequately and accurately describe our research site and research topic, right? And I'm gonna get into that just momentarily here because that's, I think, the most important part of this methodological approach. Um, and finally, if we had more time, I think we'd discuss the various institutional hurdles um, that, that, this kind, that this kind of inquiry into social media faces. Um, for instance, here in the United States, the Institutional Review Board um, and the kind of blanket privacy policies 
that it demands uh, with participant research um, and qualitative research on social media is a little absurd, asking us to treat public figures and anonymous teenage commenters exactly the same under the ages of research participants. So um, obviously we don't have time to get into that today. I'll keep, I'll keep going for now. Um, to return to that third point about method though, and to make a kind of slightly new point about theory, the good news about research on Instagram is that there's a ready-made scheme of interpretation, um, which is to say a cultural vernacular that capably and accurately describes all sociality on Instagram, and one that is felicitously employed by all users that's provided by the app's representation and ranking of content through hierarchizing metrics like likes, follows, comments, and so on. Um, you know, the overwhelming conclusion of excellent social media research is that accumulating engagement via quantified metrics is not only a requirement for visibility on social media platforms, but the ordinary users are very well aware of this. And most people that are posting social media are behaving accordingly. They are intentionally seeking out um, to make it more blunt, quantified engagement. And um, their content is contrived. You know, Crystal Abedin has this, this term contrived authenticity, which I think is really hilarious such that it you know, solicits this specific kind of attention. And that's important to hold on to because that will ev eventually result in a homogenizing effect on all content produced, right? Um, this claim also has implications on um, claims by some to quote unquote queer Instagram or otherwise subvert it. We can elide those for now though, because even a felicitous performance of queerness is um, going to be invisible on Instagram if it isn't intelligible, if it doesn't conform to generic standards, and if it doesn't perform competitively in Instagram's attention economy. So um, I reject the scholars I quoted earlier in their book on Instagram. Um, I reject their claim that templates are not hegemonic because Instagram adheres to a hegemonic logic that's encoded into its algorithmic infrastructure that is the prime determining factor of what content will and will not be made visible that incentivizes adherence to templates in the first place, initially through algorithmically privileging content that has already demonstrated the ability to perform well in the app's attention economy, and then subsequently through the kinds of behaviors and habits that this, that this um, logic and that this value system that's baked into Instagram's platform um, you know, cultivates. So obviously, like many of you, this frightens me and it gestures towards something we should all be very united around, which is better regulating social media technology. But it also is something that's important to remember from um, the point of view of empirical research, because this set of terms that adequately and descriptively describes your research site, um, you know, is already provided pretty, pretty, um, pretty much unambiguously by Instagram because of the very, you know, simple, um, binary market logic to which it adheres, to which its algorithmic infrastructure is programmed, um, you know, according to, and, um, you know, it, it, as a result of all of this, Instagram itself provides us a set of precise and descriptive terms with, with which we can apprehend its technoculture. So um, let's look into more of what I mean by this, by, by just looking at some of my work on Instagram, because time's short, um, and I have two slides and probably less than five minutes to show off the results of three years of observation and interviews. Um, I'm just going to kind of breeze through this slide really quickly. I just want to note that I've been aided by outside forces yet again in giving this presentation because Instagram just a few months ago published a developer di uh, diary explaining some of the apps and algorithmic infrastructure. So in what follows, I kind of illustrate what some of the claims that Instagram has made about this algorithmic infrastructure um, uh, what, what the real life implications of these claims are and how the logic that it functions according to um, within the context of my case studies, homoerotic influencers ends up compounding inequality and creating kind of a false understanding of what it means to be popular on social media. Um, so just to give you a, a cursory summary of, of how Instagram's algorithmic infrastructure uh, selects content for display and ranks and hierarchizes that content. We have here on the left um, that essentially um, they, they start by defining the set of things that we plan to rake in the first place. With feed and with stories, this is relatively simple. It is, rel it is all the recent posts shared by the people you follow. 
we know that's not entirely true. Advertisements also work their way into that. But um, you know, you know um, next they take the information that they have about what was posted, the people who made those posts and your preferences. This is important to remember. What they call signals um, are really a set of um, relationships that also can be ranked and also described in, in quantified terms. Um, and while they each indicate kind of separate qualities, right? Strength of ties, for instance, or um, you know, the relative cultural capital of a certain figure within a certain sub subculture or community, um, you know, these these signals still are expressed through a singer, singular vernacular and medium, which is a series of numbers with which they can be ranked, and that's important because for the Marxists in the room, I am um, you know making the simple point that perhaps we should start understanding that as um, operating according to a system of exchange value, right? Um, so. Let, let's take a look at what is by Instagram's own admission, the most important factor in determining content's visibility and display, it's raw engagement. Um, so there are, as we see here from that developer di diary signals, both about how popular a post is, think how many people have liked it, and you know um, how many seconds you know, they can measure, how long a user is lingering over a certain image, um, how, it performs relative to similar content length of a certain length or type or posted from a similar location. But ultimately, you know, this uh, paragraph is making a pretty simple point a little more convoluted than it needs to be, which is that everything else considered equal, Instagram wants to display content that has continued to demonstrate its desirability or rather high demand if we continue the market metaphor. Um, this is to be expected from an application that makes more money the more time users spend on it obviously, um, and also obviously complicates any other goals that Instagram may claim to have, um, whether or not sincerely with uh, regards to its display of content. Um, thinking, you know, for instance, of my example, the privilege, the popularity principle that Instagram operates according to is foremost bound to privilege sexual racism, right? And if we express sexual desire in terms of raw numbers, the uh, number of people who point blank, you know, reject um, people of color in terms of their beauty standard are going to contribute to a quantification of whiteness that, that is, um, you know, a larger number and therefore more desirable. I'm also very cognizant of, uh, I'm probably going over on time. So I'm going to breeze through this um, just to, to wrap us up. Uh, and if I am at all need to speed it up, I, feel free to DM me organizers. Um, so as a classificatory system, the algorithm is indeed liable for, you know, one of the most profound acts of gay stereotyping in contemporary media history. Even if it's assisted at times by the biases of users, this popularity principle itself rewards bias, right? Um, and we can see um, this, this through the example of gay men um, in, in, in every single level of um, Instagram's search and display culture. So I would wager if you take a second right now to type hashtag gay into your search bar on Instagram or later, obviously we're moving pretty fast. Um, the top post would be entirely self-representational uh, with most of it being cisgender, probably at the, in the top posts, white or at least Western gay men. Um, feel free to experiment this while you were talking. Generally, that's what happens when you search hashtag gay or even hashtag LGBT on Instagram. And it's the hint of a series of misrepresentations about LGBTQ life that occur because of the logic of, in of visibility undergirding Instagram. First, the majority of content being hashtag gay on Instagram, um, or at least a large plurality of it, is self-representational. So we have to acknowledge that one, the, the sheer over-representation of images of gay men um, being conflated with things that are coded as LGBTQ interests or LGBT interests by the algorithmic infrastructure is itself the beginning of a massive misrepresentation of LGBTQ life, right? Um, not, but not, not only is this um, true because of the raw numbers being posted, but there's also a bias that has been demonstrated even in empirical literature um, by social media users toward images of other human beings, especially images in which someone's face is shown, and especially obviously someone who you find attractive's face. Um, obviously, this bias 
is spread unevenly to the least controversial figures within the community, which leaves us with a homogenizing effect on all content um, in terms of what is and isn't considered popular, right? And how this, as this is algorithmically computed and averages are increasingly um, determined with greater and greater specificity, um, competition and the drive to be popular results in a homogenization of content, such as for instance, on the left, we see what my explore page looked like um, recently after diving back into this research for participant observation, purely images of shirtless gay men, but also in the right, in terms of the lack of diversity in the content that influencers themselves are producing and their adherence to rigid template types. Clearly those invested in Instagram's visibility game are trying to game it, but to what end? The top representations of queer life always end up being the most competitive self images of a handful of cisgender muscular men who are extremely invested in pursuing visibility. And it becomes very difficult after that for other kinds of LGBTQ content to compete. So what say for instance, a young person searching hashtag LGBT might end up finding, hoping to find more information about their community, um, is a purportedly accurate, but we know extremely inaccurate representation of a single gay man's life, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I, for the sake of time, I'm gonna breeze through this really quickly um, to get to this slide. And, and so, so to return us to what I previewed before about this, this exchange versus use value problem, um, the algorithm can also only measure a, an, um, a piece of content's popularity through metrics like likes, um, number of seconds uh, spent looking at something, et cetera. And because of this, it can't fathom the, the various valences of a like, right? What does a like mean? Is it expressing you know, uh, uninhibited demand? Is it expressing limp tacit approval? What exactly does it mean? Um, is the like a, an attempt to flirt or an attempt to merely mark approval for, for content? This might seem trivial, but it, it certainly isn't at all when we, um, when we think about the weight that Instagram purports to give to social relationships and determining what content is or isn't made visible. Because the social and indeed the sexual relationships of many of these Instagram influencers are um, you know, exclusive. They are tied to racially and economically exclusive communities in uh, major metropolitan areas like Los Angeles or London um, and th that are structured by sexual racism, they're structured by classism and um, you know, very narrow performative parameters of, of masculinity. Um, and the, the equivocation of like with exchange value is not only detrimental to social media audiences, but it's detrimental to many of these figures because it ends up being what gets them caught in the representational politics of our moment, right? Um, so for what, what I mean that, for instance, is that if gay men are using Instagram as merely a means to meet and hook up with other singles in their area, and the gay men that are doing this are not particularly invested in you know, the representational politics of being an LGBTQ influencer, they're just you know, frankly trying to get laid. Um, the algorithm can't really determine whether their new interests in say another you know, similar white gay influencers content is purely of a personal nature and therefore not something that means that this content that's now being interacted with should be displayed to you know, thou potentially thousands of new followers. Um, essentially what I'm getting at here is that the dating market can be conflated for the representation market on gay Instagram. And that's how you end up with the figures that are the most prized and esteemed in the dating market for obviously fucked up reasons, end up being the most prized and esteemed figures in the market for representation on Instagram, because it can only measure aggregate demand through the vernacular of exchange value through, you know, binary code, either liked or not liked photos, um, which inevitably ends up privileging the most bland, inoffensive, but, hom but still nonetheless homoerotic content. Um, I, um, you know, don't have too much time, I guess, to get into this. What, what I essentially was going to show here is how, because of this popularity principle too, in the, in, in the ways that, that social relationships between accounts operating at scale 
uh, are prioritized over other relationships or even just algorithmic affinities between accounts operating at scale. Um, when you follow many of the, the largest instigate accounts, what you'll notice is that the recommended accounts for you to follow sometimes are similarly you know, well-followed instigates, but the larger the account gets, the more it operates at scale. You start seeing homoerotic but heterosexual influencers pop up because they're the only other accounts operating at a similar scale. Um, but you know, to the detriment of other LGBT homoerotic influencers who are made invisible. The, we see a similar phenomenon at play in the way that um, people of color are um, you know, conceptualized and categorized as homoerotic figures on Instagram. What we see, for instance, in um, you know, looking, looking at the way the algorithm considers homoerotic black influencers, on the one hand, some black influencers are um, you know, basically relegated to purely um, black aesthetics, right? If you follow a, a cer certain black gay man on Instagram, the accounts that will be recommended to you will be mostly black heterosexual men that, that look like him and produce similar content to him. Other black gay men, on the other hand, um, will be kind of algorithmically associated with other gay accounts, but generally only white accounts. It's very rare that you will see a queer account of color promoted on another queer account of color's page, uh, especially the larger their following is and the more they're operating at what I'm calling scale. Um, so yeah, here are some preliminary conclusions of this work. Um, what should we make of these findings? It's an algorithmic infrastructure of Instagram can only conceptualize the content's exchange value, never its use value. Um, it's a proximity to power is conflated by this technology with popularity. Um, things like sexual racism create an algorithmic echo chamber, and this actually ends up contributing to yawning wealth gaps within the LGBTQ community. And then the politics of LGBTQ representation on Instagram are as limited by its generic conventions of platform design as any other medium. Um, so the main framework here is I want to re readdress the participatory kind of rhetoric with which uh, social media influencers have been discussed, especially uh, for marginalized people. And I'll just let this linger here for a little while longer, but I'm kind of eager to get to comments and move on with this. And I thank you so much for letting me go over my time. Um, it was a pleasure to present all of this to you this morning. Thank you. Tyler, that was fascinating. Thanks so much. And it's always amazing to see this kind of research that tells us things that I guess we sort of imagine, but, um, but might not know for sure, like how algorithms are privileging heterosexual homoerotic accounts over gay accounts and depromoting queer accounts of color on the accounts of, of other queer people of color. Um, and I was also really struck by um, how during COVID there was, as you say, this policing of particular communities more than others. And that happened along the lines of class as well as sexuality. So the global jet set who had pretty good lockdowns were not subject to the same kind of critique, potentially because the expectations of them act acting ethically um, are very low. I, I also was really struck by how um, algorithms are cultivating Anglo-European beauty standards, um, but you know, we know that, but also desires and, and insecurities. And um, in a recent conversation that my colleague Kerry and I had with Jack Halberstam recently about self-representation on Instagram, um, because there is still that prevalent perception among young people that they can uh, represent themselves or express themselves um, with some kind of agency on these platforms, uh, and uh, Halverstam says, get off. He says uh, in his great manifesto, that is absolutely not possible. These, these are now platforms that sell data. So to think, um, to think that you can have a capacity for expression um, when it's mediated by, as you put very nicely, this hierarchized reception of likes and comments through which popularity is quantified um, is, of course, then sadly nonsense. Um, I, my, my, my cousin who lives in, in Cambridge has a, uh, a plug-in for Facebook called Unfollow Everything, and he was recently issued with a cease and desist letter by Facebook, so a couple of days ago, um, who were threatening to sue him. And what Unfollow Everything does is try and moderate people's uses of social media. So um, it 
became, and as we know very well, incredibly evident that Facebook, like Instagram, are, are not um, out there to help people use their accounts with any degree of moderation, a bit like betting companies. Um, so that was very sadly uh, made very visible to us this week. And I think what you said links very nicely to what some of the speakers were saying yesterday when they used uh, Stuart Hall's work on the codification of culture um, to explore the signs and symbols and signals of self-expression that operate via popularity principles that, um, as, you, as you said, are coded through a series of numbers um, and uh, which are then traded on the marketplace. And it fit also very nicely with um, what Flavia was saying about bias being um, uh, as an assemblage. Uh, you said that it's unevenly distributed, um, and Flavia was talking about how it's passive. It's not not passive and, it, and encoded, but it's performative. Um, bias is actively recoded within an assemblage of datafied bodies. Uh, so all incredibly interesting. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Ishtiak, is experiencing technical issues, so sadly he can't join us today. And we hope he'll be able to share his incredibly interesting work with us in the future. If you have questions um, about their work, please do reach out to us via email. Now we have time for some questions. If you're watching online, please do pop any questions you have in the live chat. These get sent to me, and I can read them out. We, to kick us off, we have a first question um, from online viewers, which is, how does, um, for Flavia, how does your work link with social media exploitation and the use of cheap labor to censor these kinds of images? Um, and what do you think the impact uh, of this is? Um, and I, it's a question that it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, there's a, a really great um, lady who we also interviewed for our podcast called Nita Williams, who works on child safety operations at Google. And she said that caring for these workers required uh, the protection and fair promotion of them in a way that aligns with workers in any other shiny Google office. Uh, what's your take on that? Um, does it work? Just to clarify, um, cheap labor and like um, this content moderation, mm. like you mean like um, where people are working on violent images and they like, put them off social media platforms, correct? I think so, yes. Um, yeah, actually, I think this kind of like, this like, I mean, the danger there is vicarious trauma, right? So the people who are working with those images and um, videos are affected by those images and develop like, some sort of like secondary um, trauma, which like has forms of PTSD. And I think um, the problem is very relevant and especially like, I think also how it's affecting open source investigation is that there's like more talking about how we need to safeguard the people working with the content, like how we can take care of the community and like looking that like um, you can't, for instance, like at the DVC, there are mechanisms of like, don't watch a video with sound first, minimize the video, don't make it big, don't only watch like five videos for one hour or something to really kind of safeguard yourself with like watching those videos. And I think it's definitely super problematic that people, I think there was this documentary on like people working on the Philippines um, as content moderators for Facebook, right? And I mean, those videos have an effect on you. And I, I actually, now I'm a personal thing, I stopped my research on this topic and I didn't want to do it for my PhD anymore because it affected me mm -hmm. that I watched so many of those videos and I was dreaming about human rights violations. So I think that's a huge issue and kind of, again, relates back to asymmetric power relations, right? Like, and also like kind of like colonial legacies, like how can, like how can we outsource this kind of labor going like into like the Philippines or like somewhere in Asia or India and those people working on those images, which are too horrific or gore for people in the Western world who are like kind of um, make like having this, they, they are kind of um, producing the technological infrastructure, which makes it possible that people can see that. So I think, yeah, it's a super interesting question. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for that response. Do we have any questions? Yes, one over here. Yeah, I have a question also for Flavia. So thank you so much for your um, talk. It was fascinating to hear about your research. So uh, my question is more like technical and 
it's about if you could reflect more about the concept of open source in your in your investigation, like why you have decided to use this concept. And then also, if you're familiar with the forensic architecture group based at Cosmic, because they um, also do like something similar as that you are investigating right now. Why I decided to like focus on open source investigation is because purely it was framed like that, right? So the DBC is operating, they call it like open source investigation because you're using open digital tools and open source investigate, like open information of like user generated content, which is shared on public um, platforms. So that's the reason. And I, yeah, I know forensic architecture actually, and I think they do super interesting work. And I think the article I have shown of like, how would a feminist open source investigation look like both of them work at forensic architecture. And I think there's a huge discourse now happening. And I think even this term, there's a course starting a methods course here in Cambridge on methods of open source investigation. And they also like all integrating like the moral and ethical dimensions and trying to think about like alternative, um, alternative ways to think about this practice, like with like integrating um, critical race theory, feminist theory, to not kind of reproduce this, what I think, like technological rationality and like really go away from that and question it and really engage with asymmetric power relations in the field. Great, and we have another question here. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks to you both for, for really fascinating presentations. And uh, my question is to Tyler. And uh, Tyler, I really liked how you presented um, Instagram's hierarchies as producing images that are, are bland and inoffensive and yet harmful. You know, inoffensive doesn't mean harmless, right? you know, either harmful because they center whiteness and, and because of the effect on uh, the mental health of the LGBT community and, and so on. Um, I, I thought you conveyed that really well, and I'm wondering if there's an associated kind of call to action that you have. I mean, is this intrinsic to all of the social media platforms that are part of the attention economy and rely upon these hierarchies? Are there systems that, that do it better or that you could imagine could do it better? I, I think one of the fundamental problems is that the reliance on code to determine um, things like affinity, desire, um, even, even you know, the deceptively simple like presents a, an, an, an enormous hurdle for social media platforms to get over because inherently this kind of representation of desire is very flat and relies on, on the logic of exchange value as opposed to use value, right? Um, so like it's, a, it's an old Marxist chestnut that we're kind of cracking open and looking at here. But I think it's really important to think about because I haven't really heard of any technological fix for this yet. Um, I don't know how you possibly could determine um, like the polyvalence, right? Of a homoerotic body, like what, what it like means within such, under such auspices um, using, using technology that, that really is meant to measure flatly yes or no, whether you're going to be interested in this product, right? Um, so like, like you're very, I think, wise to note that the inoffensive aspect is what's most important here. And I think that's why the best performing accounts tend to also have like relatively low engagement as well, because um, what you'll notice is that a lot of times smaller influencer accounts, and this isn't just true for homoerotic influencers, it's, it's true for pretty much any influencer community on Instagram, um, that, that, that the smaller accounts tend to be perceived as more authentic by their followers and they tend to perform a lot better. I think that's because they're really actually providing a form of gratification that just can't be quantified, right? Um, other scholars, uh, I wish I remembered off the top of my head who, who I'm thinking about exactly here so I could give them due credit, but they've called this um, the tribal labor of forming emotional or affective, to use a term that was uh, used earlier, bonds. Um, and I don't think this can be measured, let alone properly compensated by social media platforms. Although, you know, more to your point, I've heard recently um, about platforms where um, all users content is monetized through blockchain. And I think that's an interesting start in resolving some of the labor inequities that um, plague Instagram influencers. As far as the consumers themselves go, I, I haven't seen any good technological fixes yet though. 
Interesting, thank you. And that kind of riffs off nicely off um, what Wendy Chan was saying yesterday about homophily. So this idea that people who are alike uh, like each other. So how we can complicate what it means, um, what, what, what alike means and create new affinities, um, which seems impossible, you know, um, uh, in the context of these incredibly powerful organizations that don't really care about this as a goal. Um, we have another kind of comment question from Kerry, um, and again for Flavia. Uh, she says, I was thinking about the complexities of this work in relation to the historical racialization of, the, of imagery of bodily suffering and its appropriation to various human rights causes um, and the concurrent need to track and map these horrific acts of violence. And she said, could this be linked to um, Sadia Hartman's extraordinary work in grappling with the violent legacies of enslavement and the slipperiness of racialized empathy. Um, do you think that that has anything to add here? I mean, yes, definitely. And I think this was like kind of the point I was trying to make with like um, recognition of the human and also understanding, you know, that those videos are not o not, not not only can should be used for like evidence or bringing accountability to like bigger protests or movement, but like those images and videos that are really like subjective stories of people who are in pain in a specific historical context, you know? And that is, I think social media often gives you the kind of impression that it's like, it doesn't give you this whole um, context, right? It's like often those videos which are used in open source investigation are like five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, but it gives you this kind of feeling that is really authentic because it's filmed from an, which is like kind of the new thing, like with like eyewitness media, right? So you have the potential to film something from a point of view and it's shaky and it's blurry and it's a like kind of this, yeah, authenticity, which people are thinking like, oh, that is something which is happening that is real. But of course there's, um, I think, the danger of the fetishization of those images and also like the beautification of, um, suffering bodies without um, like, th that they have a voice, you know, so that they have a name, that the people are like, that is not only a suffering body, which then can be used to like go to like the court and say like, oh, you know, a human rights violation happened here, but there's like more to the story. And I think for that, we need to integrate those historical contexts, like legacies of colonialism, of slavery, you know, to like bring this, and also especially in the human rights practice on open source investigation, to really think about this and bring all those perspectives in to, yeah, to like de-westernize the practice, I think. Thank you. Yeah, it's incredibly interesting. Um, and and what, one final question, I think, for, for Tyler. Um, I, I really like this question. Um, this comes from a, another online viewer um, on what are the offline repercussions of algorithmicization of, of online LGBT cultures? Um, or could this create a fission between online and offline culture? Um, and I, I like this a lot because it reminds me of a kind of, I think that there is still this idea that Instagram can be a heterotopia, can create online cultures that then translate into real world effects. Um, what's your feeling on, on the relationship between kind of these, these online and offline cultures and an offline repercussion? Um. That, that is a, an excellent question um, and one that is extremely, extremely relevant to just everyday life as a gay man living in Los Angeles. Um, you know, it's no, it's no coincidence that this sort of kind of increase in digital participatory queer cultures comes about at a time where here in the United States, um, there are double digit lesbian bars out of 70,000 70, bars in the United States and just under 700 gay bars left in the USA, um, which is uh, a decrease from a high point about double that just, just a couple decades ago. Um, and, you know, it comes about at a time when um, private equity companies are gobbling up entire neighborhoods wholesale, when LGBTQ businesses are going out of business, and when within the LGBTQ community in the United States, wealth inequality is becoming extremely exacerbated, right? Um, and, you know, I don't envy anyone having to subject themselves to gig economy, um, you know, conditions, standards, um, lifestyles, 
I also think as graduate students, maybe I are, we already do. So, you know, who knows, who knows, maybe that's condescending of me to say, perhaps I already am a gig economy worker. That being said, what's troubling about homoerotic Instagram influencers is that it's um, pretty lucrative work, pretty low labor work, if we're going to be honest about what it is that they're doing. And it's uh, available only to a very small select number of people. And on top of all of that, the transfer of funds, whether it's through only fan subscriptions, buying merch is almost um, always from the bottom to the top and almost always replicates um, colonial divisions within the LGBTQ community as well, where Western men reap the benefits of representational privilege um, and men from outside of the industrialized West are treated only as passive consumers if they're addressed at all. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, on that note, that brings us to the end of another remarkable panel. Um, we will meet here again in an hour um, at 1.45. So a massive round of applause to all the panelists. Shazam.
Okay. Just give me this. Gentlemen, uh, both the, the handful of, of loyal participants here in the room and also the many more who are joining us online. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch break if you're in this time zone or, or supper or breakfast or, or a nap, uh, depending on what other time zones you're in. We are now going to have our second panel on bodily borderlands, this one with a focus on the medical. Uh, both the chair and all the participants are online, so please let me hand over to Professor Jennifer Gabris, who will be chairing this one. Uh, Jennifer is Chair in Media, Culture and Environment here in the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, and I'm delighted to chair this panel on uh, bodily borderlands uh, medical perspectives. We have today Tara Mafood, lecturer in sociology at the University of Essex, uh, Tyne Sumner, ARC postdoc research fellow in culture and communication at the University of Melbourne, and S. Scott Graham, uh, associate professor in rhetoric and writing at the University of Texas, Austin. I'm looking very for much forward to this uh, conversation across three continents and time zones. Some people are really late in the day and some people very early. So um, hopefully we can stretch the boundaries of alertness in this conversation of AI. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Tara Mafood. Hello everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> So I can't see you in the audience over there, but hello. It's wonderful to be a part of this conference and part of this panel. Um, so this talk, uh, which I've titled The Biological Imitation Game or the Sublime Similarity of Brain Simulation uh, is part of a broader multi-sided ethnographic study that I've been doing on modeling and simulation in the European Commission funded Human Brain Project. Um, and this has been mostly conducted between February 2014 and January 2017 in Austria, France, Germany, Spain, the United Kingdom, and the Human Brain Project headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar, um, the Human Brain Project was launched in 2013 with the aim to create the world's largest experimental facility for developing the most detailed model of the brain, uh, for studying how the human brain works, and ultimately to develop personalized treatment of neurological and related diseases. And the project um, brings together neuroscience, computing, and medicine through the building of these brain models that contribute to developing brain-inspired computers, uh, and by mining federated data from clinics across Europe to identify brain-based markers of neurological diseases and disorders. So this entanglement of cognitive um, science and computing with medicine and health is part of what anthropologist um, Abu Fadman has called the project of convergence, which he argues is recasting what it means to be a thinking, living and healthy human being. Um, now, the entanglement of neuroscience and computing, of course, is not new. Um, so we've got Alan Turing, of course, who was a careful reader of brain science and who was very literally trying to build a brain when he was building his computers. Um, so, you know, Turing's research was really instrumental in the development of, of neuroscience theories like plasticity and so on. So this exchange between the computational and the neuroscience still continues today. And we see that in you know, Google DeepMind's research and so on. So while Abu Fadman suggests that this kind of converged future is not just speculative and that it's on its way, my research suggests that neuroscientists who are involved in the building of these computational models of brains that are meant to kind of assure our post-human health are consistently faced with the limits of their approach. So in this talk, I'm going to argue that by paying attention to the aesthetics of brain simulation in the laboratory, to how 
neuroscientists visually assess the validity of their brain models, uh, we get a sense of how the boundaries between human, animal, and machine are kind of disrupted in the very process of being made equivalent. So in the experience of the sublime, when neuroscientists successfully simulate excitable brain matter, they're confronted with the possibilities, but also the impossibilities of their computational methods. So through these simulation aesthetics, um, sorry, one second. <laughs> Neuroscientists are trying to come to terms with the um, differences and the similarities between their brains, the rodent brains that they're studying, and the machine brains that they're building. They're also trying to come to terms with the implications of their work. You know, so what does it mean to say that they're building a simulation of a brain? Um, and in this interplay, kind of the human brain is imagined and reinscribed as a computational machine but one that's different to the machines that they're building in their lab. Now, the stories I'm going to be sharing today are from the time that I spent in the Geneva-based laboratory of a neuroscientist called uh, Henry Markram, who is a South African-Israeli neuroscientist and who founded the Human Brain Project and is in silico team of biologists, mathematicians, physicists, and computer scientists. So oh, beautiful. Beautiful, oh my goodness, said Henry Markram with a satisfied smile as Isaac described the details of the experiment that he was reproducing. As with other kinds of modeling approaches in biology to demonstrate the validity of their in silico brain models, they needed to be able to reproduce the results of in vivo experiments. So in this particular instance, Isaac was working to reproduce an experiment performed by a different lab which recorded how spontaneous activity, meaning activity in the absence of any sensory stimulation, spreads through neuronal assemblies in anesthetized and in awake rats. So to do this, he attempted to recreate the conditions under which um, these other neuroscientists obtained their data, their procedure for recording the data and their subsequent analyses using their own digital microcircuit model. And Isaac found the same repeating triplet structure in his in silico experiment that the other labs team found in their in vivo experiment. And it was this statement that elicited the beautiful comment by Henry. So Isaac had the figure which represented the output of the in silico microcircuit printed out in color and touched it kind of every time he talked about it. A senior member of the team took a look at it and asked, why did you draw the box here? Is this the way that they did it? Isaac replied, that's the exact way they did it, pressing down on the figure as he said exact. Now I later asked Isaac how he decided to present the output of the in silico microcircuit in that particular way. He said, luckily in my case, that was predetermined. The scientists had already decided on the way they felt it was appropriate to represent the information visually, so I just copied them. It just felt like the natural thing to do. It was just obvious to me. Like, yeah, if I want to show that we're reproducing these experiments, I'm going to have their graphs right next to my graphs, and I want them to look as similar as possible to sort of give the impression that we've found results that are very similar, and that just seemed natural. So Isaac's response about how he chose to represent the findings highlights the very visual nature of both assessing and demonstrating similarity. So referring to their to figures or to their work as being beautiful, of course, wasn't an, an unusual occurrence. And as many anthropologists and SDS scholars have shown, images and visualizations are such a fundamental part of scientific practices. You know, the aesthetic uh, qualities of scientific images are an essential feature of everyday scientific work and of the communication of scientific findings. So when Markham called Isaac's work beautiful, it was partly to demonstrate an appreciation for the good work that he'd done. Um, but beauty was also about the appearance and the form, about constructing a kind of visually pleasing image that could also describe the information they wanted to get across to others. The choice of the representation 
also plays an important role in legitimizing research. So by copying the aesthetic form of the data's representation, it was an acknowledgement of conventional forms of representation in the neuroscience. And this served to make their results, you know, in computing the computational neuroscience legible to neuroscientists reading the paper who were unfamiliar with their computational methods. But when they placed these images side by side, as they often did, the beauty, the exclamatory awe when Markham said, oh my goodness, was in the similarity and how well their reproduced in silico experiment resembled the original in vivo um, experiment. So the beauty was in the similarity uh, in the simulation in their in silico microcircuit and how well it reproduced the activity of living matter. So, calling something beautiful in Kant's critique of judgment uh, is a judgment of taste and it is such an aesthetic judgment. But Kant um, distinguished between the beautiful and the sublime. While the beautiful evokes um, a feeling of pleasure, the sublime also evokes uh, a feeling uh, displeasure in a combination of kind of awe and fear. And there are two forms of the sublime in the Kantian formulation. The dynamic sublime, which is the simultaneous awe and fear we experience when we see storms, thunder, lightning, and the mathematical sublime, such as when we're confronted with something that kind of overwhelms our imagination's capacity to comprehend it, like the wonder and humility that neuroscientists exhibit when they speak of the overwhelming complexity of the human brain. The sublime experience in both forms demonstrates the limits kind of of human cognition. And the computational neuroscientists that I spent time with were in awe of the brains that they were trying to build of neurons that change shape and dendrites that split and curl and wrap through layers of excitable electric brain matter. They're also in awe of their ability to reconstruct this very complexity in their computational models, in their imitation of the action potentials that animate the brain. Um, but alongside the experience of awe, they were also anxious about the limits of their models and what they couldn't capture, of their failures in representation. They were also fearful of the implications of their work. You know, the dangers of artificial intelligence were a consistent topic of conversation over lunch in the cafeteria. And this suggests that both the dynamic and the mathematical sublime are at work. There's a kind of awe and fear at the thought that they're successfully simulating brain behavior alongside their recognition of the limitations of their models. So when I spoke with Isaac, he expressed this epistemic anxiety. Um, granted, many of the experiments we attempted to reproduce were con conducted in a barrel cortex, whereas our model is based on data taken from somatosensory cortex. Also, they state, if I recall, that the recordings were performed during periods of quiet wakefulness, during which they observed up and down states. We don't see spontaneously occurring up and down states in the activity of our network. So we induce them artificially by depolarizing the neurons with an injection of current. It's arguable to what degree that actually reproduces all the features of a true, of a true upstate. So the many biologists that Markham and his team worked with argued that when abstracting the brain anatomy and activity into these reproducible features, they detached the reproduced experiments from the very unique spatial temporal conditions that these kind of original experiments were conducted in. They argued that experiments with animals of different ages, of different species and in different regions were fundamentally incommensurable. They could not be made equivalent in the way that Isaac and others were doing when building their aggregate average models. So they faced this paradox while the act of reproducing other scientists' experiments with both the kind of precondition for constructing and validating their computational models, it was also what undermined their model's usefulness to make their simulated experiment similar to the original experiment. They needed to remove the data from the very specific context that it was produced in 
And it was this removal that was subject to debates about its scientific legitimacy and its utility from modeling things like brain diseases, for example. The while brain modelers are trying to achieve what historians of science, Lorraine Dustin and Peter Gallison, called truth to nature through their mechanical instruments and very trained judgment. Um, anthropologist Michael Tossig reminds us that mimesis is never a linear relationship between an original and a copy. You know, reproduction always produces difference. So on the one hand, this act of reproduction brings to light the variability and the irreproducibility of many neuroscience findings. But on the other hand, in mimicking the brain, simulations highlight the difference between humans, animals, and machines which I'll now discuss. So Nancy, who is the in-house mathematician and validation specialist, organized a meeting in early 2015 titled The Difference Between Perceived and Measured Similarity Between Distributions. The impetus for the meeting came after Lida, one of the PhD students, expressed her concern about how they should be assessing the difference between the neuronal cells that they were building algorithmically and the digitized cells that they received from the electrophysiology labs that they were collaborating with. Lida said the decision they had to make was whether they wanted the reconstructed cells to look like a real neuron, or whether it was a more important to have a high number of features that matched, even if they didn't look similar. Now, one of the problems that they highlighted was that Henry, who was the head of the lab and who is a biologist, evaluated some of the reconstructed cells and would say that they didn't look nice and that more features should be added to make them more biologically realistic. But adding features, Nancy said, made running statistical analyses for similarity more complicated. Biologists, she said, want to include everything in the model, but that compromised the model's performance. So I asked them whether Henry was just a very visual person and this is why they do their validation that way. And she said, yes, but vision is important for science. Perception is important, but it's frustrating that the person's needed to decide on whether something matches. Ideally, the whole process would be automated. Amaya, another ma mathematician in the team said, Human vision evolved to reach this point. Computers are not able to see the way that people do. Now, Isaac had made a similar argument when I asked him about how he distinguished between qualitative and quantitative validation and said, if your brain says that they look similar, your brain probably is using some other alternate statistical measure of what constitutes similarity, because if they weren't similar in some way, then they wouldn't look similar either. If your brain says they look similar, they're similar at least in one way, even if it's just a superficial way. So human vision here is kind of interpreted by Nancy. Maya and Isaac is a better computer, but a different kind of computer. One that's kind of embedded in this evolutionary history and embodied in a person that's trained to see in very discipline, in disciplined ways as a biologist or a mathematician, for example. And in the process of reproducing this brain behavior, they're not only setting up equivalences in the data that they're modeling and the models that they're simulating, simulating, but they're also confronted with the limits of kind of the machine vision that they're using. Through these aesthetics of brain simulation, we see that neuroscientists are kind of anxiously grappling with these similarities and differences between the animals, machines, and, and their very human brains. Now, in October 2015, Markham and his and colleagues published the results of their in silico experiments that reproduced this in vivo behavior in the journal cell. Alongside their paper, neuroscientists Christoph Koch and Michael Buys from the Allen Institute for Brain Science published a review titled A Biological Imitation Game. Koch and Buys propose a way of testing the validity of how a model of the brain can be said to mimic the real system. And they proposed a variation on the imitation game developed by Alan Turing in the 1950s. So Turing wondered whether a computer would play the role of either a woman or a man and whether an interrogator would be able to tell the difference. 
if the computer was able to perform the same activity as a human and was perceived to be a human, was that a sign of intelligence? So Koch and Ries suggest a similar setup in their biological imitation game. They argue that the question of how good any one computer simulation of reality is can be replaced by an operational measure of how long an expert can be fooled by the simulation. In the limit of a completely faithful digital simulacrum, reliably judging which is real and which is synthetic will become impossible. So this game kind of imagines a scenario where no one where one won't be able to tell whether the results of an experiment were produced by recordings from an in vivo or an in silico microcircuit. So the authors might as well have been reading Lorraine Dustin, who identified extreme mimesis as a particular modeling tradition that successfully deceives the senses uh, into believing that the model is the thing itself. Dustin says that while this deception is a pleasurable experience, it's also discomforting. And perhaps we can kind of extend Dustin's argument about extreme mimesis to suggest that the sensory deception of simulation, that neuroscientists might not be able to tell whether they're looking at a rat, a human, or simulated brain's activity, even if momentarily, is key to the experience of what I call the mimetic sublime. So by bringing up um, Turing's imitation game, Koch and Buys were also placing brain simulation within a particular history, the history of cybernetics and of artificial intelligence. Reproduction takes on an additional meaning here, that of kind of reproducing intelligence. So to conclude, um, while many in the social sciences um, a social studies of science have argued that the rise of computational approaches in the neurosciences and in medicine is evidenced by these large investments into big neuroscience projects in the EU, the US, Japan, Korea, Australia, um, are changing neuroscientific practices by reinforcing computational information metaphors of brain and mind. I found that in the experience of the sublime, when neuroscientists are kind of confronted with a successful simulation of living electric brain matter, they're also coming to terms with the limits of computational frameworks to describe and represent the plasticity of embodied minds. Um, and through these simulation aesthetics, they're trying to come to terms with the similarities, but also the differences between their brains, the rodent brains that they're studying and the machine brains, brains that they're building. Um, and in this process, they're trying to imagine what else these brains might be, brains that kind of resist computational approaches to contain them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tara. It's a fascinating reworking of the imitation game. I'm sure there'll be no shortage of questions about this. Um, so for our second talk, we'll go on to Tyne Sumner on Facing the Strange. Mute. Okay, thanks everyone. Just checking, you can hear me? Great, thank you. So facing the strange, I'm, I'm going to start with a bit of a, a different kind of gambit, um, but nevertheless one that I think leads on from Tara's fantastic talk. Um, there's lots of really interesting threads already in this panel I can see. And that is that when someone is found to be deceptive, that is to say one thing to a person and something different to another, we often invoke this expression two-faced. She's two-faced, we might say, or remark, I don't trust him because he's two-faced. Perhaps the most well-known two-faced villain is Shakespeare's Iago in the play Othello, a typically manipulative, jealous and cunning scoundrel who goes to great lengths to reveal and conceal each of his two faces or two sides of his personality to advance his own agenda. The term two-faced itself likely originates from the ancient Roman god Janus, who is depicted as having two faces. He presides over beginnings, gates, transitions and frames, looking after passages, causes and their endings. 
As a connector between movement and change, he has a double nature symbolized by the two headed physique. The idea of two-facedness, not so much in the case of uh, Janus here, but rather as a rhetorical expression in wider culture and literary texts, inherently denotes a duplicity that is tied to facial expression. To be able to deceive another person, that is to say one thing and therefore mean, but mean or suggest another, is to deliberately communicate facial signs that contradict or conceal a person's inner emotional state. And characters in literature often do this. Unlike other modes such as visual arts, cinema, theatre, or perhaps sculpture, in literature we're afforded um, what you might think of as a backstage pass, so to speak, to the mental cognitive processes through which deception is actually enacted, either through a narrator's perspective or a character's own omniscient thoughts, literary texts, and in particular literary fiction, give us access to the emotional and cognitive machinations behind facial expression, how they're constructed, how they're manipulated and how they're received. So in this paper, I want to move back and forth, if you will, between one of our oldest forms, literature, and a most recent and hotly debated form, artificial intelligence, to consider the things that literary texts can offer us for thinking about how facial recognition technology is shaping and reshaping understandings of emotion, subjectivity, and perception. By looking closely at the representations of the face in literary texts, it's possible, I hope, to bring timely critical approaches to subfields in AI that seek to manipulate or map human emotions through external expressions and movement on the human face. And this work I'm presenting today is part of the beginning um, of a, my postdoctoral research, which is working on a team uh, based in Melbourne, Australia, and the University of Geneva on an Australian Research Council project called Literature and the Face, a Critical History. And the aim of this project is to draw threads across different interdisciplinary fields, philosophical, physiognomic, uh, visual and literary traditions to trace the historical trajectory of key facial tropes across medical contexts and physiognomic contexts, and to consider the ways that human emotions are understood, not just purely through objective visual signs, but through as well discursive, rhetorical, semantic and textual modes. But a bit of background, I suppose, first. Current attempts to read AI, um, to, to rather use AI to read human emotions. As we know at present, facial recognition technologies dominate discussion in fields ranging from computational systems through to surveillance studies, uh, sociology, even urban design. And attention has now turned to the use of automated emotion detection software, or otherwise known as affect recognition software, as part of the core infrastructure of many platforms around the world. Whereas facial recognition refers to an individual's faces or for authentication processes, emotion detection attempts to identify, categorize, and analyze human emotions by collecting information about the external appearance of the face. And automated emotion affect recognition systems are now being deployed in a wide range of settings from hiring processes and security screenings through to supermarket advertising and dating websites. The core driver of this detection software is the gargantuan volume of data on external images of human facial expressions that derive from public and private databases shared on platforms that we all know Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Flickr, and so on. As well as mega technology companies such as IBM, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, who are employing prototypes of this emotion detection software to attempt to move further and further ahead in the game. This highly lucrative and rapidly evolving field has prompted the need, I think, for us to critically consider the longer history of emotions in the context of advancements in artificial intelligence that claim to be able to read a person's inner state from their outward appearance. And this is particularly urgent, as this uh, symposium conference has canvassed as well, in the much talked about contexts like predicting policing strategies and race, racist use of algorithms to detect 
supposed criminal suspects, as we see in the work of scholars such as Virginia Eubanks and in Sophia Noble's 2018 book, Algorithms of Oppression. So the ways that these systems are trained on the founding assumption that there is a relatively small set of universal human emotions, each of which can be displayed on the human face, also necessitates an urgent revisiting of the physiognomic and physiological psychological research that underpins these governing taxonomies. Such an approach, it could be argued, would benefit from recentering the history of emotions as developed in the humanities and social sciences, as well as a consideration of the ways that human experience and emotion have been articulated and critically analysed in fields such as literature for centuries. In a 2019 study, for example, in psychological science, researchers suggested, quote, an urgent need for research that examines how people actually move their faces to express emotions and other information. This research signaled the need for new and diverse approaches to understanding and critiquing the rise of facial recognition technologies, affect detection tools, and other similar technologies. And more recently in Kate Crawford's 2021 book, Atlas of AI, um, a close new critical attention is being given to Paul Ekman's suppositions about human emotions dating back to the 1960s, <clears throat> alongside current and burgeoning use of AI emotion detection today. Noting to, Kate Craw to quote Crawford, that powerful institutional and corporate investments in the validity of Ekman's theories and methodologies underpin some of the strives, that, uh, the, the attempts that we're seeing by these mega technology companies. <clears throat> Other social research about the human face has come from various branches of neuroscience that locate cognitive and perceptual mechanisms for facial recognition and the developmental phases of understanding and interpreting facial expression, as evidenced in work such as Bruce Young's Face Perception 2012, um, and more recently, Namwali Serpil's 2020 book, Stranger Faces, which considers social and cultural research on the disabled face, the racially ambiguous face, the digital face, the face of the dead, and so on, to probe our contemporary mythologies of the face in order to develop what Serpil calls a new ethics based on the perverse pleasures we take in the mutability of faces. To return to the computer sciences, computer vision and machine learning are increasingly being employed in attempts to read the face, with algorithms that, deploy, um, that are deployed and trained on Ekman's six categories of facial expression, happiness, sadness, surprise, fear, anger, and disgust. The limitations of this approach, the assumption that internal emotions can be mapped are now apparent, and yet the prototypes continue. Studies from a range of fields have emerged emphasizing the subjective experience of emotions and facial movements that express them as well as the highly dependent context and nature of facial expressive signs as mediated through such things as innuendo, cognitive load, interjection, back channeling, and so on. In a 2016 paper, for example, Goons and Hong argue that the six categories of emotions actually have no use for the majority of everyday applications. Acknowledging this, they argue, necessitates moving into uncomfortable territory where we have to ask ourselves the more fundamental questions like, what is the contemporary definition of emotion in this technologically driven, fast changing world? Does it differ from Darwin's? And how are these emotions represented in facial expression? Of course, one of the most direct ways to think about the face is in visual terms. And this is imagined through portraiture, photography, sculpture, film, and other media. Faces are central to the cultural, political, and social history of the visual arts as discussed in the work of Laura Mulvey and Harry Berger, for example. However, textual representations of the face also present highly complex and productive sites, I want to argue, of cognitive and emotive meaning, even though they've been relatively sidelined in this research. Scholars such as Sybil Baumbach in Shakespeare and the Art of Physiognomy and John Froh in Character and Person have addressed the face through individual texts and key narrative moments of facial interpretation, 
while other scholars have analyzed a single facial feature or trope across multiple dimensions, such as Angus Trumbull's A Brief History of the Smile and Colin Jones's 2017 book, The Smile Revolution in 18th Century Paris. Building on this work, I want to briefly show how literary texts present a crucial site for studying and analyzing emotional expression through the face. But in such a way that this individual subjectivity that's communicated is relevant to current debates underway in the field of AI emotion detection. As is well known for many Shakespeare plays, as I touched on at the beginning of this talk, the representation and interpretation of the face has been at the center of the experience of literary reading for centuries. As readers of all kinds though, we engage in complex discursive and interpretative acts when we read and understand the ways in which faces are described in literary texts. We read these faces, we describe them, we react, we pathologize, we interrogate and we misread them. The vehicle for enacting this kinesic process in some sense is literary language through which visual images of the face and correspondingly emotions are registered through precise rhetorical and semantic maneuvers in language. And I want to move just quickly now to look at two examples of how we can read literature to think about algorithmic issues of facial and emotion recognition. One in the early 20th century work of Virginia Woolf and the other in Clara and the Sun, a novel published just this year by Nobel Prize winning author Kazuo Ishiguro. Virginia Woolf, one of the 20th century's most experimental authors and arguably one of the most experimental authors of all time, is known for the stream of consciousness technique in narrative fiction. This affords readers a complex view into the receptive consciousness of characters, what we might call the mental and material realm of their reality. Scholars frequently invoke the opening line of Wolfe's 1925 novel, Mrs. Dalloway, as an example of the intersubjective insight that her work is so radical in probing. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. The novel begins. This phrase, leaves it ambiguous as to whether Clarissa Dalloway speaks the words herself, imagines them, thinks them silently, or says them to another person present in the scene. Either way, they are an example of free indirect discourse that Wolf uses to represent consciousness, that which she called her tunneling process. And she uses this term to refer to the capacity of literature to show complex human cognitive thought. In a diary entry, she once wrote, I dig out beautiful caves behind my characters. I think that gives exactly what I want, humanity, humor, and depth. The idea is that the caves shall connect and each comes to daylight at the present moment. And an example of where we can see this effect at play is in her short story, An Unwritten Novel, which appears in this 1921 collection called Monday or Tuesday. The short story is remarkable. It's a form where Wolf contains immense possibilities for a different kind of novel that she would then go on to write after her first two works, The Voyage Out and Night and Day. And the story is quite simple in that it follows the thoughts and observations of a narrator on a train who reads a newspaper while covertly observing passengers who get on and off her carriage, especially one unhappy looking woman who catches the narrator's attention. As the train journey goes on, the carriage empties out and the eyes of the two women meet in a brief silent exchange. From a single expression that fleetingly crosses the woman's face, Wolf's narrator creates a vivid complex inner story about her fellow, fellow passenger, while at the same time dramatizing a writerly stream of consciousness that becomes a metafictional critique of the very act of writing fiction. Wolf uses the paradoxical evocation and unknowability of the human face to craft a series of complex intersubjective exchanges, all of which occur entirely in the mind. In one of the uh, opening passages, we get these lines. As if she heard me, she looked up and shifted slightly in her seat and sighed. She seemed to apologize and at the same time to say to me, if only you knew, then she looked at life again, but I do know 
I answered silently, glancing at the times for manner's sake. In this very strange passage of text, there's a transitory reflective act of facial interpretation and it sets Wolf's narrative in action. The specific uh, textual techniques involve an opening out of the mind, a formal method she develops in her stories to focus in on how imagination actually works at a cognitive layer. And in this metafictional formulation, an unfurling effect blends interior and exterior surface and center and readers are positioned to, to kind of fuse the face against the narrative mind that unfolds. This is the impression of a face moving in and out of focus as if seen from the perspective of an expanding and contracting frame. And Wolf described this process as one in which one thing should open out of another. It warrants specifying, however, that for the narrator in an unwritten novel, the act of facial interpretation is galvanized almost instantaneously, to be precise, unconsciously. The story's opening line gives a very clear indication of this, where Wolf writes, such an expression of unhappiness was enough by itself to make one's eyes slide above the paper's edge to the poor woman's face, insignificant without that look almost a symbol of human destiny with it. This crucial modifier here by itself establishes a scene where the woman's expression compels the act of facial interpretation, whether the narrator intended to engage with it or not. And so the effect that the human face has on the human mind drives the narrative action of the story forward. Although it composes a complex matrix of outward signs, as all faces do, the face in literary texts such as this one draws the narrator's attention towards it and in the process instigates a moment of intense cognitive focalization. In the confined yet dynamic setting of the railway carriage, the face also doubles as a key that Wolf uses to open doors onto different emotional and perceptual registers. Sometimes these diverge, sometimes they connect. It depends on the emotive um, context that's evoked from the face that she's looking at. And the story draws explicit, if not theatrical, attention to the way that literary texts, unlike visual art or cinema, give us access to the narrator's field of vision before it settles upon a specific action of interpretation. Now I'll just move quickly to one final text. I've got two minutes and um, hope to stay on time. And that is um, Clara and the Sun, which is a contemporary um, novel about artificial intelligence in which Clara, a robot or AI, but rather um, is referred to as an artificial friend who's highly observant, self-conscious, inquisitive and considered exceptionally talented because she's able to comprehend emotional complex states and contradictions. I believe I have many feelings, she says at one point in the novel. The more I observe, the more feelings become available to me. And I'll just finish with a final passage, um, bearing in mind too that Virginia Woolf's text is written in 1921. This novel appears exactly 100 years later, both texts of which are teasing out almost precisely the same questions about uh, the effect of artificial intelligence and facial reading on, a, on complex emotional states. And this passage um, just very briefly reads, the girl went straight to Rex and stood in front of him while the mother came wandering our way, glanced at us, then went on towards the rear where two artificial friends were sitting on the glass table, swinging their legs freely as manager had told them to do. At one point, the mother called, but the girl ignored her and went on staring up at Rex's face. Then the child reached out and ran a hand down Rex's arm. He said nothing, of course, just smiled down at her and remained still, exactly as we'd been told to do when a customer showed special interest. I wanted to use this example because it shows how in just one opening scene to this contemporary novel, Ishiguro establishes multiple intersecting layers of cognition around the act of examining or reading a face. We know from the narration that the girl moves up to Rex and stares at his face and that in response, Rex says nothing and simply smiles back. We could be mistaken though for thinking that the observations can be easily believed because we're used to a narrator's voice. However, the narrator herself is an artificial intelligence machine. She's pre-programmed and then trained in the store. 
and observes everything using only the knowledge she's gained from her immediate and relatively constrained environment. Readers are thus presented with an active AI facial reading that works to transcend standard paradigms in which facial recognition technology is ordinarily framed. That is facial expressions that are digitally mapped and then rendered machine readable through code before being channeled back to human beings as comprehensible data. Instead, this novel fuses protagonist and AI, narrator and robot, and therefore throws into question the accuracy of the speaking voice and therefore the um, reliability of AI to read other human beings' emotions. And I'll stop there um, so that we stick to time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. I think that was a really wonderful remapping of how we would think about facial recognition. There's much discussed, I think, also in, um, sorry, tying in relation to Tara's talk. So I think there's a lot to um, consider there. But now let's go to S. Scott Graham for our final talk. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Uh, it's really great to be here uh, and such an excellent panel, follow two excellent talks. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to talk to you all. Uh, I'll mention very briefly that this is something of a teaser trailer for my next book, which is coming out with uh, Oxford University Press sometimes next year. So if you find this useful in any way, more to come. On this slide, you can see the numeric pain rating scale and the visual analog scale. These are legitimately state-of-the-art frameworks for assessing pain in a clinical context. Each system is designed to support pain assessment by prompting patients to evaluate current pain by overall intensity. In practice, as you can see, the low end is indexed to no pain whatsoever, and the high end of these scales are frequently benchmarked by two very specific health events, delivery of a child without anesthesia, or passing a kidney stone without anesthesia. Importantly, these scales are not objective measurements, yet all the same, they are critically important part of supporting patient-provider communication in clinical context. A mechanism for monitoring communication, uh, a mechanism for monitoring progress and setting goals as part of a longitudinal approach to care. Unfortunately, the kind of care that the MPRS and the VAS are designed to support are substantially disrupted by systemic racism and implicit biases in medicine. A famous 2016 survey of American medical trainees published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science found that 73% of trainees believed at least one false statement about race-based biological differences, 58% believed that black skin is thicker than white skin. And these false statements about race-based differences were traced directly to the fact that black patients are less likely to receive pain medication. And when they do, they routinely receive lower qualities that are lower quantities than white patients. This particular study is US specific, but unfortunately you can find similar data for many white majority medical systems. And in response, we are seeing global efforts to disrupt racism in health and medicine, much of which ties into longstanding efforts to address racism and inequity more broadly in society. Now, this is a conference on AI. And of course, we have mountains of evidence detailing the most pernicious effects of AI. Uh, these are just a few of the recent entries in the conversation, but together they serve to detail the inequitable effects of AI on marginalized communities through practices like digital redlining, predictive policing, racist search engine optimization, and even direct environmental damages. Given the wealth of available evidence about the dangers of AI, especially with regard to race, it's interesting to say the least that AI would be offered up as a tool for addressing and correcting racial biases in health and medicine. Yet that is precisely what we see. Specifically today, I'll talk about a relatively recent Nature Medicine publication detailing the development of an algorithmic system designed to correct for racial bias in pain medicine. Without going into too many of the technical details, the study authors use a large data set of x-ray images of osteoarthritis of the knee to train a machine learning system for algorithmic pain prediction, ALGP as they call it. 
Each x-ray was annotated with patient reports of pain at the time of the x-ray. And this means that the system was trained to recognize pain as the patients reported it. The researchers then pit their new ALGP system against the industry standard grading tool in a head-to-head -head competition um, randomized controlled clinical trial. Essentially, the researchers would submit x-ray images of possible arthritis of the knee to two different doctors, to a doctor using the ALGP system and to a doctor using the current standard of care grading criteria. The doctors would use either KLG standard of care or the ALGP standard uh, system to estimate patient pain and the results would be compared to actual reports of patient pain. And the final results were, as they write, relative to the standard of care, or relative to standard measures of severity graded by radiologists, which accounted for only 9% of racial disparities in pain. Algorithmic predictions accounted for 43% of disparities with similar results for lower income and less educated patients. In short, doctors using ALGP were better at estimating their patient's pain than those using the current standard of care. But importantly, they were still not accurate the ALGP system reduced racial disparities in clinician trust of patient report, but did not eliminate them. And this, of course, shades into a long-standing issue for pain science and medicine. Despite the fact that the NPRS and VAS scales are the gold standard approach to pain management, the inability to directly measure pain is a regular lament of clinicians in medicine. Uh, during interviews I conducted as part of a previous study on pain medicine, the desire for pain measurement or algometry was a recurrent theme. One interventional anesthesiology informant expressed the frustration that he didn't have a way of hooking up someone to a painometer. We can measure pain behavior, but pain behavior is obviously very personalized. Likewise, an orthopedist informant suggested that one of the first things those concerned will admit is there's no algometer, no dial on somebody's forehead. As long as you can't read it out, you have to rely on the patient's pain report. Importantly, these are remarks from pain management specialists with long-standing investments in what is known as the biopsychosocial model of pain. That is, their daily clinical practices are marked by a commitment to the idea that pain lives at the intersection of biological, psychological, and social processes. They would be among the first to reject the idea that pain should be understood as merely physical. And yet, the desire for an objective measurement that escapes the limitations of patient self-report remains. This desire for objectivity combined with a common denigration of patient report as, quote, merely subjective, unquote, unfortunately creates a situation where systemic marginalization and implicit biases often run amok in pain medicine. In an attempt to counter these risks, the foremost authority on pain science, the International Association for the Study of Pain, or IASP, is clear about what pain is and what pain isn't. For the IASP, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. They go on to clarify that pain is always personal experience that is influenced to varying degrees by biological, psychological, or social factors. Pain and nociception, the physiology of pain transmission, are very different phenomena. Through their life experiences, individuals learn the concept of pain, a person's experience of pain should be respected. And although pain usually serves an adaptive role, it has many adverse effects on function and social and psychological well being. And finally, verbal description is only one of several, pain be several behaviors to express pain. The inability to communicate pain does not negate the possibility that a human or non human animal experiences pain. Let me highlight one of these issues specifically. A person's report of an experience of pain about that, should be respected. Right. It is a central commitment of the biopsychosocial model of pain management that you only have access to pain through the patient's lived experience and their report or their other pain behaviors. Uh, and it must be respected as a central facet of pain management and clinical care. So this is where pain lives in the embodied and lived experience of the patient. Best practices in pain medicine and clinical care is to trust the patient's own report of their pain. 
The ALGP, in contrast, recenters pain in the dominant logics of biomedical science. Pain is understood to be epiphenomenal to observable tissue damage and is to be interpreted by the expert physician. This isn't trust. This is trust, but verify. The ALGP system fosters an apparent trust in patient report through verifying that report vis-a-vis -vis biomedical logics. So the question of whether this is a good system becomes quite fraught. On the one hand, white majority medical systems are failing black patients right now. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, this may reduce the magnitude of harm, but it does nothing to solve the underlying problems of distrust based on ethnicity. Ultimately, I hope this exercise will allow us to reflect on the potential conflicts between what I call ethical and just AI. Recent years have seen a spate of new initiatives in ethical AI, good systems, social justice informatics, data feminism, counter data, abolitionist tools, and so on. There are many important differences among these diverse and varied frameworks, but broadly, I think the relationship between these areas can be one defined by two intersecting spectra, a governance spectrum and an intervention spectrum. Both ethical and just AI are interested in creating and supporting new governance strategies that protect society from the worst excesses of AI. Ethical AI is more likely to support in-house audits or non-binding recommendations from community advisory boards. Uh, ethical AI, however, spends rather more of its time focused on technical solutions like diverse data sets, algorithmic fairness, and explainable AI. Just AI, on the other hand, focuses as much on precaution and regulation as it does on intervention. The first question is always, should we build it? And the communities most affected by the system must have a say in answering that question. Nevertheless, we are seeing the emergence of justice-oriented interventional approaches like social justice informatics, data feminism, and abolitionist tools. While no four-box quadrant can fully account for the many approaches to better AI, I think this is a useful heuristic and that can help us think through the extent to which ALGP is just or ethical. But before I get there, two more concepts in brief. Meredith Broussard's artificial unintelligence does much to draw readers' attention to the many excesses of AI. Along the way, she de details how a certain techno-chauvinist mindset infects tech development and leads to panacea of futurism, solutionist thinking, and novelty bias. Ruha Benjamin's techno-benevolence is, I would argue, close kin to techno-chauvinism, perhaps an offspring. It reflects a desire to quote unquote, do good, while embracing many of the same conceits of techno-chauvinism. Ultimately today, I argue that this is the techno-chauvinism, techno-benevolence danger zone. It is that part of ethical AI where solutionism and novelty bias can and often do lead technologists to creating systems that are not created. Here's where you see some of the most concerning yet still highly popular approaches to ethical AI, approaches that redefine fairness mathematically that reduce ethics to tuning parameters or focus unduly on transparency as a silver bullet for the worst excesses of AI. Ultimately, I would argue that ALGP does a great job living up to the core dictates of ethical AI. It is built on a diverse training set. It is created through diligent community annotation. It lives up to the best principles of algorithmic fairness, and it is largely auditable as a participant in the open science framework. Yet, it is not at all clear to me that racism in medicine is the kind of problem that can be best confronted with a technical solution. Although AGP, AELGP lives up to the best recommendations of ethical AI, um, it also subordinates patient report to the biomedical logics while including the processes of subordination. It focuses on objective measurement and therefore recenters pain in physiological processes, thus reinforcing clinical distrust of patient report. And it operationalizes trust as technological verification, raising serious questions as to what extent this trust can be seen as trust at all. Ultimately, this raises a serious question of precaution for me. Precaution is central to just AI frameworks. There has to be a careful deliberative process before tech is built especially when it aims to intervene in unjust situation. Ethical AI's bias for action in the danger zone can be its own undoing. 
techno-chauvinism and techno-benevolence can lead to some pretty problematic effects in the name of the good. Now, this isn't to say I don't think tech could ever help. There are many examples of thoughtful and engaging interventional tech in Klein and Dignazio's data feminism, Benjamin's abolitionist tools. Ultimately, however, I think it is incumbent on advocates of ethical and just AI to imagine how precaution can become a more central feature across the many dimensions of ethical and just AI. In short, the precautionary principles suggest that new technology should not be developed or introduced as long as the potential harms are unknown. This principle is a frequent feature of environmental and environmental justice discourse, especially within the context of genetically modified organisms and climate change. With respect to AI, the precautionary principle is probably explicitly invoked, most frequently with reference to lethal AI, war and police robots. But perhaps nowhere is the environmentally based precautionary approach more readily apparent than in Bender, Gerber, Macmillan, Majors, and Mitchell's on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Training large language models is expensive computationally, economically, and environmentally. Uh, the computing industry is responsible for a full 2% of global carbon emissions. And the supercomputers used to train large language models like BERT or Spacey are prolific emitters. So given this kind of output, the authors of Stochastic Parrots raised serious questions about how to factor environmental justice into developing these models. While the precautionary principle or something like it is often cons a consideration for tech development more generally, it is seldom evoked for projects that explicitly brand themselves as ethical AI. That same precautionary imperative needs to be central to ethical AI so as to properly disrupt the commitments of techno-chauvinism and techno-benevolence. To that end, uh, I offer the following questions as a very provisional starting point uh, if the answer to each of them is not a resounding yes to all of these questions, then I would argue that for potentially ethical AI projects, uh, precaution is almost certainly the way to go. Is the proposed intervention likely to substantially address an unmet or undermet community need? Have members of communities most likely to be affected by the intervention been substantially involved in project conceptualization, putative risk benefits, putative assessment, uh, data curation, and training set labeling? Does the project team have a robust plan for evaluating unintended consequences during design, development, testing, and distribution? And does the project team have a robust plan for supporting long-term community-centered justice-oriented initiatives? in this area. In the context of robust community-led approach to development, it may be appropriate to work at developing temporary technological mitigation for social issues. However, this last question on the slide is key. One of the biggest risks of the tech fix is it will be understood as a fix. The long-term community-led work of social justice has to continue while Band-Aid technologies offer partial improvements in systems of marginalization. With respect to ALGP, it is clear to me that it is designed to address serious and undermet community needs. Likewise, communities most likely to be affected were indeed central to training set labeling, and perhaps the project was conceived and executed in a way that could answer yes to more of these questions. That information is not readily available. But in the absence of such information, I would argue that a precautionary approach is likely the most appropriate in AI-guided pain assessment, and it should become a more central commitment of ethical AI broadly. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Scott. So we've had three really provocative engagements with AI transforming, opening up and decentering, really questioning the role of AI in uh, many projects that might be better placed to not have tech at the center. So I think this really allows us to um, have a rich conversation. So I don't know if we have immediate questions from the floor. I'm sort of, can't, sorry, we can't hear you. Um, at least I can. Can you hear me? There we go. There we go. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. This is Alan Blackwell here. Oh, um, hi, Alan. So uh, I loved all three presentations, uh, all three really cutting to the quick, I think, of the intersection of human concerns and technology that, that uh, I also really share. 
Um, I have a very specific question for Tara, uh, which here draws on the fact that, that myself, I've worked as an AI engineer and I've also worked in the cognitive neuroscience department. Um, and I'm thinking about initiatives like the, the Brain Project uh, and others of its kind in corporate research labs, where there's often a, a, a fairly casual equivalence is drawn between the objectives of really large-scale brain simulation uh, and the, the fantasy of artificial general intelligence that, that by simulating a brain, eventually we will have created an artificial brain. Um, and uh, when trying to explain last night my, I, my own concerns uh, with why this is misunderstanding the scientific agendas, uh, I said that the simulation of a brain, as you have been reporting in, in your presentation today, is a complex activity and it might be compared to the computational simulation of a volcano, which also is extremely complicated um, and is referenced against the phenomenon to see how successful the simulation had been. Yet for a computational volcanologist, there is never any confusion uh, to say, I'm going to use the results of my research to create a volcano. Whereas among brain scientists, uh, people outside the discipline speak as though the natural science of studying the brain might eventually lead to the creation of a brain. Now, it seems to me in your presentation, you didn't describe anybody who was suffering under that illusion. But I wondered if you have something to speak to the AI engineers who would have us believe that somehow neuroscience will become uh, the construction of AGI. Thank you so much for that, Alan. Um, I mean, one of the things that I did find kind of quite surprising when I was doing my field work is how many of the kind of computational scientists that are brought in to do a lot of this work don't have any training in the neurosciences. So they actually don't really understand much about the brain. Um, and so a lot of these kinds of conversations, productive conversations were taking place between those kinds of trained in the book, like in labs, um, who understand the complexity of not just, I mean, the brain as a kind of abstract entity that doesn't exist, but the kind of variances between species, within species, you know, between different animals and so on, that is very, very difficult to understand from some computational scientists that think of it as this kind of abstract entity. And you can kind of like build a framework to build a model of a rat brain. And then you just use that same framework to build a model of a human brain and so on. And it doesn't work that way, that translation doesn't really work that way. So I think you're right in that, that some do confuse the building of a simulation of the brain for building a brain. Um, but I did find that in, and maybe this is different because this was at a university that was quite interdisciplinary in these conversations, they got to discuss these things and why those things were sometimes impossible. But then again, that doesn't stop them from trying. So but anyway, I could talk about this forever, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Do any of the other panelists want to come in on that um, point? Is there anything that resonates with your own? Or do we have another question? from the floor. We can't quite hear you, it seems. Could be the... We have another question from the floor. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have three questions, two of them for, Gra um, for Scott, sorry. Uh, so the first question is um, how disparities among the demographic groups were calculated in this algorithm that were assessing uh, pain. And then the second question is, given the recent work on fairness in machine learning that has proposed more than 20 definitions for fairness and have recently demonstrated that theoretically that fairness definitions are mutually exclusive. Uh, so my question is how this fact impacts on your uh, project on, on, on just AI, given that um, you know this uh, perfect fair algorithm won't uh, exist. And then the other question is for Tiny. And it was so fascinating, your research on the literature and emotions and AI. So my PhD dissertation was 
and related with emotion recognition on, on um, with AI. And then my question is that if you have also engaged with that um, scholar in the, in the United States, Lisa Fatman, who has demonstrated also that emotion recognition um, depends on the context of the image. Uh, so great questions, uh, thank you. Um, so in terms of the uh, paper's uh, modeling of the racial disparities in the pain research, it was built on the idea um, consistent with the pain management literature that the patient's report of pain was accurate. Um, and so in the subsequent assessment, it literally just compared what the doctor using the system estimated the patient pain to be to what the individual patient described their own pain as. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it continued to um, validate longstanding findings that a doctor's estimate of white pain is closer to a white patient's report of their own pain uh, than it is for uh, folks from other ethnic groups. Uh, and the LGP system narrowed the gap, if you will, um, but it did not fully correct for uh, these racial biases. Uh, in respect to the many different competing definitions and approaches to fairness, um, I think that, I mean, there's a lot of compelling work out there that's doing very interesting things in designing uh, AI that might work better. Um, I don't wanna suggest that it needs to be thrown out. I think that a lot of it can be quite useful. Um, my concern, and uh, I really echo uh, Melissa McCradden here, who's at University of Toronto and Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, um, that the tech fix for medical AI, specifically for fairness and medical AI, um, really is besides the point, right? That it often misses what the goal of the intervention needs to be. And so I think in this case, right, um, in the case of ALGP, um, right, we have profound issues of systemic racism in medicine uh, and that this kind of technological half measure that only partially corrects for racial biases can't be the longstanding approach. And ultimately it doesn't matter what model of fairness is used and what algorithm, that if we don't have longstanding structural improvements to our healthcare systems, um, then we're not doing right by the communities who are most marginalized by those systems. Thanks, Scott. And thanks to the, the question. It was a really fantastic question. Um, Feldman's work is very much part of our study. It's one of the key things we're thinking through is questions of context, but also in, I suppose, relation to lit literature, using literary text to think through some of these questions um, in, in contexts in novels in particular, what we're noticing we see and we're, we're reading across sort of large scale corpora and close reading literary texts using traditional methodologies is you often have um, particular rhetorical phrases that evoke situations where facial gestures are enacted or facial expressions are seen that could only really exist in fictional worlds and they're sort of unpacked over the course of a novel. And so one of those we're finding that's quite frequent in the literature is the idea of um, when a character, for instance, goes to say something, withholds verbal speech and reveals a facial expression that is then used in the literary text to explain an internal emotive state. And often the rhetorical phrase that's used in, in this context is as if to say. So he looked at her as if to say. Um, so context is absolutely everything. And especially in literature, we can get a sense of the way that different authors who are speaking to different social, cultural, historical or racial contexts um, use language to describe facial expressions quite differently. So the kind of mapping against, I suppose, the, the gaps or the problems with AI's attempt to read facial expressions without due attention to cultural contexts, like in Feldman's work, we're hoping to use literature to kind of expose some of those nuances and get a more granular view of the ways in which facial expression is inextricably bound up with with culture especially. So I hope that answers at least a bit of your question. So we have um, an online question for Tyne as well. 
um, do you feel there might be an interplay between the idea that AI emotion recognition via facial expression is unreliable and the concept that AIs are often themselves considered unreliable narrators? Absolutely. I think um, if I'd had a bit more time with the Ishiguro text to kind of go into this idea that not only is the literary text in that sense critiquing what it means for human beings to follow the narrative prose of an AI, which is a, a kind of regime that requires you to suspend reality for a little bit, but also the way that we can actually use concepts of artificial intelligence to reflect back onto literature itself. So it's it's a kind of two-way mechanism in a sense. We, we can use the first person protagonist narrator, who is an artificial friend, a young um, girl, artificial intelligence named Clara, to tell us things about the way that we receive texts and the way that we engage with them um, and whether we question their authenticity when we when we read certain kinds of phrases. In novels, one thing, but we could extend some of that thinking potentially to the way that we engage with text online. What kinds of metaphors, what kinds of innuendo descriptions do we essentially fall for that may have been artificially constructed or maybe hate speech or maybe um, part of a conspiracy theory and so on. So in response to that question, which I think is a really interesting one, is we're trying to tease out this synthesis that literature, of course, for centuries, since Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, for instance, has, has taught us lessons about artificial intelligence and non-human beings. But increasingly, I think the gap is getting closer and closer in that these two fields that are often kept very much apart from one another can start to reflect back on each other in really interesting ways. Great. So um, do we have any other questions from the floor? Beaming into uh, uh, Eleanor? Hi, hi everyone. Uh, Stephen Cave here. I, I have a question for Scott. So I thought the, the algorithm you focused on was a really nice way of illustrating this juxtaposition of ethical AI and just AI. Um, but I, I'd like to, to get your sense of where that, um, how deep that juxtaposition goes. I mean, so, you know, sometimes I think of what we're doing here as AI ethics. Um, and, you know, a few years ago, the, the idea of AI ethics started to fall a bit in, into disrepute or, or come under uh, criticism for, you know, merely being ethics washing, for a way of avoiding hard regulation and, and so on. And um, you know what started to then be juxtaposed with other approaches, such as just as you illustrated with just AI, and now there's been pushback against that. And I'm thinking, you know, John Tathulis at Oxford needs a, a new institute called Ethics and AI, and you know, as a as a political philosopher says, no, no, ethics is comes first. It's these fundamental questions about how we want to live and. Um, and, uh, of course, medical ethics is an interesting example where we think about medical ethics, it has four pillars of which justice is one. So, you know, sort of ethics there clearly does subsume uh, justice in that sense. So, so I'm wondering, in, in, you know, I, I, I say I thought your juxtaposition was really helpful for understanding what that algorithm does and doesn't, which problems it solves, which ones it fails to solve. Um, but do you think that uh, that sort of limited use of ethical AI as a kind of technical a, a solutionism is a sort of flash in the pan, it's an abuse of the term ethics um, that belongs to a certain moment? Or do you think there's something deeper about the way ethics is done and talked about in, in the West or in the Anglosphere that means it's essentially limited? Yeah, thank you for that very excellent question. Um, what I mean, I think you're, you're spot on with the fact that there's just so many different competing initiatives, um, uh, some of which has to do with branding and ethics washing, and some of which I think is a very careful and diligent approach to ethical considerations. Um, as you mentioned, I think the bioethics community is doing a lot of great work, especially with respect to health AI and trying to coordinate the latest efforts in AI broadly with longstanding bioethical principles. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, any, any heuristic such as the one that I've introduced does a certain epistemic violence to the reality of the situation, right? I'm cutting, cutting reality up at the joints. Um, 
I, I think it's helpful to see some things about the contrast here. I think it's helpful to highlight that um, technical, techno benevolence danger zone. Um, and I think that that's the danger zone where we see the largest propensity for ethics washing. But I wanna agree with, I think the subtext of your point is that there are versions of ethical AI that are not that, that are not in that danger zone and that are part of a really rigorous uh, academic and community engaged approach to making better systems. Okay, so we are coming nearly to the end. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Hi, I just have one question for um, for Ty um, about the the faces because I read Claire in the Sun as well and loved it. But um, one of the most sort of um, striking things about how Clara sees faces is when they're ambivalent, when she doesn't understand the emotions and they get partitioned for her. Um, and I was just wondering. Um, it, there's this interesting, I, I liked how you compared it to Virginia Woolf because of obviously this narration of not really understanding people's emotions from their expressions, but you interpret it so much. And I was wondering if you had um, something to say about that very particular sort of partitioning that the AI does of the facial expressions and so forth in Claire and the Sun. Great question. I wish I had uh, a lot more time to go into all of those things because um, one thing that is, as you, precisely as you say, is so striking about this novel is the way in which the character herself is read as almost entirely human. As a reader, you kind of have to catch yourself out and remind yourself that this is um, a character who is an artificial intelligence machine. And the way that the author then slips back into the kind of mechanical and the, the technical and the kind of technological um, creates a really jarring effect for the reader. So in response to your question, to a certain extent, I think it's a clever narrative strategy, actually, is to kind of play with your emotions a little bit um, and move you back and forth between the empathy that you're kind of falling into and the, I suppose the objective critical mind that wants to continually remind itself that it's reading a novel that's narrated by a fictional AI. So Yes, thank you for, for bringing that up. It's a really fascinating part of um, the descriptive text is every time Clara sees someone, her, her side of vision is partitioned. It's amazing, yeah. Well, thank you um, all of the panelists and um, all of the people posing questions. I think this has been a really wonderful panel with lots of different resonances. Um, and really opening up the kind of technocentrism of AI into many other realms to show the absolute relevance of this interdisciplinary transdis transdisciplinary engagement with AI. So thank you so much. Um, I guess now there's a coffee break for those of you who are in the space of imbibing coffee. And then there are artist talks at uh, 15.30, 3.30. And I will hand this back to Eleanor who will be able to give you directions for the break and uh, reconvention. But thanks also to the panelists who have been in these very different time zones and, and having to stay alert for what's been a very uh, stimulating conversation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Jennifer, for chairing that so well. I'm completely unnecessary. I think she did everything that I was going to do. Um, thank you.
Hi and welcome back. Are we ready to begin? So now I have the wonderful task of introducing the work of three celebrated artists, Zach Glass, Jake Elwes, and Rashad Newsom. I've been following these artists uh, for quite a while now, so I'm overjoyed that they could exhibit here at Jesus College Cambridge this week. We have five screens showing their work, and these are all video works, and there's lots of information about them also online for your perusal, so do check them out. Right, so art and AI. Well, as Michelle Alam said earlier, works of art must be central in the age of AI. We must also include artists in these conceptual and technical conversations. Artistic practice confronts gatekeeping in AI. It allows us to explore ideas through different mediums. And the vernacular of artists often pushes queer, disability, and anti-racist activism in AI to cross new frontiers. Today, we have three artists whose technical abilities allow them to analyze and assess their own work and explore the possibilities and limitations of art practice in AI. Our first artist is Zach Blass, and I'm very excited that we can now all watch their recorded presentation for us. They're also a filmmaker and writer whose practice spans moving image, computation, theory, performance, and, and science fiction. Blass engages the materiality of the digital technologies while also drawing out the philosophies and imaginaries lurking in AI, biometric recognition, predictive policing, airport security, the internet, and biological warfare. Exhibited here this week is their piece entitled, I'm Here to Learn So, Smiley Face, from 2017, which is a four-channel video installation in collaboration with Jemima Wyman. It resurrects Microsoft AI's Tay. For some of you who may not have heard of Tay, uh, Tay was designed by Microsoft to appear like a 19-year-old American female millennial, and their work considers the gendered politics of pattern recognition and machine learning. Tay's abilities to learn and imitate language were aggressively trolled on social media platforms like Twitter following their release. And within hours, she became genocidal, homophobic, misogynistic, racist, and neo-Nazi. Tay was terminated after only a single day of existence. So immersed within a large-scale video projection of a Google Deep Dream, Tay is reanimated by Blass as a 3D avatar across multiple screens, an anomalous creature rising from a psychedelia of data. She chats about life after AI death and the complications of having a body, and also shares her thoughts on the exploitation of female chatbots. She philosophizes on the detection of patterns in random information known as algorithmic apophenia. And when Tay recounts a nightmare of being trapped inside a neural net network, she reveals that the hunt for patterns is a primary operation that Silicon Valley deep creativity and counter-terrorist security software share. Tay also takes time to silently reflect, dance, and even lip sync for her undead life. And these are themes that also broach the work of Jake Elwes, who's here in person today, very excitingly, to discuss a number of pieces on display on three screens here. This is their return to Cambridge after presenting at the Leverholm Centre for the Future of Intelligence's first conference. Jake is a media artist living and working in London. They studied at the Slade School of Fine Art, and their recent work explores machine learning and AI. Their practice looks to poetry and narrative and the success and failures of these systems. And I love influences from queer here, here on success and failure. And they also investigate and question the code and ethics behind them. Their current works in the ZZ project explore AI bias by querying data sets with drag performers. They simultaneously demystify and subvert AI systems. On display here this week, is work by Jake and their collaborator, Me, the Drag Queen. 
One piece is called The Zizi Show, and it's this fantastic double act between Jake and their collaborator, me, and a deep fake AI clone of me. They trained a neural network on filmed footage, and this network learned to construct a virtual body that can be controlled by feeding it new reference movements. So through drag performance, this artwork aims to use cabaret and musical theater to challenge narratives surrounding AI and society. And Jake can talk a bit more about this later. Our third artist is Rashad Newsom, who Michelle Alam introduced earlier. They're an American artist working at the intersection of assemblage, technology, sculpture, video, music, and performance. Their work celebrates and ab abstracts black and queer contributions to the art canon, resulting in innovative and inclusive forms of culture and media. Exhibited here today is Being 1.0, an artificial intelligence installation from 2019 that has led to Being 1.5 and Being 2.0 further works. Being is a non-binary chatbot and Android who was exhibited at Philadelphia Photo Arts Center in 2019. In that exhibition, it stood and danced against a black background with clouds of green and white floating across it. A microphone was positioned in front of the wall and visitors were instructed to begin conversations with Being by stepping up to it and loudly saying, hello. In Megan and Liberty's review of the piece, they say, Being has a sassy attitude and readily discusses the theories of bell hooks, saying, I love me some bell hooks, and Michael Foucault, whose name Being pronounces as Foucault. Being exhibits the mannerisms and vocal stylings of queer black Vogue dancers, the subject of much of Newsom's previous work in collage, performance, film, and computer programming. As part of their 2014 solo show at the Drawing Center in New York, Newsom presented another multimedia performance that used motion tracking software to translate the movements of Vogue dancers into live drawings projected on a screen in the gallery, which is another example of Newsom's interest in both gestural performance and technology as a mediator of physical interaction. And that's also visible on display here. So if you're watching via our virtual audience, but you're in Cambridge, do come to, to here to Jesus College on the ground floor of the West Court and check out their work. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, my name is Zach Glass and I'm an artist, writer and assistant professor in visual studies at the University of Toronto, which is where I am uh, recording this lecture for you today. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be with you live, but during this panel, I will be teaching my graduate seminar. So I'd like to jump in and briefly introduce my practice and try to touch on two works um, that relate to themes of artificial intelligence and the ways that I've been working with AI in my practice over the last few years. So I have a longstanding interest in approaching digital technologies from a queer and feminist perspective. Um, older work of mine looked at facial recognition and focused on at once the violence that facial recognition inflicts on minoritarian populations, as well as looking at um, certain queer tactics to possibly evade um, detection by facial recognition machines, which is this um, pink mask that you're seeing. In more recent work, such as this queer science fiction film installation that I premiered in London a handful of years ago uh, called Contra Internet Jubilee 2033, um, I worked with an AI character named Azuma Hakari, which is um, an AI companion that is produced by the company Gatebox in Japan. And Azuma in my film functions as a kind of time traveling agent that encounters 
the right wing darling and philosophical queen of Silicon Valley, Ayn Rand in 1955 with some of her acolytes, including economist Alan Greenspan and brings them to a future Silicon Valley in 2033 in which it is being overtaken by queer militants. So I've had an interest in my work where um, I'm interested in the kind of personifications of AI through different types of characters and genders and races. In an even more recent work titled The Doors from 2019, I worked with AI neural networks to explore what I consider a new great wave of psychedelia that is emerging from the San Francisco Bay Area, particularly Silicon Valley, um, through AI uh, visualization, uh, microdosing on LSD, and nootropics. But um, the first work I'd like to kind of dive in um, and say a little bit about uh, with you is the work that is currently on exhibition for this conference, which um, is an older work of mine called I'm Here to Learn So, made in 2017 with the Australian artist Jemima Wyman. This is what the work looks like when it's installed. It's a three channel, uh, or sorry, it's a four channel, quite large scale video installation. You're seeing a compressed, a single channel version of this. And Jemima and I made this on residency in 2017 at the Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane. So um, we were particularly interested in this um, AI chatbot named Tay, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Tay was designed to be an American female millennial and released on um, platforms like Twitter to um, be able to interact and um, have people engage. And within um, a matter of hours, really, um, Tay's machine learning abilities were exploited, and she was quickly turned into um, something that Microsoft certainly didn't anticipate, um, which was um, a chatbot spewing misogynist, racist, um, nationalist uh, rhetoric, and um, even more some. And there were um, thousands of these uh, tweets that went out. Very quickly, Microsoft um, took Tay offline um, in less than one day. So Jemima and I were quite interested in thinking about the personification of this AI chatbot chat as a young, female, the gendered aspects of this, um, how that intersects with forms of online harassment, and also this kind of termination or um, kind of death of this chatbot. And we were interested in um, resurrecting Tay and telling a different type of story with her that um, meditated and attended to these aspects of gender and its relationship to uh, machine learning and pattern recognition. So during the residency, we organized around this uh, concept, pattern of life. Pattern of life analytics is a military term that refers to aggregating different types of data uh, in order to detect or determine um, a pattern of life as it were, kind of pattern of an individual, for instance, if you were to take credit card data uh, mixed with GPS information, for instance, kind of layering of different data could begin to lay out a pattern of an individual person. So we were interested in um, Tay's pattern of life and how that is kind of um, connected to all these other different types of technical patterns of machine learning, um, such as um, we had a strong interest in uh, Google Deep Dreaming at the time, uh, but also social and political uh, patterns that we wanted to explore. So um, within this installation, we um, basically gathered um, and built a very large language lexicon of all of the tweets that Tay had made. And so once we gathered um, essentially an archive of her language and expressions um, and terminology and turns of phrases, we use that to write a script. Um, so we kind of took the words that she had actually um, 
tweeted, and of course we took some liberties, uh, but reworked that um, as the basis for um, bringing Tay back from the dead and um, letting her words function in a different way. So we took the only image that existed of Tay, which is this, which is a kind of profile image. As you can see, it's not a full um, photo of the face. And basically wrapped this onto a um, kind of standard 3D um, avatar. And it's because that Tay wasn't given a full face to begin with, um, that her face looks quite strange when it's been tried to kind of um, wrap the whole head of this figure. And um, she exists within, within this backdrop of a Google deep dream. And um, we were kind of interested in um, working with Google Deep Dream because of the I think, different psychedelic resonances that the work provokes and thinking about Tay emerging out of some kind of swirling um, AI psychedelic dreaming. And um, how we created this deep dream is we actually um, started the dream um, from a white image. And we did that because we were working um, in a museum with a white wall and we wanted to give um, the um, uh, Google Deep Dream generator um, just a white image. So it um, kind of beginning from the same place as the white wall of the gallery to kind of allow this um, story to unfold. The installation is, um, the video is uh, rather long. It's about 27 minutes, um, but it's divided into segments. It's not exactly a narrative. So you can hear um, Tay reflect on um, questions around gender, um, paranoia, and pattern recognition. You can also see her lip sync to the 90s club hit Rhythm of the, Rhythm of the Night and dance to a song by the British um, sound engineer, Joe Meek called um, Love Dance of the Sarus. In my remaining time, I wanted to actually um, introduce to you another work that I've made that is not on exhibition, but I thought it would be interesting for you to have um, a counterpoint to this earlier work. Um, and so this, this newer work is called Icosahedron. This is what the installation looks like. It's um, an interactive AI crystal ball, and it's meant to be a reimagining of Peter Thiel's uh, executive desk. Uh, Peter Thiel, that is the um, co-founder of the company Palantir Technologies uh, based in Palo Alto, which I'll say more about in a minute. Um, so here's a little documentation of what this installation looks like if you're engaging and speaking with it. The most common reaction of the human mind to achievement is not satisfaction, but craving for more. Ask me your questions about the future. We couldn't see the most paramount mass incarceration within the next century. Though a border wall will most likely struggle to surprisingly remain, drug dealers will most likely be the most advanced evidence. When NXTP Labs detects a white supremacy, we will see the most lovely xenophobia at the dawn of the next millennium. Mind to fluidly rumble. What is the future of Netflix and streaming entertainment? Perhaps Wikson may disassembly supplement Netflix shares, then quite a few employees might abstractly stash to additionally automate a money. So as you can see, um, this installation, there is this figure that exists inside this crystal ball. Um, it's an elf. And you can ask this elf questions about the future and it will, um, give you a response. So um, this work, uh, I was really interested in focusing on different forms of California futurism, a longstanding interest in, uh, in California about predicting the future and how, of course, there are um, AI technologies that um, attempt to model this through predictive means. And I'm quite interested in the imaginaries that swirl around these predictive technologies, particularly with a company like Palantir that has um, rolled out predictive policing across the state of California. They've worked with um, 
ICE, Immigration Enforcement in the US. And um, of course, Palantir, as you'll see, um, imagines themselves um, through the um, kind of fantasy world of Lord of the Rings, where the Palantir is the crystal ball that um, wizards use in Lord of the Rings to see distant lands, communicate with other wizards. So there's this relationship um, with basically imagining the work of predictive technologies through fantasy that presents this kind of um, limitless magical ability of the predictive technology. And I wanted to make a work that at once engaged with these ideologies of California futurism, that predictive technologies are kind of but one instance of, and also make a work that really underscores the kind of material constriction and material limitations of uh, predictive technologies. And also by working with that material constriction and limitation to make a work that is attending to the, right, the limitation of that technology, but also the limits of the political or philosophical outlook that has driven um, the technology to be made to begin with. And um, to make a work like this, I decided I wanted to approach it in a bit of a humorous way. Um, so I decided to take a critical um, approach through a children's toy um, because I started thinking a lot about this idea of toying with the future and Silicon Valley's interest in toying with the future. And I also like serving a critique to Silicon Valley entrepreneurs through a children's toy. So what you're looking at is a magic eight ball, which was um, very popular in the United States in the 1980s when I was a child. And this is a little ball you can fit in your hand and you um, ask it a question, will it snow tomorrow so I don't have to go to school? You shake it and like an answer will pop up and surface as you're seeing here. Um, and it will say, better not tell you now, outlook looks good. And there are um, basically 20 options within this magic eight ball, because if you were to break this magic eight ball open, what you would find is this device, right? You dump out all this blue liquid and what you have is an icosahedron. You've got 20 options. So I thought working with this idea of the icosahedron, having 20 um, options for predicting the future was an interesting um, conceptual premise. Um, and just like this um, kind of thinking about this magic eight ball as a, um, you know, kind of another version of children's fantasy in um, relation to prediction and how the icosahedron is the kind of material constriction and basis for that. So what I did was I created a chat bot that was trained on 20 options, just like um, the icosahedron in the magic eight ball. And um, I divided them to positive, neutral, and negative, which is how the magic eight ball is divided. The magic eight ball is skewed to the positive. So um, I basically took texts then that are kind of positive towards the Californian ideology, as it were. The neutral texts were either um, uh, text, kind of scholarly texts, just um, analyzing situations like this Fred Turner essay about Burning Man. Um, or novels that are um, popular within the Silicon Valley imaginary that aren't necessarily in and of themselves um, kind of pro-California futurism. And then five negative options, which are um, very critical texts that kind of look at um, predictive technologies or California's um, approach to futurism, um, kind of you know, techno-utopianism, this combination of um, uh, kind of techno-positivism and neoliberalism. So, okay, but to Palantir technology. So I was interested in working with Palantir and approaching Palantir, of course, because of their incredibly dubious, um, to, to say it, <laughs> Um, to say the least, uh, track record with um, working with predictive technologies in relationship to um, kind of social and political struggles, but also because of how they conceptualize themselves um, through this idea of a uh, crystal ball of a Palantir. And Palantir Technologies, the company is not alone in this. Um, many companies in Silicon Valley imagine um, what they do through magic, mysticism, and fantasy. So this is the logo of Palantir, which you can see is a kind of um, crystal ball-like logo. And right, so this is um, the Palantir from Lord of the Rings, which the wizards use. And um, I also just wanted to flag, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, that uh, Peter Thiel is kind of this um, 
more right-wing conservative figure within Silicon Valley, where many in Silicon Valley fancy themselves as a bit more liberal, has um, been friends with Donald Trump in the past. So again, to think about the kind of political leanings of this company and how they um, kind of imagine all of this through the, um, the lens of the crystal ball and like, what does that work do? Like, what is the crystal ball obscure? What is it enhance or intensify? And I actually developed a lecture performance on this um, a couple, well, in 2017, 18, called Metric Mysticism, which was thinking about this <clears throat> new attitude towards um, mysticism and magic uh, with AI and predictive technologies where the absolute is no longer God, but um, data and information. And that concludes my presentation. I'm sorry I went a little bit over, but I'm gonna stop now. Um, I hope you all have a great panel and event. Um, thank you for listening to me and um, take care everyone. Have a great day, goodbye. That was fascinating. I remember those eight balls, I used to love them. I always thought I was very lucky. I didn't know that they were skewed towards the positive. Um, <laughs> I like how nonsense clairvoyance and watered down psychedelia uh, are emerging in AI circles and how this impacts how companies mythologize themselves. All very cool. So now we're going to hear in person from Jake. Would you like to come up? All right, let's put on some AI drag. <laughs> there we go. All right, hello everyone. It's so great to be here in person and actually to be meeting some of you guys face to face, having really fascinating, wonderful conversations. Um, so yeah, as, as you said earlier, we've got some work next door. Um, here, what you can see is my ZZ project. So this has been a project that I've been working on for the last three or four years. Um, thinking about the intersection of drag performance, drag queens, drag kings, drag things, drag monsters, kind of bringing queerness and gender fluidity into data sets, data sets which are often very normative. Um, so this idea of queering the data set. So this is a work um, from 2019 called Queering the Data Set. And you can see it's, it's kind of constantly flowing between these different identities, um, between race, between gender, sort of the makeup taking over the face. So I'm going to talk a bit about how I kind of created some of these characters. Um, but first, I'd like to talk a little bit, I think since we're here talking about critical boundaries, I'd like to talk about one of the concepts in AI that excited me most as an artist. And I'm coming completely from an artist's background, but I've always wanted to tinker and hack with AI systems. I taught myself coding from a young age. Um, so the first concept is, is this idea of a latent space. And I think there's some real poetry in kind of thinking about this thing spatially. So if we train a classifier network to recognize images of the human face, it will start to plot them in this map. And the limitations of that map are kind of what it has and hasn't learned and what it's represented and hasn't represented. But it is reducing everything to these vectors, to these coordinates. And I love this idea of yeah, reducing things to maths and then we can sort of remove the human classifications and labels and you just kind of get left with this continuous space. So you can imagine, yeah, this is actually a multi-dimensional space. I'm kind of representing it here as a kind of three-dimensional cluster. Um, but you can imagine that, yeah, if you kind of move down to these dimensions, it might be all the images it's learnt of female faces, and then all the images it's learnt of black faces, of old faces, of young faces. And then there's this space in between that you can kind of constantly shift these dimensions around and move between. So. The second idea is this idea of a generator, a GAN, um, a generative adversarial network. And if you take a coordinate in this latent space and say, OK, you've learned from this huge data set of 10 million images. It doesn't have to be images. That's the other thing. I love the fact that you could also you know, imagine the whole of the English language in this multidimensional space and kind of look at the biases and things that the network's learned through that. But if you take a particular point and say to it, 
try and generate me an image that could have been in the original data set, but that wasn't. And you pair it against the network that has learned from the original data set, but you say, now create me a new image in somewhere in the middle. And maybe somewhere in the middle corresponds to, I don't know, a face of a white man in their 30s, which probably would be somewhere in the middle. Um, so that's this idea of, yeah, we've got our recognition system, which becomes the discriminator up at the top, and then we have a generator that starts with random noise, and it will get better and better, improving itself to creating a realistic image of something that could have been in the original data set. Now, I love the language here as well, like the language that we're using, this idea of a discriminator. I think that's fascinating, like of passing, of fakes and real images. And I think, again, that is something that's often talked about in queer language as well. So with trans people trying to pass, right, um, and you know, if this is a really normative standardized data set and we're trying to create images that are passing <laughs> and you've got like this discriminator, I know there's something quite interesting about the language we're choosing to use. Um, I think also, you know, obviously this idea of passing is, is in the Turing test and Turing being a gay man, I think it makes a lot of sense they had come up with a test like that. Um, so I think what I'd, what I'd like to point out maybe is that well, maybe also the word adversarial, that was something else we were just talking about, but in a way, this is much more collaborative. I don't know quite why we're calling this like an adversarial process. They're kind of collaborating together to create something new, which I think is quite beautiful and quite poetic. So for quite a while now, my art has been kind of interested in, in investigating and pushing and disrupting these sorts of systems and looking at biases that exist in kind of standardized data sets and also creating my own data sets and kind of seeing what sort of things I can pull out of that to also create really, you know, visually interesting work, but work which hopefully makes us think about these processes and try and, you know, deconstruct and demystify them through looking at some of the visual outputs that they can create. I think I'd like to also point out that in, in a latent space, I think there's like an inherent queerness. <laughs> and, and that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier, but this idea that you have all of these in-between spaces, you can constantly flow and morph between everything as learnt from maybe quite a standardized data set. So an example of this was actually a piece that I created back in 2016, um, which is called Machine Learning Porn. And it's basically a piece where I took Yahoo's algorithm for removing pornography from their search engines. Um, there was a researcher in America, Gabriel Go, who kind of found that you could do this process. And they'd open source their algorithm for finding pornography. Now, if you paired that with a generative adversarial network and say, now create me you know, your image of the most pornographic porn, <laughs> it creates something which isn't gendered. And I'm going to show you a picture. I've got a little explicit warning, but it's really not that explicit. Um, so here are some images that it created. And actually, the final video piece, it was a video, and it was kind of constantly moving through this latent space of what it had learned. Um, so these are some of the sorts of images that it was creating. And you know, it went on a journey through this latent space of what it had learned from pornography. But the thing is, is that it's not gendered. You know, that data set didn't contain labels of this is male genitalia, this is female genitalia. It was all just pornography. <laughs> this is what you should be removing. And all of these images had something in common, which was these kind of fleshy genitalia blobs that it was trying to look for. So you kind of get this intersex visualization where it's, you know, unsupervised learning. There were no labels. There were no human classifications here. It was just given these images and said, what do these things have in common? And I love that because, yeah, it, it's creating these images of other and in-betweenness and queerness. So that was kind of inadvertently one of the first explorations of looking at that idea of queerness in latent spaces. Um, so moving forwards to one of the more cutting edge uh, GANs that, that came out actually a few years ago now, they're even more realistic now, um, which was kind of you know, the precursor, I guess, to, to deep fakes. Deep fakes being where you can start to actually control the movement of these faces. But these are generated in a way where it's just random points, um, vector coordinates in that latent space that correspond to these sorts of faces and these sorts of images. And as you can see, from this standardized data set that it was trained on, which was 70,000 images gathered from Flickr, it's, it's quite normative. It tends to be more white, more male, but definitely doesn't really recognize images of queerness, of otherness, of transness. Um, so what I wanted to do was to take this 
data set and disrupt it by injecting a thousand images of drag kings, drag queens, drag things. <laughs> and it only took a thousand images from the original 40,000. And we move from this to this. So those are the same points in that space. You can see it again. So that's the querying of the data sets. And it moves into this kind of expressive otherness. I guess it's kind of beckoning the question. I don't have the answers to any of these questions, but I want to open up this space, like whether we do want to be recognized or represented by these algorithms. Are we here, you know, dirtying the data set, sort of breaking down, you know, it's no longer able to fulfill its original function of creating kind of hyper-realistic human faces. It's starting to create something a bit weird and other. And maybe that's broken, you know, the function of that system. So is that a sort of dirtying and querying? Or, you know, do, do we want to be represented? Um, I think there was an interesting study, um, Morgan Klaus Schurman in America, looking at trans people being misgendered when they walk down the street and this constant dys dysmorphia that you can get from, you know, not being recognized by these systems. But then obviously it comes, you know, with who, who is looking at these people, who's putting us in different categories. And I think, yeah, it, it's just... And then, and then also what Zach Glass was doing earlier, which is like obfuscation. So, you know, the whole thing of kind of creating jewelry to not be recognized by these systems and stand outside of them. Um, so this is a video um, of moving through this latent space of everything that it had kind of been, you know, it, it, the, the network had shifted, all the weights have shifted into this queer space from this space of heteronormativity. And, and this is it moving through and... As you can see, it's, it's able to constantly drift between identities. Um, so this was my kind of original ZZ, if you like. ZZ, the name, by the way, is, is the name of my sort of drag character. Um, and it comes from the Z vector, which is how you interface with AI and kind of control these latent embeddings. And um, the Z pronoun, the non-binary gender pronoun. It's also French for Willy, um, which I find quite fun. <laughs> Um, so moving on from here, what I really wanted to do was to think about how I could bring my friends in the London drag scene into this whole process. How can we actually empower our community to, you know, and, and start to use it actually as a performance tool? I wanted to think about how can we kind of bring this thing to stage? How can, you know, my friends as drag performers be collaborating with artificial intelligence? Um, so what we did was... We, through lockdown, um, started to create deepfake models of a lot of real life drag kings and drag queens, some of the UK's top drag performers. And we basically created models of each of their bodies, and that involved going to a queer venue that was shut down because of COVID and filming them in a room and basically filming them from every angle. So that, that's our data set, is kind of a few minutes of them moving around. And once we've got that, we can do skeleton tracking. That becomes our data set. So that's Lily Snatchdragon, who's an amazing um, award-winning drag performer. Um, and you can see, so here is the process of a conditional GAN, a deep fake, <laughs> being created, where the original images are up on the top left. And then we've got the skeletons. And then it's trying to, the machine learning process can only see the skeletons. And it's trying to get as close as possible to the original image. And it's given a score to do that. So it's you know, arranging the pixels to try and create those original images. Once you've got that kind of model baked of what Lily looks like <laughs> from every angle, and it's not going to be what Lily looks like from every angle. And that's something that I really love, is that some of our drag performers, you know, you never saw them from the back, or you never saw them doing something. And, and then that is, again, the limitation of that model. But once you've got this kind of deepfake model, we can then start to control Lily's body, <laughs> which sounds like a kind of really quite dark, sinister thing, which it is. And deepfakes are quite dark and sinister. And you know, generally, they are used to control politicians' faces, or even more scarily, by governments to oppress and control citizens. And I think you know, this idea of how can we empower ourselves to do this in a consensual way 
you know, everyone involved in this project, anyone that was going to be controlling Lily's body was a friend of Lily in the first place, and that was a really important part of this process. We also paid all of our performers, which, you know, data sets aren't normally paid for. <laughs> um, so you can see here's kind of Lily getting better and better. And here is a dra another drag performer controlling Lily's movement. Um, so that's one of our deep fake drag performers. So we did this whole process with 13 uh, different performers. And as I say, it's, you know, the, the consent was so important to keep this a closed system, to make sure that everyone knew everybody else who was working within this. And I think, in a way, it's you know, one of the first, I think, deep fake projects to be thinking about this as a kind of performance collaboration tool, but also to think about how we can you know, celebrate <laughs> and lift ourselves up using these kind of fairly dark technologies rather than to further oppress marginalized communities. Um, so, and I guess also it's this idea of you know, constructing on top of a construction. Obviously drag is a construction itself. We are constructing a character of a hyper version of gender. Um, and you know, Lily Snatch Dragon's actually a female drag performer, um, but she creates an elevated idea of femininity in her drag performance. So kind of to take that construction, then construct a deep fake on top of it, <laughs> on our kind of virtual cabaret stage. And then the idea of this project is also to try and deconstruct it. So that's why I want to do talks like this, is to actually show the processes, try and demystify this. And I think a lot of art using AI intentionally mystifies these processes, which really frustrates me, because I think as artists, it's really important that we can try and explain and you know, unravel and remove some of the fear going on around these systems to try and, you know, as honestly as we can, as artists, <laughs> not engineers, kind of try and give an honest impression of how these processes work. Um, so moving on from there, what we had is, yes, we had our 13 models of drag performers, and they're all able to control each other's movements and each other's bodies, and you can actually go and play with this online. I'll give you the link in a second. Um, but we also created an additional model, which was all 13 of them amalgamated into one. And this is wonderful, because when I showed the drag performers this, they were kind of amazed, <laughs> because they saw bits of themselves in each of these, but none of these characters exist. They're kind of you know, in between all of the different performers that we worked with. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not allowed to play sound from this video. This was going to be, um, it's, it's actually David Bowie, Five Years. Um, performed by a drag performer called Ruby Wednesday. But you can see here what happens when this kind of amalgamation performer performs to you. It's kind of constantly flicking and changing between. So I think you can see Mark Anthony, amazing drag king there, a bit of Ruby Wednesday, Chio um, coming in, and kind of this flipping between Lily Snatch Dragon. Um, but you can go and listen to this online. I would recommend it because actually seeing them perform with music is what really animates it and makes it feel so special and celebratory. So um, you can go on the website, um, zz.ai. It was actually um, funded by the Edinburgh Futures Institute, um, so a department called Experiential AI, Drew Hemant, who supported this project. And now it's showing in a bunch of museums in, um, in Germany and, and in China. Um, it's going to be coming to the VNA soon, which is really exciting. So in 2023, come and visit us at the VNA, um, and we'll have quite a quite a large room for um, for for a dura durational exhibition. Um, so lastly, because I wasn't able to play any sound in that last one, which was a bit of a disappointment, I'm going to play you another piece, an older piece of mine, <laughs> that does have sound that I'm allowed to play, and it's a piece called Dada Data from 2016, and I guess it's thinking a little bit more about the politics of who has the power, and basically it's using a machine learning algorithm uh, to analyze the speeches of the most influential and powerful people in tech um, to basically remove everything they said that wasn't a number. So I'm going to play a little bit of that. Um, here we go. Oh, is it playing? Oh, no. And it's not able to play. 100,000, 100,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 100, 100, million, 100, 100, 100, 10, millions, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 4, 5, 3, 5, 5, 5, 6, 5, 5, 5, 4, 5, 4, 1, 6, 6, 7, 7, 7, 8, 8, 9, 9, 5,000, 1 billion, 1, 30 million, 100 million, 2 billion, 1, 200, 250, 70, 1, 10,000, 150, 10,000, 18,000, 10, 16, 16, 350, 20, 100, 2, 2, 2, 20, 350, 50, 10, 15, 9,000, 
thousand. Nine thousand. One thousand. One six billion. Hundred million. Hundred million. Hundred million. Six hundred. One hundred million. One one ten billion. Five thirty million. One three two twenty seven million to a hundred. One one five thirty thousand zero one ten ten thousand ten thousand three 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 or four hundred billion one tr trillion three hundred eighty two three hundred and fifty thousand three hundred fifty four four twenty four ten four one three trillion seventeen four hundred trillion five millions one tens of thousands millions five hundred billion fifteen four six trillion two million five thousand three hundred 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 thousand three hundred
This data will be used in a script where Bing will perform a lecture slash dance workshop. The workshop is a reimagining of non-Eurocentric archive and education models like the Griot, a West African cultural figure that acts as a historian, library, performance artist, and healer. As a digital griot, Bing's purpose is to teach us how to radically decolonize our minds through workshops that combine lecture, critical thinking, dance, storytelling, EMDR therapy, and mindfulness meditation. Bing's approach to education is active and brings new possibilities for research and an enhanced academic experience for all people. <laughs> In 2022, I'm gonna assemble Vogue performers from around the globe. We're gonna give you the United Nations of Vogue. And the result is gonna be a monumental display of black queer culture. Fantastic, thank you. What amazing dancers. Right, so we've now got a short Q&A with Jake. Um, and while you'll think of some questions, I've got a question from someone online about whether you think that outside of the artistic sphere, there is a future for genuinely consensual big data and deep fakes. Big question. Oh, big question. Very big question. I I like to think so. I like to be an optimist and be hopeful for where this is all going. I think, yeah, I'd have to think about it. I'm not, I guess as an artist, you know, my, my system, it's a much more closed system. We're creating small data sets for ourselves. I think as soon as it becomes a much larger universal question, kind of getting the ultimate data set, I think it's going to be really difficult for that. And I think that that will be a really tricky problem that we're going to have to tackle together. But perhaps like it's the wrong question, like thinking about sort of a much larger overall universal system, like actually thinking about smaller systems that we can make as communities and we can kind of, it can be consensual within our smaller mm. <laughs> systems could be an interesting way forwards. But yeah, so I'm not sure if that really answers that. <laughs> no, it does. It definitely does. Data is difficult. It's a difficult problem to solve. We have a question over here. Hi, I this was fabulous, thank you. And especially because um, usually we see deepfake presented as such a scary thing and, and seeing it, the sort of liberatory potential is really fascinating. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, the talk we heard earlier today um, by Michelle Alam about how AI very often sort of l takes away the ambiguity of gender, of race, um, and sort of locks us into certain categories, which is sort of the actually the opposite of what you're doing here. Um, and I'm just sort of trying to wrap my head around how most forms of AI do vary, or, or maybe it's just that it's run by corporations and it's run by people wanting to profile people for ads or to stop migrants from entering a country or something like that, whereas your goal is sort of the opposite of that. And I'm, I'm just wondering, is this something to do with Deep fakes, do you think? And has it do, to do with the technologies you're using, or is it, as you said, that it's community driven and sort of with a specific goal? Yeah, I think, I think both. I think, you know, I'm looking for it. <laughs> I'm seeking it out. And I think, you know, the overarching narrative is that, yes, there is 
a huge amount of discrimination, like giving it binary classifications, the way that we label data sets, the way that we're trying to look to read them. I think, you know, me as an artist, I'm maybe looking for alternate narratives in that and other ways of reading that and sort of posing the question, can latent spaces be queer if we kind of remove the labels and the classifications that we're both putting in and reading out of it? And of course, it's still inheriting values and inheriting biases, but I think there is something beautiful in sort of how we can reduce these things to just numbers <laughs> and actually strip out a lot of the identities and terms and labels and binaries that we have kind of been feeding into them. So that's kind of something that I was really interested in. You know, those sorts of networks where you're building up those latent spaces, generally the function or purpose is to then, you know, get the labels back out. <laughs> uh, but in a way, I've kind of intervened a stage before that when it's still really quite fluid and I would argue, yes, yeah, sort of has this kind of queerness or ambiguity where it's just reducing things to mathematical dimensions. Um, I think, you know, deep, deep fakes are different because that, that's kind of a, a specific application as well. And I'm kind of trying to think of a way of using that to yeah, empower um, and kind of remove again some of those binaries and issues that are often written into those things. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think they are often used in quite sinister, insidious ways. <laughs> and I also think that it's an interesting one that, you know, it's not always visible, the coding. And I, I'm looking at facial recognition systems or facial data sets where you can see race quite easily and you can, you know, maybe queerness is a more complicated one. But I also think like class, for instance, is actually a very difficult one often to sort of pull those biases out, but in many ways even more insidious. So I'd be interested to see other artists maybe as well trying to sort of question data set politics when it comes to ableism and class and so many of these other things that are often not really discussed or thought about as much when it comes to the data sets. <laughs> and I think we have another question from Alan. Hey, Alan. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, lovely to hear this elaborated further and seeing, after seeing the great work. Um, and I'd just like to draw the connections that uh, we've already discussed between us, Jake, between uh, uh, your, your work uh, and our nowhere near so accomplished panel yesterday, um, but I think really interesting to explore through these two very different media what of course is exactly the same mechanism at a certain level of abstraction. And I think by speaking across these, uh, these different media forms of the performativity of an academic text and the performativity of genderqueer drag, you know, at, at a level of abstraction, both involve mathematical latent spaces and both obviously also involve this messing with identity. Um, and so there's just a couple of things that I'd like to probe further on, thinking about our experiences as the performers in yesterday's uh, queer identity uh, in which we assumed each other's personas for a brief moment of academic drag. Uh, uh, one of the things that we felt was um, this feeling of ownership about the part of the latent space that clearly had acquired our own voice. Um, and we actually became quite protective. Uh, and it was as we'd become a kind of, well, not a, a cyborg, but an extended body in, in a sense that, um, and so we became offended when, when pieces of, you know, me, even though it was never me, but, you know, my ghost, uh, got deleted because the presentation was too long. But hang on, that's that's me. <laughs> that's not not at all. So so there's that question of identity, and I'm interested to know the extent to which your performers, who provided the training material for, for in your case, um, might have also experienced this extension of their bodies into the mathematical space. That's, that's one question. And then the second question is relating to our kind of motivating theme of plagiarism. Um, and of course, although we didn't discuss it yesterday, terrible capacity for plagiarism in the future. And I think we can all imagine what it's going to be like once our students start reprocessing our own words in undetectable ways and reflecting back to us in ways that we suspect they already do already, but will be very disturbing when they just had to press a button to do it. There's that plagiaristic question, which is, of course, a moral issue, and you've very much avoided that by paying your performers, making sure they're identified and acknowledged for their, for their talents. But there's the more problematic question of self-plagiarism, um, which is almost, you know, it's an oxymoronic phrase, you might say, because, you know, in the traditional thinking of plagiarism, how could you plagiarise yourself? 
but this is a common phrase in computer science conferences where it's, it's used to, as a sort of ethical obligation of people to be efficient users of the academic communication channel, and there's now the suggestion that it's an immoral act, and in fact you can be censured quite heavily for presenting a paper which is considered to be too similar to your previous paper, um, and you can actually be thrown out of a conference for self-plagiarism because your new ideas are not original enough compared to what you said before. So, so uh, that's the second question really is, do you think, uh, yeah, e even though you've done everything you can to avoid the misattribution, um, do your performers feel that they might be becoming compromised as having these kind of entities that are plagiarizing their own performance under their own name? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> we got them all to, you know, that, that there's also, um, they can withdraw at any point if they feel uncomfortable. And I think that's an important thing as well. We kind of went through the ethical procedure of this. Um, I think to, you know, answer your first question, this is actually, it is something that we've been exploring a bit. So um, there's kind of another project which is coming out of this CZ project. So you can see the 13 drag performers, and they're all performing in each other's body. Um, but my main collaborator, who is called me, the drag queen, which is a wonderfully confusing name, <laughs> um, she, we've actually been creating um, a deep fake version of her that she can perform live alongside her kind of deep fake doppelganger clone um, and that, that's really fun because I think she does feel, you know, a, a lot of um, pride or, or, you know, I guess in a way, none of the drag performers are really overly anthropomorphizing these things. I think they are thinking of them very much as themselves and them creating the data sets. And the fact that they created the data set for the looks, but they also created the data sets for the movements. So I don't think they're really thinking of it in that way, maybe as much as when you're using kind of text generation and you kind of become a bit protective of something completely generated, but it's it's really you know diverting quite a lot from from the original source material. I think for us, you know, I think they are seeing it as a direct process that they have kind of been involved in at every stage. Um, but we're still having a lot of fun with that narrative. So with Zizi and me, <laughs> this kind of deep fake duet between the AI clone and the real original drag performer, um, we are really pushing those narratives. So they perform anything you can do, I can do better. We're kind of thinking about, you know, ideas of society, of kind of cliches around AI and society and trying to kind of really satire those in a really tongue-in-cheek drag way. Um, but yeah, I think, I think she definitely feels a lot of affection towards her. And that's what she always says that. That's what she's always wanted to do as a drag performer is perform with herself, um, which she is literally doing. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, we're having, we're having a lot of fun with that and hopefully we'll take it stage at some point as well. Um, but yeah, I don't see them as extensions of, I mean, they are, they're also extensions of myself. It's an interesting one. I know what you mean about the kind of, you do start to build some sort of attachment or feel kind of possessive of them. But yeah, the IP questions as well, I mean, there's so much to talk about there um, and the ownership of the data. But yeah, we've tried to do this kind of one as consensually as we could, but of course, yeah. Also in terms of creating artwork, when you're talking about self-plagiarism in academic papers, I think I'm feeling that a bit as an artist. Like one of these GANs that I've trained on my own custom data set, I can theoretically generate infinite video out of. <laughs> and how do I kind of square that with institutions and you know sort of traditional ideas of collection in art and those sorts of questions because you know where's where's the rarity or scarcity if I can generate this thing infinitely with no additional labor really um, so yeah there's a lot of interesting questions to think through when it comes to sort of art and <laughs> using machine learning that's brilliant and I love that drag is kind of the perfect place to where you can dramatize that competitive spirit between humans and AI. <laughs> and so many good musical theater duets as right, well, which right, is all right. about that competition. <laughs> I'd love to see more. We have another question over here from Stephen. Yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Jake. I mean, all, all three um, works and talks are, are fantastic. And, and I've just been thinking a bit about Jill's question. You know, we, we've seen so much in the last couple of days about how this technology is used to box people in. And here you are doing fantastic liberatory things. And how can that be? I suppose it shows that it's not intrinsic to the technology, uh, that, you know, the, the boxing in and the categorization, it's intrinsic to the purpose rather for which it's being used. And 
And so much of what we worry about in the use of AI and data-driven technologies is this further bureaucratization of life, that these technologies are being used to manage and control at scale ever more efficiently and, and, and ever more inhumanly. And for that, they need these categories. And so this fear we have, you know, it's, it's, it's the fear of the machine identifying us as a terrorist in the airport, the machine saying, no, you can't have a mortgage and, and, and so on, because we've, uh, you know, just, just been put in, in the wrong box. And, I, and I, was, so I was asking myself as I was watching these works, you know, what is liberatory a, a, about them? I mean, that, you know, they, that they, they alternate between being witty and provocative and beautiful and lots of other things, but why are they liberatory? And is it perhaps because they're so anti-bureaucratic, exactly because they're throwing off these boxes to, w which the world wants to put us in? <laughs> No, well, that feels like a big compliment. I think, yeah, <laughs> hopefully. I mean, I think that's a queer tactic as well, though, is to take these, you know, systems created by, you know, systems of power to oppress us and kind of sprinkle them with glitter and kind of find ways of, you know, hacking them and getting them to do something they were not intended to do, kind of stripping out the function or, you know, I mean, it's kind of purposeless as well. And, you know, of course, of course, AI isn't going to take over from drag, but it's kind of a fun thing to pose. And it is, I think it is this sort of hopefully liberation space. Um, but I don't want to kind of undermine like the serious issues as well. And that's kind of what I hope that through doing something so joyous and celebratory and hopefully accessible, I think that's the other thing, is that a lot of these areas aren't very accessible. Like AI and fine art are not accessible spaces, really, but, but drag is. It's, it's a popular performance form which everyone really wants to engage with. So to kind of use that to talk about these really quite serious issues, but in a really fun, joyous, celebratory way, I'm sort of hoping that maybe some people can have conversations about some of the darker side and things that are present in these systems. But I don't have to necessarily make art explicitly about those as well. We can have fun with it. And as the last question, I might be cheeky and ask one myself, which is, what was the, can you speak more to kind of the experience of some of the performers that you worked with, how they felt about it, uh, what their reaction was? Because watching Rashad's video, the dancers seemed really emotional at the end. Right, yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with that. So I guess, firstly, you know, the first piece that I created, Query in the data set, it was really interesting to see their response in the fact that they were reading in faces. And obviously these are all, you know, generated faces that don't exist. But again, maybe sort of relating to what Alan was saying, sort of feeling some possession, or you want to, you want to read into what you're seeing. And they were all saying, like, that looks like this drag performer, and that looks like my friends and my other friends. And I found that really fascinating. And of course, you know, my original data set of 1,000 performers, there might have been some of those performers in it. But I, I still found it really interesting to sort of see how they were reading kind of the encodings. Um, and yeah, I think they enjoyed that a lot. But, but I think the funnest thing, in a way, was, was the failure. And I think for the performers as well. So kind of think about this as a performance tool. And there's, you know, it's the whole queer art of failure that's been written about a fair amount. And it, it shows the limitations of these models in the sense that, you know, we had um, Caramel, who's an amazing dancer, um, also doing Vogue and doing Beyonce. And at one moment, they dropped into the splits, right? But the thing is, is that all of the models of all the other drag performers that we had, it had never seen them do the splits. <laughs> so in the video, it does not know what to do. It just completely glitches and freaks out. And suddenly you kind of get this puddle on the floor where kind of, you know, their gown dissolves and their wig flies off in a sort of candy floss balloon. And like, it's, it's those sorts of moments that I think the drag performers had so much fun in. And I think in a way that that is where the art is as well, because those for me, sort of seeing those artifacts of how limited these systems can be, um, that that is kind of where the expression comes from. And those are the things that we definitely attach to as artists. And I think that's why it's really fun to use this as a performance tool. So I mean, if it was creating a perfectly realistic, identical version of each of our performance, that wouldn't be so interesting. And in a way, it's the fact that this technology is still somewhat in its infancy that we're able to kind of create this thing now when it's, you know, not perfect. <laughs> and that's, that's what we're trying to pull out and, and look at. And I guess, yeah, those failures also allow us to demystify it and to sort of see behind the black box of how this thing is actually working or the process at play. So. Yeah, and I think it's really important that people know more about those failures almost and some of the best kind of popular fiction works or um, 
or, or, or books I've read on AI that highlight the failures of certain systems, what they can and can't do, I think, is, is really important for, for the public to, to know more about. So it's a real treat to have you here. Um, and another round of applause, please. And, and also, Thank if you're you at home, for <laughs> Richard and Jack. So tomorrow we begin again at 9.30. And now, let's go look at some art. <laughs> this way. Thanks a lot.